Good evening, Diplomacy Land. I am Brandon Fogel, and VDL is back with a bang. This is League Night 2024, March edition. Uh, but because it's me and not Brian Pravel, you're not going to get a long, uh, cleverly written introduction. It's just me talking to you. And I'm going to bring on my uh, co-commentators tonight, who are Mr. Ed Sullivan. Ed, welcome to League Night. Thank and you. Glad to be back. Glad to have you. And back from a long hiatus is none other than Tanya Gill. Tanya, welcome back to DBN. You'll need to unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot how to do that too. Uh, welcome back. You have been off of DBN for a while. I think you tried to do uh, something from India on an iPad with mixed success. Um, but you've been, uh, you've been traveling the world for uh, over a year now, right? Yeah, almost two years but I'm back. <laughs> All right. Well, we're glad to have you back. Um, we will be joined later on by one Mr. David Hood. Um, he has other stuff to do right now, but uh, he will grace us with his, uh, with his uh, presence uh, as we love to have him later on. Um, so tonight we have two big competitions to cover. One is the Virtual Diplomacy League, which is now entering its fifth season which honestly is a little bit gobsmacking because I, it just seems like yesterday when, uh, uh, when Zach Moore got this thing rolling at the beginning of the pandemic, and it was a little bit um, you know, uh, sort of uncertain at first, like everything we were doing in the pandemic. Uh, but by the end of the year, it was rolling um, virtual games every month, um, like five or six every month, and uh, culminating in a championship game in January of 2021. And both of you guys were participants on that championship game board. Um, one of you had a better experience than the other. Uh, let oh. us go first to you, Ed Sullivan. Talk to us about your experience of VDL in, uh, in that first season. Okay, well, I had just gotten into diplomacy and playing virtually. And John Anderson, come back to diplomacy, John Anderson. He told me, play VDL. It's really fun. And I started in August and uh, was lucky enough to make the top board that first season. And I really enjoyed the league format because I thought it suited my game really well. And I found it really welcoming to new players. And uh, that's one of the reasons I did it. And one of the reasons I like to commentate on it the last couple of years is because uh, you get to see people doing – new things, crazy things, sometimes bad things, accidental things, but that's all part of the, the, the fun of the VDL. Now, Tanya, you, um, you ended up uh, winning the top board VDL that first year. And, uh, and then we haven't seen you since. So uh, what, uh, at least in the virtual game. Uh, so talk to us about your experience of that first year. Yeah, that was really good because it was when the pandemic started. So it was a brilliant idea by Zach to get us to play and have a community while we couldn't go to tournaments and things like this. So uh, I remember I, I think I only played three games leading up to the top board. So I didn't actually play that much in the league, but I think I met lots of people, new people, new players, um, had a, a lot of fun. And it was like a really nice unstressful way to play diplomacy during the pandemic so i do uh, i do really appreciate it yeah that's going four years later <laughs> um yeah so it, it's an invention of the pandemic but it is something that has now uh outlasted the pandemic because you know thankfully that's behind us but 
Um, uh, VDL is still with us. So uh, Nicola Taillet ended up winning the second season. Yours truly ended up winning the third season. And then the fourth season just completed this past January was won by Michaelis Camaritas, who, you know, suddenly just, uh, he had trouble winning things for a while and now he just can't stop winning things. Uh, so that was pretty cool to see. Um, and now we're starting season number five. So congrats to Zach Moore for keeping this thing going. Um, and uh, thank you to all of the participants for, uh, for diving into this fifth season. Um, so we're going to be covering VDL. We've got four games of VDL to cover today, and um, we'll talk more about those in a little bit, um, just what the structure of the league is. But um, I want to give a shout out to coverage we're going to be giving in the middle of the show to the Olympus semifinals. Um, Olympus is an extended deadline tournament, so uh, deadlines are once a day, I believe. And um, it's, uh, this is an invention of Nicholas Spencer, who goes by the, the name Bob Zabilder online, and uh, created this tournament uh, last year, or it's a league, I think. Um, and the first season culminated in August. This is the second season, which uh, for its playoff format has adopted something very similar to the uh, DBN Invitational um, from the past two years, which is uh, four semifinal games with 28 players, the winners, uh, the top, uh, whoever has the most centers on each board, the toppers uh, automatically qualify for the final. And then the remaining players play another three games uh, to determine the other, uh, the remaining seven, uh, uh, the remaining three participants, I should say. Um, we are going to cover tonight the first four of those semifinals. So those are almost winner take all uh, games in the extended deadline format. It'll be interesting to see how they differ uh, from the virtual face to face play that we saw in the invitational uh, just last month. Uh, which you can see on our channel, on uh, DBN's YouTube channel. All of that content is there. We had uh, lots of good games, seven good games, and then a uh, really interesting championship game. Um, and uh, Ed, I won't ask you about that, so uh, so we can move wow. on. <laughs> wow. Wow. Although I should ask you about the game that we played together because that one did end pretty well for you. Uh, and Ed, you also, <laughs> Ed's sort of all over the place tonight. He played in one of the VDL games uh, that took place today, and he played in the Olympus uh, semifinals. Um, so Ed, you're going to be our, our insider, um, both our uh, our sideline reporter and commentator uh, and participant, and, and object of scrutiny as well. It's a role I was born to play. Indeed. Uh, all right. So with that said, um, we're going to cover, uh, we've got, We've got one game, one VDL game happening currently, which we'll get to uh, toward the end of the broadcast. We've got three uh, VDL games that finished earlier today. One in the overnight slot for North America, which is morning in um, in Europe and evening in uh, Australia and, uh, and Asia Pacific. Um, and for those of you who don't know, VDL is a global league. It's intended to have um, time slots that are convenient for uh, anyone anywhere in the world. And so there's three time slots um, over the course of about 24 hours. So for every major uh, time zone region, uh, there's going to be two games that uh, two slots that are are convenient to play one evening and one morning. Um, so the one that is uh, overnight for North America, that one had one game. And then the one that's morning for North America had uh, two games. So we're going to do um, we're going to do two or three of those games then turn to Olympus, and then we'll come back and finish the games um, uh, after that. Uh, all right, do you guys have uh, anything else you want to add before we dive into some diplomacy action? All right, then let's do it. Let me see if I can get the, uh, the first game up. And the answer is not quite. How about now? All right, there we go. Um, we have, uh, this is the 166th, 166th game in VDL history. And that is, uh, again, over uh, four years and now five seasons of play. In Austria, we have Micah Blom, who uh, was a rookie last year, made a really big impression, uh, nearly made the top board, uh, came really close to the end of the season, playing out of the Netherlands. In England, we have Marcus Lohn. France, we have Gus Cowan. Germany, Nicholas Lawton. Italy, Tone, uh, tone Fear out of the Nether Netherlands. Um, I, uh, hopefully I'm saying Tone right. Fear, I don't believe is, uh, I think it's a nom de guerre. Uh, in Russia, we have Cody Green. Iron Man Cody Green played the most games, set a record for the most games played in VDL history in a single season last year. Uh, and in Turkey, we have Sam O oh, um, playing from an undisclosed location. 
Uh, the DBNI rankings that are shown there are from last season. So we see we have two players who are new to our system and uh, five players uh, who played, but you know maybe didn't play enough to get a high ranking. Um, all right, shall we just dive in then and have a look at some orders? All right. Uh, so the format I think we'll use here is, um, which I should probably tell you guys, uh, Ed, we'll have you do play-by-play -play in the spring. So just read out the orders that um, uh, as you see them, you don't have to cover every single one, uh, but try as you can to uh, leave the analysis for Tanya, who will do that for the spring. And then we'll flip-flop and in the fall, Tanya will do the, uh, uh, we'll read out the orders and then Ed will give the, uh, the analysis. So Ed, uh, tell us what you see in spring of 1901. Okay, I'm fine for Tanya and you being all-time analysts, and I, I just do the the meandering play-by-play -play here. Um, but looking at the spring, uh, my eyes started to go to the old Hedgehog opening by Austria, which you don't see. I guess I can't analyze that much. The Hedgehog opening by Austria uh, here uh, with uh, Italy sort of being standard. Venice holds. I like the old-school Turkey opening by Samo here. We're just going to knock that army in Smyrna to Khan. Uh, a little bit of an unusual one by Cody with uh, Warsaw to you, uh, Warsaw to Moscow, uh, Moscow to Ukraine. You don't uh, see that very much. And uh, the other one is this sort of zigzag France opening. And, uh, you know, thank God for Marcus here uh, showing that England doesn't always have to move Liverpool to York uh, in spring 1901. So it's a little bit something different. Tanya, what do you like about this? Or what seems interesting, I should say. Yeah. Um, well, the Russian moves strike me as someone who's bored of doing the same thing <laughs> over and over and therefore will do something weird just for the sake of it. Uh, so good on them. Um, there's a bit, you can see a few uh, friendliness, at least, um, in a few players. So the Austria-Russian uh, lack of bounce in Galicia, that's quite nice. Um, for uh for france this is really good too because england sort of moving north it seems um they got into burgundy no one uh it particularly challenged them uh so good to be france um good to be maybe austria here where no one tried for trieste no one's in galicia um you have a bit more flexibility uh for the next uh you sort of confirmed two dots so that's quite nice uh, yeah, so quick fact check, unfortunately, Ed. Um, this isn't the Hedgehog opening. Um, the, oh, come on. Yeah, sorry, man. Uh, I thought you were fact checking me, and I got really nervous for a second. Yeah, okay. I know, that'll come later in the show. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I, was, I was giving you the opportunity to correct that. But for the, for the pedants out there, uh, of whom I am one, uh, the Hedgehog opening for Austria, it's the most paranoid opening you can do. It's Vienna to Galicia and Trieste to Venice. So it basically prevents, if you don't trust anyone around you, it prevents anyone from, uh, from getting a quick attack on you and, and guarantees you, um, almost guarantees you a build uh, in 01. Actually, I think, it might, I think it might actually guarantee you a build. But, you know. Isn't this keep... a Southern Hedgehog? Uh, that I don't know. If there's a variant. I mean, it's not, I would think a Hedgehog is something that, you know, is aggressive towards your neighbors or at least defensive in a way that, um, that moves units toward them. But this is very, I mean, I think we can agree in any case that this is very friendly towards Russia and, uh, you know, not aggressive towards Italy, but certainly not trusting of, of Italy. That's actually one of the things I'm looking for in this game, right? Because you have two Netherlands players in Austria and Italy. I don't even know if they're speaking Dutch in the same room. But on the other hand, Micah and Cody probably played more than half a dozen games last year, last season together. So there's a working mm. relationship there. So I, I, that relate how that goes out, I think, is important. Does uh, does playing a lot of games with the same person lead to a working relationship? <laughs> <laughs> For me, not so much. Uh, well, we'll keep our eyes open here and see if uh, if that uh, uh, materializes or not. Okay, um, Tanya, over to you for the play-by-play, -play, and then we'll go to Ed for uh, some analysis. Okay, there's a hold in Ankara, um, a convoy over to Tunis. Um, Austria getting two centers there. Um, it looked really friendly between, uh, oh, uh, no analysis, but Russia puts the army in Romania. 
Um, and then on the other side, uh, France helps Eddie into Belgium, um, which Germany tries to go into. Um, Russia also gets Sweden. Those seem to be the notable, notable moves here. Ed, what stands out to you? The Turkish move from Smyrna to Khan in spring 1901 prevents the fleet Ankara going to Khan here. I guess Khan could have moved back to Smyrna and gotten the fleet out. Um, and Turkey could have taken the black if they wanted to do this set of moves right here. They didn't, so that suggests some form of cooperation. I don't believe Bulgaria to Romania is hostile towards Russia. It's just a way to make sure Russia puts two on Romania. Um, so I, I don't know how to read that. And then, of course, you never can tell uh, with what's going on in Belgium uh, if, if, if it's an EF or not. Uh, sometimes that's not an unusual play uh, for Germany to do that. Uh, but obviously, Germany is competent enough not to cover Munich. So I'd be curious to see what happens. Yeah, it seems like there's lots of interesting sort of half hints here about what might be happening. Um, and, uh, you know, is there England-Germany conflict or, you know, is this arranged? Uh, who is Russia choosing here in the East? Is, you know, do they, they seem to be getting uh, uh, gifts from both Austria and Turkey. Um, so, so yeah, I, I just want to add a bit to the analysis of how I feel personally about holding Ankara. I really like to play Turkey. Um, I think holding Ankara here is a bit of a mistake. Like you're kind of, your fleet isn't doing anything. Why not, right? You're Turkey, you need to have your fleets do stuff. That's sort of the whole point. So uh, in this scenario, I think even if you're trying to run a juggernaut or have Russia be on your side, uh, it's ideal to move it to the black and sort of negotiate from that standpoint. Maybe say that you wanna move it to Khan next turn or something like that, or it'll freak people out. If you don't move Ankara, they're gonna see a juggernaut. There's a lot of ways you can sort of talk Russia into letting you into black and uh, there's no reason not to be in black. Yeah, and your suggestion is even if Russia says no way, maybe you do it anyway um, and just negotiate from a position of strength. Right. and like you're already, you, they might, they, why don't they want you in the black, right? If I'm running a juggernaut and I'm Russia, I don't mind Turkey in the black most of the time. So it's just something to consider that holding Ankara uh, is not really that great. All right, in, uh, in winter of 1901, this leads us to a bunch of builds all around the board. I believe every neutral was taken. So um, so even more, uh, even more units on the board than typical. Uh, what I see is a lot of fleets. Uh, England puts down two fleets. Cody Green in Russia puts down Fleet North Coast, which England can't be happy about. Uh, Germany puts down Fleet Kiel, the enigmatic Fleet Kiel, which can go either direction. And uh, in the south, we get uh, fleets from Italy and Turkey. No surprise there. Uh, but we do get a fleet Brest as well from uh, from France. So I think if you're England, you're probably um, probably on alert at this moment, seeing all these fleets potentially pointed at you. All right, let's move forward and have a look at spring of 1902 moves. Um, Ed, we'll start with you. Hard to miss France uh, going to Mid-Atlantic in the channel uh, and, Ga well, Gascony would have been expected. Germany going to Helgoland, I think, uh, expecting an English attack, but I think England here was worried about Russia a bit, so uh, England loses Norway, uh, gets to Skagerrak, bounces in the North Sea. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I think the headline here is Vienna to uh, Tyrolia by Austria in the east, uh, a bounce in the Aegean Sea. And <laughs> just as uh, uh, Turkey gets the fleet to Eastern Med and Ankara goes to uh, Khan, we have Cody putting seven black. If, you, if Turkey doesn't want it, Russia wants it. So that's uh, that's what I see at first uh, first blush here. Yeah, Tanya, what do you make of, of that? Uh, so, and, and I just remembered that like Turkey saw that Russia and Austria left Galicia open in 1901 yeah. and still chose not to go into the black. Now, that's just the foresight is lacking there, right? I mean, you can see that the relationship between Austria and Russia at least indicates that they're they're not on the worst terms. So you should really hedge your bets and go into the black. Um, yeah. However, 
the moves are a little bit confusing to me. I don't understand why Russia wouldn't support Austria into Bulgaria instead of um, Budapest to Serbia. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I think Russia's sort of trying to play both cards here. I think there might be a world where Russia's telling Turkey, I'll also get my fleet out and I'll go through the black and uh, this and that. So I'm, I'm not really sure what the negotiations are, but if I'm Turkey, I'm, I'm like, you stay away from the black because uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a really good, um, really good way to really die really fast as Turkey. So uh, it, it, it looks like, it looks like AR, um, but I think Russia's still playing both cards. And yeah, you know, the, sorry, in the West, yeah. Um, I'm starting to think that if you're England and someone's supporting you into Belgium, don't take it. <laughs> like, <it's> just, <laughs> it, it seems like a trap. Um, but yeah, uh, whatever it is, it's not good to be England up there. Hey, Burgundy did support Belgium to hold, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, well, look, I, I think. I mean, I, I, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead, go ahead Brandon. <laughs> I was going to say that Cody Green's um, an interesting figure here because uh, you know Cody uh, sort of became a member of the hobby last year, played a ton, um, kind of gained a reputation as a bit um, a bit of a grabber, you know, a bit of a, a greedy uh, player who would um, uh, wouldn't hold alliances for very long. And I think his play style sort of evolved over the course of the over the course of the year. And I wonder if he's coming at this in a different way. You know, this is he might be he might be looking to not take Turkey apart here and try to get and legitimately try to get his fleet out and set a different board reputation for the for the year. I'd be really interested to keep an eye on that and see how how his board image evolves I, here. I think what happened is they didn't know what Turkey was going to do. Hmm. They may have thought. Khan is supporting Bulgaria and Anchor is going to black. And that's why you see Sev going to black. And that's why you see Aegean trying to go around. But then there was some lack of communication between Austria and Italy there. But I find it sort of, sort of uh, fascinating. And uh, well, we'll I, I wonder if there was lack of uh, coordination or, <laughs> or maybe Austria, you know, said something uh, uh, to uh, get what he wanted. Um, or get what they want. She, Micah. Micah, she, yeah, yeah. All right, let's do fall of 1902. And uh, Tanya, uh, tell us about the moves. All right, well, um, yeah, we see the downfall of letting uh, Russia into the black, which is no chance of holding uh, Bulgaria here. Um, we do have an AR on our hands. Uh, Austria gets two dots into Venice and Bulgaria, so... Uh, grows quite a bit. Um, Move-wise, uh, France takes Belgium with German support. Uh, England had tried to stop north, um, really is sort of given, okay, no analysis. This is a really tough I task, know. Brandon. I know. I know. <laughs> um, takes back Norway, um, focusing there, and I'll leave the rest to Ed. <laughs> Ed, talk to us about this is a very very active board in fall of 1902 yeah so I, i'd be curious as to your thoughts of taking norway with skagarak um i find that interesting uh also to take norway and it's a fall move and i understand england is concerned about going down they've in the process lost the north sea and have a french fleet and irish so it's sort of penny wise and you know, found foolish here, not at least protecting North Sea or, uh, you know, figuring out what to do. Um, meanwhile, poor, poor England loses Belgium here. So it, I guess there's, you know, it's pretty bad. And then, uh, yeah, not great for Italy either with those uh, two armies. I don't know what Turkey was doing here. Uh, that was a little strange move, I think, to Ionian. Uh, but Meanwhile, no need to support Bulgaria because it would have been cut anyways. Uh, and you know, it's a it's a AR that's gaining right now, and we'll see if they can push forward. But not being in the Aegean is sort of difficult, I think, uh, for the for the alliance. Yeah, and uh, sorry, I just wanted to point out that I think maybe 
Ton and Sam might be new. Maybe they're newer players. I'm not sure. Because if you see an AR like this and you know you're on the outs and you're going to lose centers, you don't move Eastern Med to the Ionian. And you certainly don't move uh, Naples to Rome. I, I don't see a benefit to that move because you've got your fleet in Na in uh, in Rome now, which won't be able to help you take back Venice or anything like that. So, uh, so there was a lack of coordination between Turkey and Italy, and this this AR is going to blow up the board. Um, yeah, in England could have con uh, Italy could have convoyed right back. Uh, yes. Yeah. In this situation. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, yeah, I, so what you guys are pointing out here is that uh, this is a case in which an alliance, once they get the jump, uh, there needs to be an immediate response. And if there's not, then it's basically over. Um, and that's that's essentially what you guys are saying. Well, let's see how AR can handle this. I think we're all hoping to see a fleet uh, Trieste here. I see that uh, uh, Bradley Grace is leading the charge in the, the commentariat. Um, let's see. The answer is, ta-da! Well done. Uh, well done, Micah. I mean, an AR has to have a fleet there, right? Um, and we get an army in Sevastopol. Cody, I think, doing the smart thing here, which is focusing on eliminating Turkey and getting some spoils as quickly as possible. All right, let's push forward here. I think we're uh, we've I think we've gone at a leisurely pace to get our feet wet here, but we can try to pick it up a little bit um, into spring of 1903. And Ed, call out these moves for us. Okay, so uh, Cody uh, bearing down. Uh, getting Sev to Armenia. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the Austrian armies uh, pinch her around uh, Venice, stop Italy from getting Adriatic. But the real story is in uh, the West with Picardy being convoyed to Liverpool successfully, Holland being con convoyed successfully to York. Um, and uh, Cody seemingly adding to the troubles of England putting two on Norway uh, <laughs> yeah. did not work. Yeah, Tanya, uh, talk to us about this these fisticuffs in the north between England and Russia. Yeah, I mean, I think Marcus is smart here with uh, trying to keep Norway because I think that'll be their last center <laughs> on the board. <laughs> So I would also maybe try and get St. Peter's or something. <laughs> There's a way for me to do it. Um, but let's see. Um, yeah, I, well, I mean, two really efficient alliances on this board. And if you're Germany at this point, you should start think like, oh, maybe, maybe I need to move against Russia really soon. Maybe I should be supporting, have a deal with England, support England into Sweden. This is the kind of thing I would be thinking at this point. Um, this AR is beautiful in my, in, in my eyes. <laughs> I love, I love an AR and this is really efficient, really fast. Um, there's a lot of trust between these two players. Uh, it, it's good to see. It, it's really fun to see. Um, I hope they get to crush everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice. What do, I mean, what, do uh, what do both of you think about Ruhr though? That was to me the, 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 the interesting move away from Munich. Oh, leaving Munich open. Yeah, I would I would do that move if I'm a little scared about uh, Belgium moving to Holland or something like that, um, or wanting to. Well, you don't really need to convoy another army, so. Um, I mean, Kiel. I think it's the fact that Kiel is there and nothing's threatening Kiel. Uh, maybe he was worried about Sweden dropping down to Baltic and leaving Berlin open or something like that. That's a good question. I think otherwise, I, I guess I'm so far pretty impressed with uh, the tactics here by France and Austria in particular. Um, and interested to see how that continues. Let us have a look at fall of 1903. And Tanya, you get the play-by-play -play on this one. Yes, we see uh, France swinging an army, uh, a fleet down to the West Med, probably with the, let me either try and get Tunis or try and prop up this Italy a little bit. Um, so that's good. Maybe should have happened a season ago. Um, and yeah, continual, oh, there's so many red lines and I have no idea what they mean. <laughs> um, uh, so, let's check out these orders. Let's, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for, <laughs> um, oh, so York. Okay. So North supported York to Eddie. This is the wrong way to do this. Um, because, uh, North could easily be cut. Uh, so, uh, so York went to Edinburgh with support from North, but the support was cut. So this prevents Nicholas in Germany from picking up uh, Edinburgh. 
good for England. Um, <laughs> still hanging in there. Uh, so they keep three dots, I believe, right? Yep. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then on the uh, east, well, you see Germany putting their uh, their army down to Munich, possibly to cover it from uh, being dotted by France. I'm doing analysis again. Um, and then uh, the AR continues. And I'll let Ed talk that through. Yeah, Ed, what's so interesting here? The, the move of Piedmont to Tuscany is interesting. Clearly, Austria is focusing on Italy, but... Um, here's what I would have suggested, which is France is going to get a build with York. That build is almost certainly going to be a fleet Marseille, which will uh, hurt the AR and sort of the long term. And for that reason, France left Marseille open for the build. I think Austria could have snagged Marseille there. Now it couldn't have kept it, but could have slowed down that progress uh, a little bit. I think that I think you could have expected Munich to be covered, and maybe you would have thought Marseille too. But now uh, it's good that France got a fleet into the Med. This is a great. I love this one. This France app when you come with invitation, right? That's the way uh, you want to be when you're France in this situation. Um, and uh, you know, the fleet of Greece to Albania is there to make sure that Adriatic is secured. So, uh, and then I don't know if Cody is wise here. The enemy of my enemy is sometimes my friend. And England's got a handful with France and Germany right now. And yeah, you want to grow, but you also want to think about what eliminating England does for you personally. And it doesn't help him personally to have England fall this quickly in my mind. Yeah. I'd, um, I'd agree with you little, there. Tanya, yeah, go for it. Totally right about Russia, England. I have one little disagreement regarding Austria's lack of move to Marseille. I think the logical thing to expect here would be Burgundy covers Marseille. I have no idea why it didn't. And I would want that move to happen so that france can't build a fleet in marseille so i would i would also not move to marseille i mean it's a 50 50 guess there it's a 50 50 guess there right like um and basically france won it maybe aided by some knowledge from diplomacy between the two um you never know i think the yeah I, if we're talking about cleverness here though i would have liked to have seen venice to uh puglia here i think rome being covered was uh was uh was was pretty likely um, all right, let's move forward here and see um, what happens as we move forward. Winter 1903, the builds. We do get that fleet in Marseille. Um, and uh, so the, you know, the FG here doing, or at least F, doing a nice job of already pivoting, um, which, you know, is probably a response to the AR being so fast. But uh, I like this because it creates opportunities for Germany, who didn't have a great turn there. They, they were slowed down a bit to you know, maybe uh, be able to keep up with France. All right, let's push forward here. Spring of 1904. Ed, uh, talk to us about what you see. So Italy does get it. Uh, sorry, Austria does get into the uh, Adriatic. France comes to Tyrrhenian to presumably prop up Italy here. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Cody, I guess, has to learn that Ankara cannot support Armenia to Smyrna. <laughs> Brandon, that's a lesson you learned on the top board. Uh, yeah. So we all make those mistakes, uh, even great players. Uh and Cody's got a real presence in the north here, even though loses Sweden, but gets to Finland. Moscow goes to St. Pete. Sweden retreats to Bothnia. Uh, and uh, there's French-German cooperation here, with, uh, even though uh, ultimately it was unnecessary. But I do think that we're going to see a bit of an English janissary with uh, North supporting uh, Norway and Norway supporting Denmark to Sweden. Oh, you know, I wonder actually, did did Liverpool, yeah, Liverpool uh, in this in fall, Liverpool could have supported York to Eddie and didn't, so that must have been a miscommunication between the two of them. So that that actually makes more sense than that North wasn't the mover, um, if uh, if Germany was expecting York to come in uh, or Liverpool to support the move. All right, uh, so Tanya, what stands out to you in spring of nineteen oh four? Yeah, it's a. Uh, um... Not too much, really. I mean, the alliance are doing what they have to do, um, despite the uh, few misorders here and there. Um, and I think this goes back to your point, Ed, when you say, yeah, if you're Russia, and, like, 
England's being attacked by its two neighbors the whole time. Like you really should have capitalized on that and been like, Hey, I'll help you out. I'll work together with you. Um, and I'll get you a dot or something like this, like slide down, go to Skag, I'll get you Denmark. Um, and you should have been working together with England the whole time. And now, you know, Cody's going to move one army up to Prussia and not much else. So it's going to be a little bit hard for um, him to uh, make a lot of movement on Germany um, and has sort of no no real chance in the north, I think. Yeah, some uh, some people and some uh, people in the peanut gallery are um, or the chat, I should say, the chat are pointing out that uh, that Cody retreats to Bothnia here rather than Baltic, um, and uh, presumably uh, Cody wants to be able to attack Sweden here because he can guarantee that he gets it back, but uh, sure. could have done could have done that from Baltic just as easily. So, and Baltic creates a lot more excitement actually because. Yep. Maybe you take, maybe you go for Berlin, maybe you go for Denmark. Like Germany has a lot to cover and- Yeah, uh, keeps Germany guessing. Yeah. All right, let's uh, check out fall of 1904 here. And uh, Tanya, you get to do the play-by-play. -play. Okay, great, my favorite thing. Uh, so um, I'll start in the East where um, there's a bit of switching set centers, um, Austria, uh, supports Romania into Bulgaria while Bulgaria goes into Khan. Um, and we finally got a bit of fighting between the Austrian French front uh, uh, with France getting into Piedmont. Um, in the north, I see a lot of units holding, not really moving between Germany and France. Um, uh, however, Germany does get eddy. Uh, and then uh, the fleet in England, the Norwegian Sea moves to Barents. Ed? I, I don't understand a few things. So, you know, this probably isn't as much uh, analysis as it is questions, but uh, England's a janissary with a fleet in London. I don't know if I anybody wants the fleet in English Channel there. Uh, Germany doesn't probably want it. Definitely England doesn't want it. The armies didn't move. Uh, maybe that's because they didn't know what Norwegian was doing. But that's something to keep an eye on. I don't really know what can be done there. But but um, you know it's not really a janissary position. The uh, retreat to black is interesting, but Cody will get a build, so uh, not really that damaging, I think, and gets Turkey down to one. And then, I don't know, like France had zero fleets in there like a year ago. Now they've got three uh, in the med, and that's what I'm looking at right now to see what they do. Right now they're working against Austria, and I expect that to continue a bit. And with only two Austrian fleets and one Russian fleet in Ankara, it's going to be hard to make progress in the Med. It's amazing how quickly this uh, game turned into uh, two versus two, you know, AR versus FG. Um, I, I suspect London, so England's going to have to pull one here. I suspect London is coming off the board um, to uh, to answer that one. But that, you know, that doesn't, doesn't put to bed the question of why uh, there are fleets in North and English Channel still, um, you know, presumably F and G are getting on the same page uh, or they're not. That'll be one uh, something to uh, to keep an eye on. Uh, anyone want to make a bet on Cody Green's build here? Um, is is Fleet Sev the one to go with here, or can you make an argument for Army Warsaw? What would you guys choose? Army Warsaw, for sure. Uh, expecting uh, fisticuffs against uh, Germany. Yeah, I wouldn't bother with an army in Sev for a Turkey that's down to one center. Ed, can you make an argument for Fleet Sev? Yeah, I can make an argument. I think they need a fleet, but I don't know if it can get there, you know, in four years or whenever the game ends. Uh, I, well, I'm looking for whether there's a Cody turn here. Austria's looking mighty juicy. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know. uh, so Army Warsaw helps a lot uh, with those uh, beautiful Austrian dots right in front of them. It's been, I mean, it's been a very strong... Um... A sort of steady alliance game from Cody so far. You know, clearly made um, a good a good working relationship with Micah at the very beginning of the game and, and has stuck with it. Um, I, so. I wouldn't stab in this game if I'm Russia. 
especially it's a league game in March. You know, you're going to yeah. play together. And for what? <laughs> oh, Army All right. Sev. We do get Army Sev, so kind of splitting the difference. Um, we also get Fleet Berlin, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and uh, I suppose it makes sense. Uh, you guys like that build? No. <laughs> what are you going to do with Army Sev? That you couldn't do with, with, uh, with Fleet Denmark, you mean? <laughs> yeah. Now you that fleet long term, I, that yeah, fleet long term could be very like that fleet. right. That could be very useful long term, and maybe this is your last chance to be able to build it uh, with France's blessing. Oh, what build are we talking about? Fleet Berlin. Oh, a fleet Berlin. Yeah, I think you should have three fleets as Germany. Why not? All right. They were talking about Army Sev, which I don't agree with <laughs> as the right yeah. build. Yeah, because you you because you're looking at Germany already if you're Russia. Yeah. Um, all right, let's uh, move forward. Spring of 1905, and Ed, you get the play-by-play -play on this. Tell us what you see. Uh, Cody got lucky by him not disbanding wow. Black, by the way. Um, or him disbanding. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay, so I think I see France in Venice uh, and Tuscany uh, as well, just having all the tentacles uh around the boot uh and italy and let's see the fleet berlin goes to baltic presumably just make a move cody retreats to uh finland from sweden or moves there um i may be trying to create some daytime i don't know what that move is but i guess it can't be held so that's the, the thought process uh meanwhile i guess the winner of who gets london is france because germany convoys back to holland London goes to Wales, but English Channel remains, which is curious. And uh, Burgundy to Marseille. So there's, as you like to say, Brandon, good alliance hygiene here between Germany and France. Tanya, what do you make of this? Yeah, I think this is why like Army Sev really didn't help AR. AR like had a lot of momentum, had so much time to get the jump on on Germany, like two game years ago and just didn't bother and now look like they're gonna be um really behind i think and what did you build sev for he just banned or uh, uh, sam disbanded black now you have to go ukraine ukraine warsaw warsaw or you know to gal it's it's just like a really it's not a build that really helped cody i think um and yeah i think uh, between the two uh i can see um France and Germany winning out on this on this like little battle, and I think uh, it's a bit of a shame. But I think there were too many units focused on Turkey, who didn't have any allies and probably didn't write optimal strategy. So uh, you really didn't need as an as the AR alliance, you didn't need that many units to take out Turkey. You need to sort out your side of the board and then focus immediately on countering the other side of the board. And I think that boat was uh, missed a few seasons ago. All right. But I, I really like, um, I, I think what Germany and uh, France are doing is, is really good. You know, they're get the armies off the Island, then we'll get the fleets away and we'll, we'll make it clear. So step-by-step step, um, pretty good. Yeah. They're working in lockstep basically mm -hmm. so far. Um, as far as it seems. Um, and, you know, they also have England and Italy working uh, with them, which uh, which definitely helps them. All right, fall of 1905. Tanya, tell us what you see. So uh, good, um, you know, Wales convoys back to Brest, which is what I assume would have happened, and probably some agreement between let's leave the island completely open. Um, although I love to be a friend in this position when North has left and English Channel is still there. So that's that's nice. Uh, could be fun to see a, a, a play with that. There's a lot you could do. Um, oh, I did analysis again. You need to stop me when I start doing that. <laughs> and it's just not in my nature not to speak Sorry. so much. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, other than that, we see Marseille getting into... Um, Piedmont. Um, is that a convoy to Trieste from Apulia? From Apulia, yes. Okay. Convoys back to Trieste. Um, Turkey helps uh, Italy into Greece. Um, we'll comment on that any further. And Russia 
uh, supports Romania into Bulgaria um, while also uh, being in con. So but you have to assume not, yeah. not maybe not agreed upon. <laughs> right. This is sort of uh, the end of... Uh, of Italy as well. Uh, uh, sorry, of Turkey. Of Turkey, uh, yeah. So, Turkey so we bid Turkey adieu. Uh, Ed, over to you. Not a great turn for uh, for Micah in Austria. Not a great turn for Micah in Austria. Down two because uh, lost three and then gained Smyrna. Uh, and is going to lose Smyrna. I don't know if it's a wise stab because FG is not laying off of Cody in the north. Um, you know, and I don't know what's going to happen. The other thing I'm curious about is Wales convoying to Brest, which I totally get from an idea of, Hey, England, you're doing yeoman's work for us. Uh, you know, I'm not going to take London here, but as a guy who's run a lot of FGs in his life, uh, as G, I don't like that fleet in English channel. Like I do not like it. And the fact that it continues to be there, especially now that Germany's vacating there, everything's going great. Everything's going fine, but that needs to be, uh, 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 a pressure point. And I'm not sure that North needed to go to Skagrak. Seems like maybe they did that. And then they say, well, just bounce to North forever. Something stupid like that. Um, yeah. That's my, that's my guess. All right. Winter 1905 builds are another fleet in Marseille from France, another army in Kiel from Germany. Uh, whereas in the South Italy got a build. Um, so worth congratulating, uh, a ton on getting back up to four here, despite the uh, the adverse circumstances. Um, uh, we bidded you to Turkey and Austria, uh, you know, has to retreat here. Interesting, um, you know, had two fleets, uh, decides to pull the, the army off, thinking that Smyrna is a lost cause anyway. Uh, all right, let's move forward here um, into spring of 1906. And Ed, you have the play-by-play -play on this one. Oof. Micah, uh, well, what I'm looking at is in the south here, and what I see is uh, Micah apparently is working with Cody still after the stab. Albania gets into Greece. Uh, I'm not sure Micah had a better option, to be honest with you, but uh, that seems to be uh, a smart move not to be bitter. Um, and Cody exercising Tanya-like domination over Smyrna. Uh, I can take it, but I'm a kind and uh, great wow. dictator. I won't. But uh, whereas Cody's working things out in the south, eh, things aren't looking so good for Warsaw uh, with these armies pounding, these two conga lines pounding. And this is like uh, Operation Barbarossa all over again. And uh, England, <laughs> Eng England, I guess, done with the yeoman's work. Uh, yeah. Love it. <laughs> England, 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 Edinburgh or something. <laughs> Gotta love it. And Norway is totally safe. Yeah. <laughs> you know. that's great tanya how do you feel about and and the uh, italy takes venice in the south with help from adriatic i'm so excited for the resurgence of the english italian empires um in this game uh but actually i, I was gonna say that you know if i'm france i take tunis last turn i think <laughs> why what use is italy to me now if yeah. austria is uh falling um yeah, never let janissaries get a build right Exactly. <laughs> and I think it's such a slap in the face to bounce yourself in a center that is not yours of an ally you stabbed. <laughs> like, I think it's so unnecessary on Cody's end to bounce in Smyrna. Uh, but uh, yeah, just showing that they have uh, capabilities. Um, yeah, why not come out to Aegean, right? Um, just, you should have gone to Aegean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just hold or to Aegean. Yeah. Just you don't need to bounce in Smyrna. What is the intent there? There's but nothing is, touching it. <laughs> it's so rude. You got you got to love what Mike has done here, though. Yeah, the narrative was really against her um, mm -hmm. last year in 1905, and now suddenly she's got some life, right? Yeah. Right. All right, let's move into fall 1906 here, and Tanya. Well, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe not. Let's see. Uh, tell us what happens. Um, France misorders. Like I, I don't know. <laughs> the half the yeah. orders went there. I hope. Um, there's uh yeah maybe they're just trying to make friends i'm not quite sure they uh let italy have uh, venice um uh germany moves everything back that mm. um that those are the interesting moves i suppose uh and 
some some dynamic switches here. There, there's a lot of movement, and I'll let you do the analysis on those movements. <laughs> yeah, well, so I'm just, loving. Just, oh, go, go for it. No, go for it. Ed. I'm loving. I'm loving Cody helping England into yeah, Sweden. Yeah, yeah. Because so first of all, North has to bounce English Channel, yeah. and you could have expected France to move to London. That in that situation. If, if North had taken the guarantee in Edinburgh and lost London, no place to – well, there wouldn't have been a build. Now, build, and the build's going in London. That's just wonderful. That's, that's, like, really good. So I like that. Um, meanwhile, there – I don't know. Maybe it's on against Micah. Like, I don't know what's happening here because uh, Ionian's into Adriatic. A Adriatic just helped. Maybe Micah wants that blown up to to build an army. That's possible, um, but but I think you want to move Apulia in that case, not Ionian, right? If you're Italy, we, yeah. we're right. Maybe we're seeing a what? A, well, an heir, uh, so to speak, uh, because Khan doesn't go to Aegean. I'm yeah. going to the east coast of Bulgaria, so this is my, you know, hey, France is a threat. Yeah, France is a threat, but very... so why is Ionian moving? So these are things I don't understand. Yeah, and all of these armies moving east again. It's good. This game is good. It's very dynamic here in 1906. Um, let's let's push ourselves forward a little bit because we're uh, we're enjoying this game very much, but we do have a lot of other games to cover. These are uh, timed, right? Uh, timed, yes, uh, okay. but timed at I think seven hours, so they can get ten. Seven 11, and a half. Seven and a half, so that they can get 10, 11, 12 game years in, depending on how efficient they are. Um, so, Micah. Right, real quick. Micah has two rebuilds, I hear, I see, or is picking up, uh, nope, just picked up Greece and didn't lose anything else and had a and had a piff. So Micah gets to put down two units here. Marcus gets this uh, build in London that we all love uh, unequivocally, all delighted by. Um, and let's push forward here. We've got uh, spring 1907 orders and Ed, tell us what you see. I'll go quick. It's back on the Kill England plan uh, from FG. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, back to 1901 and two. We're going back <laughs> after England. Should have never let England build. Uh, uh, meanwhile, somehow Cody's in. Oh, Cody's back in Sweden. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cody's like, uh, with German help, but on the other hand, <laughs> he's, he's attacking Germany. This is all for hilarious, by the way. Just this is amazing. Like, why I love the media, <laughs> and then, uh, uh, Apulia gets the Ionian with uh, French help and, uh, and the air. It's not even an air. I don't know what it is. It's a, it's an AR with Italy kind of floundering. <laughs> yeah, AR has been the only thing, only constant through that whole game, uh, I think. No, no, AR? AR stabbed. Well, <laughs> it's not clear. It's, I mean, it seemed like a stab, but then they were completely fine the next turn. So Yeah. I, I just do find it's funny the little hiccups that have occurred and then have been ironed out and then are continuing and things that should have happened in 04 are happening in 07. It's fantastic. Um, that's that's all I'll say. That's this good. Is, no, that's perfect good analysis. Fall 1907, Tanya, to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, England does get Eddie, uh, loses London. Um, there is uh, some movement on France now to uh, take Tunis. Um, wow. and uh, a switch between Smyrna and Bulgaria for the alliance, for the AR, and uh, a lot of holds. Um, Prussia, Silesia don't make a play on, on Germany, and Germany uh, works to kick out England from Denmark. This is amazing. I, and, the, you know, the net result here is that Cody Green <laughs> is the one who actually nets one. Uh, that's great. Uh, Ed, how do you feel about this turn? I'm loving it for the AR. Um, I don't really understand what France is doing here uh, in the Med. Uh, to be honest with you, like I guess Italy's a friend now, but we're taking Tunis. <laughs> okay, uh, I kind of like if you have the boot on the throat of someone, I don't quite like to take it off. I'm not saying I'm going to strangle you, but I am saying my foot needs to rest and your throat is a good place uh, <laughs> no but you're right like italy should have been eliminated a long time ago yeah. another four yeah don't let a janissary get a build i, I love uh your your throat yeah. is a good foot rest ed sullivan <laughs> you heard it here 
All right, winter 1907, we have lots of armies now. So people are deciding that the armies are what's needed, likely because of this phalanx right here on the uh, right along the border. Interestingly, Germany has to, they have to disband one um, thanks to losing Sweden and its army Ruhr uh, rather than one of those fleets. So let's keep an eye on that and how that uh, may reverberate throughout the game. Uh, but real quick reset here in uh, spring of 1908, we've got France and Russia both tied for the board top at nine. Uh, and the next closest is Austria at six, Germany uh, at five. Uh, it's worth reminding the viewers that the scoring system here is open tribute, which uh, places a strong premium on topping the board. Uh, the board topper gets 10 points for each center they have. Uh, and uh, uh, players after that end up, uh, uh, it's, there's a formula for it, and they end up uh, somewhere between 30 and 60 usually, depending on how many centers they have. So, uh, you know, 10 or 11 center uh, board top is a really good score in open tribute. It, it's, a, it's a good score, I should say. Really good is 12, 13, 14. Uh, all right, let's push forward here into spring of 1908. Um, and uh, Ed, over to you. Okay, so for some reason, Munich doesn't fall. Uh, can't work that out. That seems to be uh, an important move. It looks uh, like uh, looks like Silesia supported Trieste to Munich. So uh, <laughs> instead of Tyrolia, yeah. so presumably oh, no, a misorder. I misordered. Oh no! <laughs> uh, Prussia well, doesn't go really to Berlin because yeah, yeah. They, they move. They lose Tyrolia, right? You know, like yep. so France gets Tyrolia. That's an important problem um that i think i can't think it's a misorder Co meanwhile cody, i guess cody is clearly working with germany right uh supports skagerak into norway uh from st petersburg so definitely working uh with germany up there um and doesn't go to berlin it's hard not to see not to notice that yeah i think germany is like i hate england uh, mode more than and see what I can do here uh, kind of being a semi-janissary meanwhile France is holding up the FG uh, back we're back on the anti-Italy plan I guess uh, we're back that way my food's back my food is back on the throat yeah. uh, this is all coordinated yeah Italy it's goes to Albania right? yeah Venice supports Piedmont into Tyrolia and moves out of the Ionian. Yeah, this is a great, great position for France to be in, isn't it? All right, fall 1908. Uh, tell us what you see, Tanya. Um, French fleets going straight through. Great, nothing stopping any of that. No. Um, <laughs> uh, meanwhile, pushing Italy right through. I mean, it's great play. I love, I love this France now. I didn't like it like a year ago. And now, now it's great. Uh, <laughs> except, except that Italy's getting another build here. And in fact, they're going to put two units down because they have a rebuild, but. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Maybe this would have been the turn to take Rome and Naples. Um, and yet, so. you know, Eastern Med, Ionian, Tyrian Sea. I know. It's hard oh, not to love that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so What's the argument for not doing that? Because if Italy, if France does that, this game draws. Yeah, that's true. I oh, would... for, if they take Rome and Naples, you mean? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, it's worth. This is where you got to remember that these games only go. You know that they're time limited, so there is you know only a certain number of turns left. You don't know exactly how many, but you know it's not it's not five years. So you know this is you know we don't know Gus's uh, Gus's experience level. A, a player who's thinking about soloing. This is the kind of thing that they do. They get in position yeah. to, uh, you know, far across the stalemate line. Um, but that's not how you win at VDL. You win at VDL by making sure you have the uh, the board top. But we also applaud this play. But also, we we should point out that yeah. Austria is walking their units back, has given up on the Munich front. Probably has realized that Russia not so keen on uh, moving forward with an attack on Germany. Who 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 could have really lost a lot of centers there yeah i want you know it's interesting to wonder um so so russia takes norway here in the north it's interesting to wonder cody's playing a very cagey game here um and it'll be interesting to see whether they've made a mistake by uh by helping germany um you know that one turn it, it seemingly helping germany question of how deliberate it was or not 
Um, but they might have been hoping that Germany would help, you know, be a, a bulwark against France. You know that that, but that seems kind of unlikely given that they worked together uh, for the whole the whole game. All right, let's keep point, pushing ahead here. Winter 1908. Um, we do finally bid adieu to Marcus Lone, who made a great valiant effort to get back in the game. You know, got a build, Agreed. got back up to three. Uh, didn't end up working out, but but we appreciate the we applaud the effort. Um, and now uh, Cody Green has actually pulled ahead because France um, uh, France ended up staying even that year, um, and Cody actually went up one. So Cody is ahead here, but knowing the game probably only has one, two, or three years left. Uh, do you guys would you would would you bet on France to win, or do you like Cody's chances? Tanya, we'll start with you. Uh, I think yeah, France. I don't think I draw as France. I think I can find a dot somewhere at least. Um, and uh, no, it's tough. It's tough. It is really tough because I, I do think the opportunity was last turn, and now it's a lot harder. It would really depend on on Italy. Italy needs to give you the dots now. You can't just take them. That's your point. You could maybe take them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ed. Who do you like, France or Russia here? I like Russia. I don't like those builds if I'm France. And uh, I think I think France might be going to good old Germany. Germany, you don't need Edinburgh. Germany, you don't need this mm. or that or the other. Uh, that's what I'd be doing if I was France right now. All right. We're nearing the finish line in this game. Spring of 1909. Um, Ed, tell us what you see. Uh, okay. So I see a convoy of Rome to Albania. Didn't see that coming, and uh, neither did Micah. Uh, uh, but Micah does get into Trieste. I don't know. I can't do the math quick enough to know what that means, if whether or not it's going to be retaken or not. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Cody uh, gets into Sweden, doesn't uh, bounce uh, Baltic, and uh, well, we finally left the English Channel, uh, and Edinburgh wasn't taken. So France is kind of playing patient game right now. All right. Is there any analysis needed here or, or shall we move forward? Let's move on. All right. Fall of 1909. Tanya, tell us what you see. Um, the EG remains strong with um, some attempted support in the north uh, to Norway. Um, other than that, we see armies moving on the line. Um, is that... Not a, it's not a successful retake of Trieste. Right? Correct. Correct. Okay. So uh, Austria does hold that, and other than that, we've uh, we still got, you know, um, Gus is just not interested in Italy at all. <laughs> so they're working together. Not yet. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Uh, so there was a guest down here around Greece uh, and Trieste and uh, Austria, Russia won the won the won the guest. The net result of this, though, uh, Micah can't put down another unit, has no home centers open, but Italy is going to have to pull one here, and so presumably it's going to be Fleet Naples. Um, if it's not, you know, then things get kind of interesting. If it is Fleet Naples, then all of the advantages that France had before are still on the table, and the answer is yes, Fleet Naples. Um, so now France and Russia are tied. But France has three dots that they could presumably take whenever they want. Um, so the question here, I think, is just <laughs> how many dots does Russia or does France end up on? Um, Ed, tell us what you see in spring uh, 1910. I'm seeing I, I'm supposedly some expert and I picked Russia just literally 15 seconds ago. And now I wouldn't want to be Russia uh, <laughs> with uh Kiel to Livonia losing Norway already lost Sweden uh we got a Monty Python run away run away uh from Prussia and Silesia uh but Cody does take Bulgaria and I'm sure that's agreed by saying something like oh you have a build but you can't build anywhere and I need help I'm dying uh, help me and that's what yeah. happened. I'd be really pissed if I agreed to let uh Cody into Bulgaria and then saw Silesia move to Gal and Prussia move to Warsaw. <laughs> really, really mad. <laughs> it is curious. The move to Galicia is very curious. Um, I'm, I've, I've been quite confused by Russia's moves a lot of this game, I think. And I don't, yeah. this one I don't understand as well. All right. Fall 1910. Uh, 
Fascinating. France doesn't take any dots here, uh, but doesn't need to in order to get the board top because, uh, or the lead, I should say, because Tanya, take it away. Uh, because uh, Russia loses a lot. <laughs> That's why. Uh, and actually, um, I'm just going to go straight to the analysis that I, I, I don't think that, you know, if, if this is a long term strat this might be a long-term strategy on on france's part like italy is doing everything france wants it's not that bad why take two dots from italy in this game and then butcher a relationship in another game you know especially if maybe one of them is a newer player and wants to like show that they're they can be really reliable and be like put the other person in such a vulnerable position and then not stab them this could be a really really good uh league play sort of uh, move and and i don't i don't hate that that France is helping Italy out and not taking their dots um, as a video. So, um, so this game ends actually probably by time limit um, in after fall of 1910. Uh, and I think uh, a storyline that we weren't quite focused on was that Germany. Germany uh, had business drawing on the top there. Germany <laughs> ends up tied for the board top. So picked up four dots. Uh, in the last three years, two in the last year. Um, this is, uh, is quite a, so from the perspective of open tribute, this is a very significant um, downgrade in result for both or for France, especially um, France. If they had topped alone at nine would have had 90 points, which is 22 more than 68. If they had gone for the max here and taken, you know, Rome, Naples, and Edinburgh, they would have had 120 points, almost double what they ended up with. Um, now, maybe, you know, we don't know if Gus is planning to play the rest of the season or not. Um, and Gus is, as far as we know, playing his first ever, you know, VDL game. So, um, you know, that may, that might end up being a learning experience. Um, so, uh, yeah, real. so we, we spent way too long, and it's probably twice as long in this game as we should have, uh, but it was fun. We enjoyed it. It was a good game. Um, so just final thought on this game then, um, and Ed, we'll start with you. You got to build your alliance chops in BDL. That's the kind of player you want to be uh, because people are going to see how you play all season long, and uh, Gus did that. I have no problem. He was an FG the whole time, and he showed himself to be uh, as good an alliance player as Katie Gray this game. <laughs> Tanya. Yeah, I, I'd ally with Gus seeing this game. <laughs> I would definitely uh, try it out at least. Uh, no, it's a fun game. There were two. Uh, there were two major alliances. They they formed really fast, um, and then they fought, and then one beat out the other just because of some tactical errors or maybe a little bit of uh, miscommunication on the eastern side. So it was it was fun to fun to watch for sure. Yeah, and I'll just give a shout out to Cody Green here for, um, you know, being in a pretty difficult position for much of this game, actually. Um, you know, Russia facing a strong Western alliance. Uh, it's very tricky. And uh, Cody was in this till the end and ended up on eight centers, just one point off the top. Uh, all right, let's put uh, game number 166 into the books. And we are going to head on over to, if I can do it, game number 167. Um, which was the early game, one of the early Team. games, North America, uh, featuring Teague Eprate playing out of Philadelphia. Hal Schild, um, one of DBN's own, he is our uh, resident uh, professional video editor playing out of Alexandria, Virginia, my uh, near my hometown of DC. France, we have a first time player with us, Spiros Davos. Uh, Germany, we have the, uh, the rare Chris Kelly sighting. Chris Kelly, longtime Windy City weasel. Loves to uh, hang out in the chat, uh, probably uh, probably our most consistent chatter, uh, and an all-around great guy. Doesn't often play, but um, came in uh, when VDL needed a late player. So playing uh, presumably out of Chicago, that's where he lives, but uh, he does travel a bit. Italy, we've got Liam Stokes, Ed Sullivan's uh, erstwhile son, playing out of Victoria, British Columbia. Russia, Ben Kelman, who has uh, sort of been slowly working his way up leaderboards these past couple of years and made some top boards um, playing out of, uh, I believe he is in Philadelphia now. I need to update that. Ben has recently joined the DBN family as a commentator as well. And in Turkey, we've got a first time player with us, Theo Sandstrom. So let's just dive in here and have a look at some moves. I'm going to switch you guys up. 
uh, when I get back over to that screen. Um, but first, put the moves on the board. So Tanya, you're going to do play-by-play -play in the spring here. Tell us what you see. Um, uh, okay, there's a bounce in Piedmont. Um, Kiel moves to Helgeland Bight with Berlin to Kiel. Um, <laughs> and a bounce in Galicia and a bounce in black. And that's all that's notable. I have to, I'm going to, I'm going to interject here. Um, Chris Brand. So in, uh, at, uh, Dipcon at Cascadia, he was Germany and I was England and he did this to me. And so it, 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 it's becoming a little bit of a fad. Like somebody had told it to him and he always wanted to try it. And, uh, and he wondered why I didn't like it as England. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, over, to, over to you. Yeah, uh, I, I think Chris said, "Well, it's a, it's a, it's an opening I've been working on. I think I still think yeah. it's in the working stages. Uh, yeah. I don't really know why England would like this. Uh, the the bounce in Piedmont uh, almost certainly arranged in my book. Uh, it's only you know thing that makes sense uh, in my mind. And uh, we'll go quicker this game, but I do want to say." Teague is a wonderful person to play with. And Liam and Ben, of course, have a very good relationship. So I'd be curious to see uh, what happens uh, with the three of them. All right. Thanks. Turkey's out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the encouragement to go faster here. Uh, Ed, we'll start with you. I don't think I'd like this if I was Teague. Uh, Venice to Trieste and Apulia to Venice. Uh, not going to a GN. I think I'll take Tunis. Um, meanwhile, Turkey takes the black. Uh, this is the inverse uh, of what we saw in the last game where Turkey did not go to the black, uh, but helps. Uh, this time, doesn't put two on. It doesn't, Bulgaria doesn't move to Romania. It firmly supports Romania. An interesting uh, move uh, by Theo. Uh, Meanwhile, the net effect of all these moves, uh, this this Chris Brand opening, the need to brand it something. Uh, gets uh, Denmark, which wasn't guaranteed, uh, by helping York into Belgium and takes Holland. So Germany gets two with the fleet in Holland, which you know I don't really like if I'm England either, uh, even though I just got helped into Belgium. Yeah, it's interesting moves on Germany's end. Like I, I don't, I don't see why you do any of it, and I don't know what it really gets you. <laughs> but it was fun to watch. Yeah, I think in my game, he ended up. Chris ended up uh, just uh, supporting the fleet to Denmark, and so ended up in like a completely standard position. Um, but you know, it's Chris Brand, so it was fun. Uh, and then he attacked me anyway after that. Uh, all right, winter 1901. Uh, did we clear all of the neutrals? We did again. So video on a streak here of clearing all the neutrals in 1901. Uh, this time we only get one fleet from England and Hal with Hal Shield, uh, who puts an army at Edinburgh instead. Ben Kelman over in Russia puts down two armies. Uh, Chris Kelly does the fun, uh, what I call enigmatic thing, and put down uh, uh, fleet Kiel. Um, England, uh, France also does a uh, fleet breast. Um, so we've got some real good, um, sort of Western focused players here, uh, in both of these first two games in the West, which is nice to see, uh, Liam, uh, puts down an army. So, you know, Liam pulled that other army up. Um, so he's got two pointed at, um, Austria and then puts down another army. So it's hard to understand, hard to see that as anything but anti-Austrian, I think. Um, uh, but we will see. And let us move forward. Oh, and Turkey put down Fleet Khan. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the alliance structure is, uh, especially between Italy and Turkey. Uh, all right, spring 1902. Tanya, tell us what you see. Um, Warsaw moves to Galicia. Moscow to Ukraine. St. Petersburg moves down as well. There's uh, support from Sweden, to, from Norway to Skagerrak. Um, so... A, a few holds uh, between France and Germany and Belgium. No one seems to be attacking much there. Uh, Kiel does get into Helgoland Bright. Uh, and other than that, uh, Austria pushes back into Trieste and uh, Italy moves their armies up. And uh, of course, Brest to the English Channel. Ed. 
It's a little short-sighted by Liam getting into uh, taking Trieste and then building the, the army, not even sort of pretending. And I think he's uh, bearing the price for that. Uh, on the other hand, Austria's got problems with Galicia and Ukraine. So I, you know, I don't know how long Teague is for this world. Turkey's looking good. Uh, and Denmark is not looking good for Chris. Uh, the supported move of Sweden uh, by, uh, sorry, uh, Norway to Skagerrak is not good news for Chris Kelly. Uh, I'm wondering what the um, benefit is of holding rum in Bulgaria and support only both. And I suppose maybe no one trusts each other. No one knows what the right move is to, or who to ally with. But I think by spring 1902, you should have an idea of something that those units could do. So Chris Kelly, I believe this is uh, this was probably a spring 1902 negotiation before you know before these moves came out. Uh, so after this turn, Liam told me he hadn't picked any allies or enemies yet. I said, I don't know if Austria would agree with that. <laughs> yeah, but they're definitely in the east. Seems like some kind of unknown element um, to who works with who. I see that. Yeah. All right. Let's move I'm, forward. I'm a little unclear why Munich didn't go to Kiel. If you're going to do this, but. how come? You want to have a support there in Denmark. Oh, I see. I think I think Norway to Skagerrak was probably going to be the move. Yeah, maybe just worried about... Uncertainty on that front on who is working with who. Yeah, might just be worried about Burgundy, right? Like thinking, uh, you know, and, and might not have just expected this. Um, maybe he thought Ben was going to attack Norway. All right, let's move forward here. Fall of 1902. And Ed, over to you. Oof. Chris, lo Chris loses Denmark. Chris loses Belgium. But so for some reason, the French fleets don't do uh, any move. Oh, and Chris takes Belgium. Chris takes yeah. Belgium. Um, yeah, yeah. So Chris takes Belgium. So that was wrong. Uh, so down one, up one. Uh, meanwhile, ooh, bad news for Austria here. Galicia uh, moves to Vienna with Italian support meanwhile italy wow what a move gets into greece and back to trieste with one um teague just got played i don't know what happened there but that 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 was just a that was mean they're mean to teague and uh, liam uh that was bad <laughs> that was good bad bad good <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if they have the confidence, right, to use Tiroli to support uh, Vienna in rather than uh, support your own unit in and still get it anyway. Yeah, I guess maybe all that holding was giving Teague some poor, uh, <laughs> poor hope that maybe that there was something they could do, um, but there wasn't anything they could do. <laughs> and now, uh, now they're pretty doomed. So. All right. And uh, also curious to see what the consequence of these holds are. Uh, kind of feels like to Tanya to your point last turn that Spiros just hasn't picked a direction yet, um, mm -hmm. and maybe needs to. Although did Burgundy hold Belgium? I think this could be a really tricky. Like, oh, you just cut me in Burgundy, and you can have Belgium because otherwise English would also hold Belgium. So I'm I'm going to assume it's an FG. Uh, yeah, but then again, right, if it's an FG, then, you know, you'd probably want Mid-Atlantic to be going up to North Atlantic or Irish here and doing something. All right, let's uh, move forward and find out some more information. And Winter 1902 finds Ben Kelman with another army in Moscow and Liam Stokes with a, a fleet. Maybe the, <laughs> this one actually feels a little surprising. I don't know. What about you guys? Uh, would you have put army down here, army Venice? Uh, maybe not. If Turkey's my next uh, um, victim, <laughs> Turkey just helped you in Greece, right? Yeah, but who's who's Tur who's up next? Turkey's dead. <laughs> Turkey can't linger there for fun, can they? <laughs> Behind yeah. all my thoughts. Though. Yeah, I suppose if you're Turkey, you're not loving that or that. <laughs> Tur Turkey's dead. Let's just call it. Theo is bye. All right. Well, let's see. I feel like Theo's still got some life, but. Uh... We've also established that Liam likes to uh, show his next move by his build. <laughs> so this is on brand. All right. Uh, Tanya, keep keep going. Tell us, uh, right. tell us about so it. Right. So Ionian into the Eastern Med, as predicted. And um, Ben playing a little bit more buddy-buddy uh, with Turkey. Bulgaria is supported into Serbia, while uh, Budapest awesome. uh, is also... Sorry? 
I said it's awesome. It. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, my bad. Um, and then on the Western side, uh, the English Russian relationship continues to help each other. And um, France has actually decided that they're going to help that English army back into Belgium at the expense of Chris Kelly. Yeah, so now we get some clarity on the alliance structure in the West, and and Chris is the odd person out. Um, I'm still I'm still not totally convinced. Mm. That was spring, right? That was spring. I'm not convinced. Let's All see. All right, is <laughs> Belgium where English armies go to die more than once? Uh, not this time. No. Whoa. But some other stuff happens. Ed, tell us about it. Yeah, I guess it wasn't a winter green. Uh, that that's uh, you know. The moves from Turkey sort of demonstrated that uh, Turkey gets uh, Serbia, Turkey gets uh, hold Serbia, Turkey takes Greece, and uh, Teague uh, gets helped as a janissary back into his home center of, of Trieste. So you know we have Juggernaut here, and it's looking like a pretty good one uh, in my mind. In the West, uh, let's see, Chris Kelly, crafty Chris Kelly, now uh, gets uh, Denmark back uh, with the help of Russia. Uh, Russia helping England, Russia helping Nor uh, Germany, Russia helping anybody, uh, keeping balance there in the north, kind of cagey by Ben, uh, but I like it. And uh, the English army did not die. Tanya, um, what do you think of Ben's play here? Uh, you know, in interesting that uh, it doesn't move uh, Moscow anywhere. Um, I uh, yeah, what do you make of it? Yeah, I feel like he's waiting for an opening, and when that opening arises, that's where those armies will move, or he just like doesn't know what to do with them. Um, because if he moves them south, he'll piss off Theo. If he moves them north, he'll piss off someone else. I imagine what we're going to see, he gets a build here, right? Yep. Probably something in St. Petersburg to take Nor uh, Norway, and then maybe Moscow moves up to St. Petersburg after that. Um, but I, I do think Ben plays a very, like, wait and see kind of game so he he's not one to sort of throw everything in one direction um, yeah kg was the term that uh ed just used and i, li I like yeah. that for for ben here mm -hmm. all right so we're predicting fleet st petersburg north coast any any dissenters or any, army or army and the answer is fleet north coast uh turkey gets two builds here puts down fleet Khan and army ank uh, Italy forced to disband, pulls that uh, army in, uh, has two disbands, pulls the army in Albania and the fleet in Tunis. Uh, everything else is, is um, static. So the West, you know, is sitting here at five centers each, um, you know, so interesting to see if they um, respond now to the, the, uh, the sudden juggernaut. Spring of 1904, um, back to you, Tanya, tell us what you see. Um, I see some German armies moving east, and uh, per I, I don't know what England was doing here. I think they attempted to convoy York to Norway, but lost uh, north to, um, to Germany. I wonder if there was some sort of let's do a Western triple agreement, and then Germany just said, well, I'm going to... I'm going to take north, although they did help Baltic into Sweden. So it's just a little bit confusing up there. I don't really know. Oh, come I, on, I would be really stressed out if I had to play with Chris as a neighbor. That's <laughs> all I'm really gathering here. Oh, um, it's, gr it's great, though, isn't it? Gets the fleet out of Baltic and harms the board leader. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But you piss off Russia for, for right. what, you know. <laughs> um, and then on the east, uh, it seems like the juggernaut continues um and liam is out of friends Ed, but uh, but spain is moving to west for better or for worse once again <laughs> it's coming for protection it's coming to help no other motives ed you like this play by uh, by chris kelly here chris no <laughs> i mean first of all i'd rather i'd rather the army be i mean it would have bounced anyways, yeah. right? So I mean, you know, know, yeah. but uh, you know, fine. We'll see what happens in the fall. Maybe he puts it in the fall. Who knows? All right, um, let's move forward into the fall and uh, tell us what you see, Ed. <laughs> uh, well, 
I see that Russia kept Norway. Uh, I'm not sure why, because of the London subway tube, but fine. Uh, meanwhile, Germany back on the, I mean, oh my God, Germany back. Uh, and <laughs> so Russia gets nets out of this, Sweden and Norway yeah. uh, somehow. Great, great moves by Ben. I, I don't know how he did it. And uh, good, we say goodbye to Teague. Uh, Liam doing a very Liam thing, convoying. Brilliant and Tunis is like, I'm saving Tunis. You're not getting it, guys. Uh, you know, uh, okay. Uh, meanwhile, Why? the are coming. Uh, curious. It's crazy to convoy your army to Tunis. Why would you do that? You've got Rome and Naples to cover. <laughs> now, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but this way he can, uh, uh, Adriatic can support hold Ionian while uh, Venice supports Albania into Trieste. Gotta love it. <laughs> uh, all right. So the net result here is that Ben Coleman uh, continues steady growth, has got one each year for the last four years now, or for each of the four years we've played. Uh, and is sitting at nine with a two-center lead over uh, Theo Sandstrom in Turkey, while everyone else is uh, another two centers below or worse. Uh, what has Ben put down for his troubles? An army in Moscow, slightly enigmatic. Maybe that is uh, meant to be a nicety towards um, uh, towards Chris Kelly in Germany. Uh, Theo puts down another fleet, which is interesting. So there'll be a question here of how much he'll be able to, to do with it anytime soon. Uh, and that does suggest that he's not interested in uh, in uh, doing anything against Ben anytime soon. Spring of 1905 uh, sees some movement. Uh, Tanya, tell us about it. So uh, Juggernaut continues to hold each other. Turkey is moving uh, towards attempting to take Ionian, but I believe Tyrrhenian Sea supports Ionian to hold, right? So... Uh, yes. um, France has decided that, uh, I guess I won't take your dots, Liam. Um, I will simply help you. And also take Tunis. <laughs> Never mind. I'll take Tunis <laughs> and help you. Um, <laughs> and meanwhile, the West um, is maybe sort of uh, getting it together. At least thing armies are holding, fleets are moving, North moves out, um, and England gets back into the North. And I believe Russia threw his support on North to hold. Is that what's going on? Or are they? That's right. That's right. Support? Yeah. But North didn't hold, moved to Denmark. That's right. All right. So not a whole lot happening here. Uh, My right. assumption is a Western triple is coming. <laughs> All right. Just so, so. Could happen, but I'm very scared if I'm Turkey right now. Ben didn't do anything. Ben can totally, you know, Turkey continues to move west and ben just sat all right fall of 1905 let's see if anything happens does anything happen ed got a really good convoy back to london um other than that like uh it's it's just people staring at each other on the wall saying you move first this is so bizarre <laughs> it's like a yeah I, I don't know um France gets a build. <laughs> France does get a build, and Turkey has a uh, Italy has a disband, I should say, and those end up being an army in Naples and fleet in Marseille. And um, all right, spring 1906, the game ends. <laughs> oh, that's horrible! <laughs> that was really horrible. Oh, okay. Uh, horrible is the reaction from Tanya. Tell us why. <laughs> And I just felt like there was there was play left. The West was totally unfigured out. It should have been figured out. I don't understand why you take a draw. Oh, well, you know, I kind of do because sometimes I take silly draws like this. But uh, yeah, you could you could keep playing. You could eliminate someone and attack Ben a little bit and freak him out. And I think there's things to do. <laughs> but it's also March in BDLs, so I understand. Ed, what do you think about this result? I like the draw. Turkey had no play against Russia. I mean, France has, you know, got fleet problems against Turkey. Nobody wants to talk to Chris Kelly anymore. It just <laughs> monopolizes every conversation. 
I mean, you know, uh, how how is this ready to go to sleep at you know nine in the morning? Uh, it makes sense. This draw makes perfect sense for me. When you, when you put it that way, I'm I'm convinced. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> It's very cautious, right? Very cautious play from uh, Chris and Hal in particular because they're the Scandinavian dots are there for the taking. They could easily split them. Uh, and this to me is the West does not get along <laughs> and mm -hmm. wants this game to end. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, we can see the score that Ben gets uh, with a nine center board top. That's 90 points. And so, you know, two games in, uh, he is currently first place in VDL. Um, so that's going to bring to a conclusion uh, our, the first half of our coverage of the VDL. That's two games in the books. We have two VDL games to cover uh, later in the show. But we're going to take a break now to spend some time covering the Olympus semifinals. Uh, before we do that, we're going to bring Mr. David Hood onto the stream. Welcome, Mr. Hood. Hey, folks. How are you doing? Good to see you, man. Good. Welcome. Happy Easter. Yeah. Welcome to the coverage. Way to go, Ben Kelman. Man, that was that was quite a nail biter. That was went down to the wire. <laughs> the wire that he pulled tightly. Uh. Yeah, I think I think y'all were right. The West just had no idea what they were going to do, and so they said, "Let's not. We can't figure this out. Let's just quit." Yeah. That's what they did. Yeah, I, look, it, you know, if you're topping the board and nobody uh, can trust anyone else enough to come after you, then that's a that's a way that you win the game of diplomacy. Yeah, it's a great way to win as Russia because you can get out to those early quick starts like that. And then if the game goes on too long, of course, you can't defend yourself. So it's, it's great for Russia in that situation. Yeah, it's almost the flip side to early leader syndrome, isn't it? It's uh, like early domination uh, syndrome that makes everyone else compliant. Yep. Well, um, we're going to turn our attention to uh, to the Olympus coverage. Um, why don't we start taking some breaks here? Um and uh, Tanya, why don't we give you, or Ed, you want a break first? All right, we're gonna give Ed a break first, and then uh, let's see, we'll see you in a bit, Ed. Um, and we're gonna bring onto the stream here, um, the inventor, the founder of Olympus, uh, one Mr. Nicholas Spencer, who goes by the, the name Bob's a Builder. Uh, Nicholas, welcome to uh, DBN. Pleasure to be here. So uh, tell us a little bit about Olympus, uh, how you uh, started it, how you came to the idea of it, um, and uh, how you've grown it um, from its beginnings last year. So Olympus was originally started as sort of an informal league on Backstabber when I did not know the Discord world in order to promote more sustained and regular play because there were a lot of people who quit. So you had to have a certain sustainability and percentage record in terms of turns you get in. Um, and then from there, it's kind of grew. And I forget who mentioned it to me, but someone mentioned backhand, oh, you realize there's an entire Discord world for this. And I'm like, oh, really? So then we switched to Discord um, and then have kind of naturally grown from there. But our focus, having grown from the backstabber world without realizing there was a Discord world, is sort of bringing to light to the Discord hobby all these new players that people never hear about and showing these backstabber players, hey, you can play, you can play here. There's lots to explore. And we've had a lot of success throughout the two years now we've done that in bringing new players to the light of diplomacy out of that world. So, so, um, well, actually before we, you tell us about the details of the Olympus seasons that have happened so far. Um, um, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you came to diplomacy. Um, like how did you first get introduced to the game? And well, we'll dive a little deeper after that. I was first introduced to the game. I was given the game as a birthday present mm. uh, because my friends knew I love war games. So diplomacy was actually a very good fit for me. Only problem, it's a seven player game that lasts five, six hours for a good game. And obviously it couldn't get anyone to play. So I shoved it at the back of my closet, not thinking I'll bring it up again because I just had no way of playing. Then I saw a video by Media Wars actually 
by Media Wars, by um, by Captain Mean Media Wars during the pandemic. I forget what I was. I think I was spe- looking up specific strategies regarding a different game, Axis and Allies, to play against my brother. Um, because I like tactic strategies. How do you pull off the best Operation Barbarossa on the board, etc.? And this came up instead as a YouTube recommendation by the algorithm. So I clicked on it because I vaguely knew of the game, given I was given it as a birthday present, and I do like war games. And I realized there's an entire... You can play this game entirely online through Backstabber. And as a bored teenager with nothing to do during the pandemic, since everything was shut down, I just thought, "Eh, may as well have a go. And I started playing. And what is it about the game that you, that you love? Like, what is the, what is the thing about diplomacy that, that gets you that no other game has? Um, definitely the interconnections and how you can necessarily write it the way you wish, because, and it also it's simplicity. It's like chess in the idea. It's so simple yet so complex at the same time. And that along with my deep appreciation of history has really drawn me to the game and really in many ways helped deepen my understanding of how foreign relations work, how, how to talk to people, et cetera, because that was another thing. I'm not that social a guy. So it was also a tool of mine I was using in order to help me not socialize more as much as communicate better with people. Uh, it's uh, one of the great things I love about this game is that uh, everybody has different things that they find um, compelling about it. And uh, and that leads to so many different approaches to the game as well. Um, so, you know, simple rules, complex gameplay, like you said, but uh, but even more complex sort of feeling about the game and uh, enjoy, everyone enjoys it seemingly in their own way. Yes, absolutely. So now tell us how, so Olympus uh, had its first season last year that concluded in August, I believe. Yes, um, correct. And that was won by Bradley Grace. Bradley Grace was the champion. And so then you started the second season uh, uh, right away? Yeah, shortly after that. I think we had like a three-week break or something like that, which may not sound like a lot, but none of the finalists um, needed to play in the preliminaries. Being a finalist, you were received an auto call to the semifinals. Um, so so then we, we immediately got into the preliminaries and now we're currently in the second round of the semifinals with what we're viewing today being the first round, the first four games. And what was the format of the preliminary rounds? So the preliminary rounds, um, each player plays two games on Backstabber um, in order to prevent any meta play or anything. They were strictly anonymous. Um, All communication had to be through backstabber, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the top 21 scores advanced to the semifinals, where then at the same time, we invited the seven semi, uh, sorry, seven finalists back in order to play. Six of them accepted. One of them refused, Tarsier. So instead we brought in 22 the top 22 players from the preliminaries. And that made our first four boards for the semifinals, which were actually randomized and decided by none other than Zachary Moore on an earlier uh, DBN episode. So, Yeah, uh, Zach and uh, Bradley Grace uh, got together and did a random draw. Um, and so you took the top four seeds and they each got... Uh, they each got uh, distributed to one of the four boards and then the next four seeds to the next four boards and so forth, right? Yes, exactly. And the another neat thing I'd like to say, uh, well, kind of, is that of, of for our second season, we decided to go much more with the theme of it being Olympus. So all our boards are named after some Greek god. Um, and if you won a board, you became that god on the server. So the winners of all the preliminary rounds, you, you can imagine just how much fun some of the players had with the um, <laughs> the names. The final board will be the Zeus board, so they're essentially vying for my title. <laughs> but the 
four boards you're going to see here tonight. They're named Hades, Apollo, Athena, and Artemis, respectively. Um, and uh, so, yeah, um, what's at stake? Um, trying to see if they can compete for the Zeus title and trying to see if they can become one of those four gods as well. <laughs> All right, and these are um, almost winner take all. The the board topper. Uh, so you had Paris method to decide. Uh, yes, we had breakers, and then the winner, the board topper, qualifies for the championship game. This is uh, borrowed uh, in somewhat from the DBN Invitational. Yes, correct? yes, it was hugely inspired by the DBN Invitational, except two critical rule changes that you will see affect play here. Number one, in order to advance to the next round, um, naturally. Um, you start out with 28 players, four of which advance to the finals. Only 21 players continue to the second round. Those 21 players, they're not decided by their preliminary rankings. They're decided by their rankings of after the first round because we use an OMG, um, open mind the gap scoring system for non-player non toppers from the first round of the semifinals. So that means that the first three players eliminated in the semifinals are fully eliminated. They cannot come back unless they're an alternate, which actually did happen. I won't spoil much. But that means for these players, you will see this, a bit of a competition in order to not be that person to get eliminated. As it wasn't like DBN in that if you were the first eliminated, but but uh, you were number 19th in the preliminary round, it, it was fine, no. So there was that. And then the second huge rule change, um, the semifinals actually directly decide the final rankings of the top seven players. What do I mean by that? Um, so you have the first four rounds of play. Say that player is A, B, C, and D qualify respectively, and then you have players E, F, and G, all right? The, fi the final board, um, uh, after the final board is said and done, say that player G wins the game, even if player A was seventh, player A still remains second place in the overall standings of the tournament for reasons of DBN points. This is so as to encourage this idea of winner-take-all mentality there is no, there is no um, secondary motive in the final round. Thus, the players in the semifinals will want to optimize their score as best as they can. Because if you're first in the semifinals, you're guaranteed second overall in the entire tournament that is Olympus, which is already pretty uh, large. So there's that at stake. And the finals only determines who's first place with all the other places in between just moving down one so those are the two main critical rule changes that are different from dbn from the, invita see. from the invitational all right well it sounds really interesting i think we're excited to see uh how the games went and how you know maybe if we can discern how those rule differences might have affected play um i'm going to give uh my uh co-commentators here david and tanya a chance to uh to pop a question for nicholas before we uh before we let him go david we'll start with you Nicholas, first of all, as I've already told you in past occasions, thank you for doing this. It's really helpful uh, to have another really cool extended deadline tournament for people or league for people to play in. So it's, it's awesome. Do you think that the rule changes you just talked about have, in fact, influenced play in the way that you wanted them to? Um, perhaps without, without, second, gi without giving us any spoilers, without giving you any spoilers, the second rule change, yes. The first rule change, I may have to look at again. <laughs> Which well, was the first right. rule change again? Which one? The was first it? rule change is that y is that you, in order to get to the second round, you are not using your preliminary rankings. You're using your first round rankings. So you don't, you don't want to be the first couple of people eliminated. Yeah. No, you don't. Okay. So, all right, well, we'll see how that plays out in these four games. Uh, so did you did you, you, did you um, have lots of people come back from the first 
uh, season to the second season? I'm talking about people that didn't make the top board. Yes, yes, plenty. Um, our, oh, yeah, yeah, many, many people did come back, um, which is exactly that which we wanted. And also many people who were brand new to the Discord world to play from who who learned of Olympus through Backstabber um, continued uh, there on. The best example I can give is Nick Heibel, who uh, he's also known as Vulpez, who as a rookie was, I want to say, second in the first season and then has ever since um, gone to, I think, a face-to-face -face event in uh, Britain and is now playing a lot more um, uh, bat, um, uh, diplomacy in all sorts of formats and has also returned to the second season. And you're going to see a lot of big names in the second season because although the second season was slightly smaller than the first season, um, there are a lot of more experienced players started hearing about it and were definitely interested. Well, you know, it's, it's a lot of coverage. Yeah, it's quite exciting. You know, David, this is how I started uh, playing uh, Diplomacy, was online extended deadline on a website where I had my username and was uh, <laughs> uh, abusing people on the internet. So uh, I'm excited to see. I'm sure there's tons of drama that we won't be privy to, tons of things going on on the boards. Um, but it, it's always fun to see extended deadline games because you get some really crazy plays because they have so much time to negotiate and get to know each other. And it's not like 10, 15 minutes where you're just, uh, you need quickly to establish trust. It's like, okay, we're going to talk to each other for. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that, and speaking of which I should mention that other rule regarding negotiations, um, players had 24 hour turns, except for the first turn that was 48 hours. All of the first round, the preliminaries, was strictly on backstabber in order to prevent any meta. Uh, the second, uh, by the semifinals, I released all restrictions. You can communicate via backstabber. You can communicate via Discord. You can meet your friend at the pub and have a beer while discussing diplomacy moves. I did not care, provided it was appropriate talk. <laughs> um, so I had a complete hands-off approach with that. So that as well helped influence play in some ways as people did not have to strictly rely on backstabber and could communicate however they wished. So guardrails removed for these four games. All right. That, that tells us something to look forward to. <laughs> and was there any time limit or anything like that? Or Yes. All these games had a time limit of winter 1912. Okay. Um, now I don't know if Brandon will show you who who outranked who in terms of the Paris method selection, but in case there was a tie, well, we were using Paris method in order to differentiate who would win. Now, for those that out there that may be watching DBN for the first time or watching tournament coverage for the first time, they may want to know what Paris method means. So, uh, Nicholas, you want to do the honors? Yes, of course. So Paris method is a um, is by now a very common format used by many different um, uh, tournaments in order to discern who gets which nation and who would win in a tiebreaker. Um, players are first decided based on previous rankings. In this case, um, based on preliminary rankings, the Paris method selection went as follows. The, you're ranked higher than a person. You go first, then second, then third, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you start from the lowest ranked player at the bottom, number seven, and well, theoretically number seven, but number seven can't really do anything. So you start with number six and you ask him, what do you want to do? Do you want to stay in your position, stay at, pick, at a picking spot of six, or do you want to move to a picking spot below um, uh, as in go to number seven. Um, and why you would do that is that although the lower your picking spot, 
the more of a chance you have of winning the tiebreaker with the lowest picking spot winning all tiebreakers in comparison to all other players and nations. Um, so, so this is so, so the pair also of- the lower picking spot means that you you have more information about who the other players are playing so that you can make a different decision about where to be it, next to who. Exactly, exactly. But the cost to picking at a lower picking spot is the fact that when the nation picking comes to you, you will have less of a decision to decide. So first that question is come to the sixth player. Then the fifth player is asked the same question. You want to stay in your position or do you want to drop to sixth or seventh? Then the fourth, then the third, then the second, then the first. And once everything's decided based on those players, whatever the position picking position were, say the first player dropped down to third or something, and say it's second, third, first, fourth, fifth, seventh, sixth, I'm making stuff up, then then whoever is in the first picking spot now, regardless of their original play ranking, picks the nation first. And then you go back down. Uh, the order again. And that decides both who is being drawn, which nation with some ability of choice and also who in the case of a tie, when say a draw is agreed to, or the deadline is met winter 1912, who would win in a tie break? Brandon, do you have any experience in Paris method and tiebreakers at the end of a really important game. I, I just, I can't remember. Do you have any such experience? You know, I don't know. I don't think he does since he always just goes for the classic Fogel 11, 11, 11. So. Wow. Yeah, that's, yeah, that is a thing that's happened. That's nice. um, you know, I like my uh, computer. Uh, my mind has gotten very foggy all of a sudden. And um, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go take some vapors to clear them. Um Nicholas, I want to thank you very, very much for joining us today. We're going to go have a look at some of these games and uh, and enjoy some of the action from the Olympus League uh, that you have set up, which by all accounts looks very successful. So I want to congratulate you, congratulate you on, uh, on a very successful competition. Thank you for covering this and thank you for bringing me on the show. And I also want to thank you, I should say, not just congratulate you, but thank you for um, an important addition to the diplomacy hobby. Of course. All right, Nicholas, we will see you uh, again soon and hope uh, hope we do the games justice. Take care. All right, good night. All right, let's bring uh, Tanya back on stage here and let's have a look at some of these games. Um, and let me uh, let's see if I can use some of the uh, some of the league night pizzazz that Brian Prevel has set up here. All right. First up is uh, the first semifinal that we will cover on Olympus 2024. This one is named after the Greek god Apollo. Uh, and this is the Paris method. Um, there's a Paris method for each of these. Some were more interesting than others. This was definitely on the more interesting side. You can see that there was a lot of movement among the players um, and uh, some unconventional choices here. France, not surprising. That often goes first. Uh, but then you can see that Austria went fourth. Thank you, Chris Ward, um, who's becoming an unconventional player himself. And uh, and we see Russia made it all the way down to seventh. You know, Russia has become a popular pick uh, in the virtual face-to-face hobby. Uh, but this is extended deadline, and culture is a little bit different there. Uh, all right, let us dive right in. Since we uh, we don't know too many of these players, we know Bradley Grace, we know Christopher Ward, um, and I, I've seen some of the other handles before, but um uh don't uh, you know don't, not enough to characterize their play um all right let's have a look at some moves here and uh david uh, so i don't know if you caught any of the coverage before we're gonna try in this format where um one person does play by play you'll do play by play in the spring so just calling out the moves uh, as you see them and we'll leave analysis for tanya and then we'll flip flop that in uh in the fall all right so first to you, uh, what, what happens in spring of 1901? Nobody goes to Burgundy. So you've got the French going to Picardy in Spain with their armies. You've got the uh, Yorkshire variant of the Churchill opening for England. Got what is probably the most standard opening there for the Germans. Let's see. You do have a bounce in Galicia, but no bounce in the Black Sea. You've got the Russians going straight into Romania with the fleet, which is a, a, a move that you don't see all that often. And then 
not last but not least, the Italians doing the Tyrolean adventure there, moving up there to give them options for the fall. All right, and Tanya, what can you glean about uh, what's going on behind the scenes from what you see here? Just quickly, the uh, move to the English Channel indicates uh, not a great thing for England, um, but still can be worked through. And then other than that, pretty standard, I would say. Yeah, David, you got to love that, except for Marseille going to Spain, not Burgundy. That's got to got to be a little disappointing it's just it's just a hood hog variant it's fine yeah yeah this is the, I, I, this, I like people to experiment this is the spanish head hedgehog then or uh, something who knows yeah. all right let's uh or spanish hood hog i should say pardon my french um fall of 1901 over to you tanya what do you what happens um there was a bit of miscommunication apparently um between uh, france and uh, Germany, France attempts to support Denmark into uh, North Sea, but instead uh, North Sea helps Ruhr into Belgium. Um, uh, no friends there for France. Uh, Tyrolia goes into Trieste, does, leaves, uh, had two options, uh, would have picked right either way. Um, and as well, Constantinople, I believe, is... I don't know what that uh, blue convoy. Was. It was uh, okay. black is convoying Khan into Romania, not successfully. He was okay. snookered. He yes. was snookered. And uh, actually, the fleet in Rome, um, pretty good for Austria. Didn't mention that uh, last time, but pretty good for Austria. Uh, and now uh, Bulgaria has to disband. And there's a bounce in Sweden, notably. <laughs> Yeah, David, uh, how do you feel about it? You don't often see the fleet and, you know, you see it open to Romania sometimes. Um, and that's clearly very pro Austria. And if you're Austria, are you happier with the fleet in Bulgaria? You're happy that you have an ally. Yeah. You've got an AR from the very beginning. This I used to, I used to see these moves in, a lot, in the very old days, <laughs> except it was usually the Russians going to the Black Sea and then being supported from the Black Sea to Bulgaria. So it's a thing that I, I have not seen this in years and years and years. It's fun to see it. It really is. The other thing I was going to say is that the um, it wasn't a miscommunication between France and Germany. Germany just <laughs> said, no, I'm going with England, man. I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know what, don't know what you're thinking. I'm going with England. Um, we'll call it a misnegotiation. Yeah, that? misnegotiation. No, that's, that's a... <laughs> misread or something but anyway obviously eg that's why there's a bounce in sweden is that there's going to be eg cooperation here at least that's what germany hopes um i, want, I kind of want like a name for this when when england sniffs out the sea lion and turns it on its head it's like the i don't know land lion or something they need a better name than that uh all yeah. right well turns into a walrus, you know, cuckoo, cuckoo. But three <laughs> German, uh, the three German builds is, is nothing to sneeze at. I like the cuckoo, cuckoo. That, that works for this. Uh, yeah. So the net result is that um, uh, Germany gets three builds and uh, we get to see what they put down. But yet again, oh no. So now we have our first neutral of the, uh, of the night in Sweden uh, after 1901. Spain, Spain as well. Spain as well. Thank you. So we have first two neutrals. Um, Wait, Romania is still neutral also. We I have the first say. three neutrals, as I was saying, of the night. Brand, Brandon's not very bright. <laughs> are, there, are there any other neutrals? <laughs> no, Brandon, those would be the three. <laughs> Serious neutral. For the builds, we get, uh, with those three German builds, we do get two armies and a fleet, I think, as England would write them, uh, these builds. And England puts down fleet in Liverpool, so it's uh, definitely game on for the EG. Uh, elsewhere, we have Bradley Grace putting down two fleets, so uh, that suggests that possibly Trieste was uh, either agreed upon or um, uh, Bradley's indicating that it's not going to try to defend it. Uh, and you know France had a um, had a decision to make here and decided to uh, go with army. Um, so uh, let's move forward here and I think the out. army the army Saint Pete is the most interesting build as far as I'm concerned. You, you've you've got the AR focus, and then you decided you're going to play in the north as well. I know I know he thinks his EG is coming, but the army is only going to help for so much for so long. I don't know. That's interesting that you're going to try to slow that down instead of trying to speed up your offensive in the South with another army. And you think you could have been useful in the South. That's, that's the basic point. Maybe go to Armenia, cover Sebastopol, that sort of thing. Yep. 
All right, let us uh, see how this evolves in spring of 1902. And uh, David, tell us what happens. Uh, supported move to Baltic, which is totally expected. What maybe might not be expected, Norway to Sweden with support of the Russians. Um, let's see. The fleet, uh, Liverpool goes to Wales instead of going to the, to the to a sea zone, which is interesting. Um, Portugal to Spain because they're going to take that uh, center. We now have the um, Austrians taking Bulgaria and killing that Russian fleet, which is interesting, as the Austrians also go to Galicia. So what looked like an AR, maybe AI. Um, Convoy to Armenia is an interesting and probably a good defensive move for the Turks, not knowing what the Russians were going to do there. Uh, Tanya, over to you. It's quite a dramatic um, sort of a, a change in both theaters. Uh, you like it? This is really standard for extended deadline. I feel there's a lot of alliance switches because there's so much time to talk and to plan and mm -hmm. to plot and to convince people to do what you want. So I wouldn't be shocked if we saw things like this in every game where in face to face you would never do this because you need that you need to build that trust really fast so i think that this is a product of of that type of gameplay um yeah clearly something uh, broke down in german negotiations because it doesn't seem like they have um at any friends at the very least uh seems as if england and france worked out um the 1901 moves uh i'm i'm not really sure if uh Italy uh sorry if Turkey should be doing what it's doing I'm I would be a little bit concerned about uh maybe the AI maybe they didn't see it coming I'm not really sure um but yeah definitely uh AI got the jump on the juggernaut which uh let's see how that goes yeah, that's really helpful what you said about um, having all the time to make plans and so the uh, the like the results can be more elaborate. Uh, in terms of alliance structure and in um, uh, sort of the plans, the tactical plans that end up uh, demonstrating whatever changes in alliance structure have happened. You got your start in extended deadline play. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. So for uh, three, four years, I only played um, online on extended deadline. I never played live games. So this is how I learned how to play it as got well. It. All right, yeah. so this is this is like coming home then for you. It is. It is. <laughs> All right, fall 1902. Uh, tell us about it. Uh, that's me, right? So um, Turkey takes Sevastopol um, and Russia does appear to be the odd one out in the um, in the south. However, uh, there's a bounce in Aegean. Tunis is convoyed back to Rome. Uh, on the in the west, we have um, let's see, Norway holds Sweden, which Baltic attempts to get into. So there's a attack on Germany uh, as well as a convoy into Wales by France at the same time. That EG didn't last too long, did it, David? No, it didn't. And and, and uh, that's fascinating. Well, the, the, the convoy to Wales is incredibly fun. I know. Uh, now, <laughs> England is building, so that doesn't have quite the same oomph that it would have if they weren't building, but it's it's still pretty awesome. Uh, what a turnaround for Turkey now, um, you know, at least getting a little bit of breathing room. We'll see if he, if there's any chance that Gausha has to, or Goish, or pronounce that, to, to turn, you know, Wardy and or Bradley Grace against each other. It's what he's going to have to try to do. I think, you know, Bradley, it's impressive play here um, from Bradley. Uh, and I think we saw the fruit of those two fleet builds and not an army build uh, in the, the negotiations with uh, Christopher Ward. Um, but, you know, Bradley's Bradley has demonstrated his chops. He has a, become a sort of top notch negotiator and Wardy has really come up uh, sort of through the ranks now. So, uh, you know, those are two players we know about. We're learning about the other players on the board, but. Uh, yeah, and Spur, and Spur, I'm sorry, Tony, go ahead. Oh, no, I also believe Nicholas mentioned that Bradley won the first version yeah. of Olympus. Defending champion. So that could, I, I don't know if that gives him any bonus or anything, but uh, he could very much be like, hey, listen, I've already won this, you know, let me, <laughs> let me be a good ally too. <laughs> I should say the other player that I'm familiar with is Sploa because he's played in some other tournament le and league settings and, and has actually had a YouTube channel for a while. Okay. Um, and and as I recall, I believe he plays from Poland. Nice. 
Well, you know, look, it's a nice turn to get, uh, you know, if he had any hand in getting France to move on uh, England here, that's, that's uh, you know, well done on his part or their part. All right, winter 1902, we do get builds both from England and France, which find more fleets um, in the <laughs> pointed west here. You know, if you're German, you just, you just got to be saying yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, can they negotiate during build phases? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Nicholas, if you're still watching, uh, if you would please uh, DM me or, or post that in the comments, uh, that would be great. Um, I'll DM him in a second uh, if we don't get an answer. Elsewhere, we get um, uh, Russia uh, saying goodbye to that northern fleet. We get another fleet in the south from Bradley, another army, uh, armies both from Turkey and Austria. All right, let's move forward here into spring of 1903. David, tell us what happens. Uh, fleets going into the Eastern Med couldn't be stopped. So there, there comes Bradley. Also, the Austrian fleet gets into the water in the Aegean. Um, the Turks are trying to play defense. You can see the, you know, the supported attack on Romania with Russian support, which is cut. Uh, so there's a little bit of an attempt to, to rebuild some defenses against a potential AI. Looking at the West, you've got the German fleets getting in position to Skagrak in Denmark. You've got the Russian, I'm sorry, the French army in Wales dying once it got there. Apparently that's where French armies go to die as well. Uh, nice move by not the droids to, 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 to piff that army. Tanya, what do you make of all of this? Yeah, I was really shocked when I saw Turkey build army Ankara because I just thought that that would be really inflexible. I wonder if there was some sort of AIT that was possibly forming and then Turkey uh, just got blindsided by the AI, but I, 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 at least I saw it coming. I don't know why Turkey built the army. Um, otherwise, uh, seems like a bit more coordination between Russia and Turkey, but I think too little too late. Uh, and there is a little bit of um, doubt between Germany and France. I don't think there's a, a lot of honesty. The Belgium moving to Burgundy just to make sure it didn't move is not a move that I would do to a trusted ally. So I wonder if there's still room for England to perhaps move one or the other against, uh, against the other. It's nice to get, uh, to get that army popped. Um, Spain holding is, is curious. Um, so let's move forward here and see what the consequences are. Uh, Tanya, over to you. So there's a bounce um, in Liverpool uh, and a few, a few shifts here. I believe Denmark gets into Sweden, North gets into Denmark, English gets into North and London gets into English. <laughs> 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 and Norway goes to Sweden, of course, uh, because uh, not. <laughs> so, uh, quite a bit of changes here. That Tyrolean army still trying to keep Munich honest and, <laughs> and Belgium still moving to Burgundy. So some things, uh, never change. Uh, and we've got a convoy from Apulia to Syria yeah. and um, suddenly Romania is helping Turkey into Ukraine um, and Turkey is convoying Ankara to Sevastopol. And I'll let you do the analysis. On all of yeah. that, well, that, is, that is what we call setting up a government in exile. He's, <laughs> he's, he's realizing that his country is gone. He's going to try to be the Ottoman empire or the ottoman government in exile in southern russia so that's the that's what's going on here is an attempt to survive as as nicholas said earlier when we're doing the interview because of the rule changes where it's so mm. important not to be eliminated mm. maybe he's trying to figure out a way not to be eliminated early right, now i will right. say it it is often easier to survive in turkey than in southern russia but we shall find out whether this <laughs> gambit, whether this gambit works but we have a surefire Real live Lepanto, yeah, with the army going into Syria, which you don't always see that you know played out all the way through to the traditional end. Yeah, it's quite it's it's quite aesthetically pleasing from Bradley Grace here. Um, of course, it's it, the Lepanto is really easy to 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 make it work when the Turks leave Turkey. It's going <laughs> to make that going to make that invasion really really easy. Yeah, the the other thing about this, um, the, the way that the scoring works, it, you don't want it. It's it's not just not getting eliminated that's important. Um, you're also getting ranked by your scores in round one. So the better you do, um, the higher you'll be ranked going into the second chance games. So second place doesn't matter quite a bit. 
you know, this is definitely not winner take all. Um, and not uh, in that sense. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I, you know, question for me is, uh, who, who does this dipsy doodle in the West advantage? Um, you know, uh, England, uh, disbanded this, um, army in, or this unit in Sweden rather than retreat it, which with, uh, in combination with the, uh, taking of St. Petersburg means they get to put two units down in England. So the defense of the English, um, homeland suddenly looks very solid. Um, but who, you know, but now is, is France drawn out of position? Who's, who's got the advantage here? Um, we'll put down the builds here, uh, which are two fleets for, for England, another fleet for, for France. Um, so just taking stock here in 1903, who do you guys like? That's basically the question here. Tanya, we'll start with you. I don't know what I'm going to choose one of A or I, maybe Italy. I think I'd be Italy here if I David? could choose. David. Yeah, that, I think Bradley's got the best position. If I were if I were asked to choose a, a power in the West, who got the best of this dipsy doodle, et cetera, frankly, I think it's Sploach, even though he didn't build. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because the other two have just gotten themselves completely enmeshed with each other. Now, maybe there is a way to untangle the, the, the tangled web that they have woven. But I, I think that Germany is actually in pretty good shape here myself. All right. Spring of 1904. Let's move forward here. Davis, tell us what you see. I see Baltic to Denmark. I see Skagrak to Norway. I see, I see that both of those are German, and I see that that's good for the Germans. I also see that Belgium is going to Holland to give the French something, so he's throwing an olive branch to the French to make sure the French stay on side. French con I mean, the French retreat from North Sea to Edinburgh, so that's interesting. Um, let's see. I think I'm burying the lead, which is that Bradley has moved west. So Leon, Tyranian Sea, that's important. After all, there's not much left of the Turkish carcass to kick around. So you might as well figure out what you're going to do next. And the, what you're going to do next is go to Piedmont, Leon, Tyranian Sea. Uh, as far as the East goes, it's just dismembering the, the Turks, the Turkish position, which apparently Turkey, do, again, doesn't much care about. They're trying to become the government in exile. Yeah, if they if if uh, Russia gets eliminated before them, then that's you know if you're just trying to make sure you make the the second chance boards, that's a big win. That's you've essentially essentially accomplished mission one. I mean that's why this looks weird, but it it might be logical under the yeah. circumstances. And you can see Wardy, you know, expertly taking advantage of that to advance Absolutely. his own cause. So. Absolutely, uh, Tanya. Um, anything else stand out to you here? Yeah, and no, I just I I think this is the right. Uh, time for Bradley to go west. Uh, the west is such a mess. Like, why not go in there? There were a few more fleets into those waters because they need them. Um, and yeah, the solid play from AI. Um, and yeah, good for Germany as well. Picking, uh, hopefully, picking up those two and uh, taking advantage of uh, the absolute mess that's going on between um, EF. A question I'm going to have going forward here. We can talk about it after this turn, though. Is if you're if you're Chris Ward. Um, you know the the play the, the play by Bradley Gray so far has been beautiful. Um, uh, you know, are you do you start to get worried that maybe he's in too good of a position? He was guaranteed Marseille here. He's he's likely to pick up Khan. Uh, I'm sorry, he's definitely picking up Smyrna. Um, shouldn't pick up Khan presumably unless unless we get uh, the two of them working together to to eliminate uh, those Turkish centers in the south. Uh, I, sh should you be worried if you're if you're Chris Ward here? I don't think yet because there there's nothing much Italy can do to really hurt Austria, right? I mean, if anything, those Austrian armies can go into Trieste and Greece pretty fast. And I'm not really all that convinced that um, Italy has much of a stab. I'm more thinking about um, path to the board top. Mm. I think yeah, it's that's it. Yes, you got, you got to worry about that if the path mm -hmm. to the board top because Bradley's going to be in such a good position. All right, well, let's push forward here and see uh, see if uh, Chris does take advantage or just take uh, just demonstrate some concern or not. Um, and cool. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, can, you can take Trieste and you can try and take take Greece, and he did he did those things. And uh, but uh, Khan does support. Uh, sorry, Smyrna supports Khan into Ankh. Um, meanwhile, uh, Gal supports. Uh, Galicia supports Turkey into Warsaw. Uh, and then uh, Bradley continues to push uh, west with his fleets. Um, and France is finally starting to probably freak out that uh, uh, they're being attacked on both fronts. Meanwhile, uh, Germany slides were down into Burgundy. And um, 
uh, get what what is happening here. So uh, Sweden moves to Finland. Norway uh, hits Norwegian Sea. I don't think anything actually moves, does it? Mm -hmm. No. Right. So a bit of a stalemate up there. Quite a quite a gutsy guess by um, by Bradley Grace here not to support himself to Marseille. Um, that's that is that is gutsy, uh, David. Uh, what anything else stand out to you here? Well, I, I, let me make a let me make a, a observation about Budapest to Trieste. When Austria loans Trieste to the Italians, they're loaning it. Taking it is not a stab. It's getting my freaking center back. So she I don't think that line on me at whipping last week, actually. <laughs> she didn't take it. <laughs> it's not that you have that on temporary assignment. That thing is mine and I'm getting it back when I say Italy and you're not. So anyway, I don't think that's necessarily a, any kind of stab. I think I think they're still probably copacetic. That would be my right. guess. Uh, but yeah, this that was quite a move on uh, Piedmont to Marseille. Now, I think it was I think it was a totally justifiable guess on Bradley's part, because obviously Gascony. Cover. Yeah, you got to you got to cover Brest. He, yeah. he probably assumed that there was going to be a support, so you, you're trying to, you know, make sure that Spain isn't covered. So I, I get it. I mean, I think I think I think it's a, a very good move on Bradley's part and a totally justifiable guess. It the payoff is tremendous because wow. those French fleets cannot get into position. You have now stopped the French France's ability to defend effectively against you, and you're now likely to pick up Spain. It's not quite guaranteed, but um, oh no! It, you can guarantee it actually if you want. Maybe he'll do another guess. Uh, but yeah, this is this is an, it's an expert play because he might uh, he might think that France assumes that he'll support himself into Marseille and therefore won't bother covering Marseille with Gascony. Um, and that's and just, that's just, expert play. It's not just that, Brandon. It's the fact that he already had Smyrna in his in hand. Yeah. So he's probably even if he's giving Trias back, he's he's not going down one. He's getting position, yeah. and position can be important in the fall turn, not just the spring turn. So I, I think this is an excellent expert, as you say, expert set of moves. All right. Well, the bottom line, though, is that he is now tied with both Christopher Ward and Sploak for first place. And Christopher Ward's getting two here. So, now, you know, now the pendulum swings a little bit. Does Bradley Grace have to worry about Christopher Ward possibly, uh, you know, looking to make a run for the board top himself? Uh, England, unfortunately, had a uh, not a great year there. Is pulling three. Mm. Um, but Germany... Uh, I thought Germany went up too. No, they gave Belgium to uh, to France, so they're only plus one. Um, Wardy uh, does not try to build a fleet um, and doesn't wave, which certainly could have done. Oh, and uh, and uh, Turkey got a rebuild, I believe. That must have been. Right? <laughs> uh, yes, the fleet in Smyrna was popped, and ultimately only went down one because they picked up both. I'm sorry, no, they were even. Picked up Warsaw and Moscow, lost Ankara and Smyrna, so it gets the rebuild. So. Uh, interesting to see whether that'll be a fly in the ointment uh, in the AI alliance. Uh, well, it should be pointed out that they could have, I'm sorry, we're already in spring, but they, they yeah. could have taken all three of the Turkish dots last year if they'd really wanted to. Yeah. You know, they, bounce, they did some bouncing grease, bouncing grease and, and all that. That yeah. wasn't necessary. So they, they slowed that down on purpose for whatever reason. I but probably could because Russia got eliminated this turn, right? So, so now. Yeah. So now the the Turkish so dots are free them. to go after Guilt, guiltless. Yeah. They're guilt free yeah. dots. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that, 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 that brand new Turkish fleet in Constantinople goes to the bottom of the drink uh, <laughs> just immediately after it was built uh, uh, in port. He tried, uh, and actually, and why didn't it work? He must have gotten the coast wrong. Uh, the support must have uh, gotten the coast wrong, which is a, a factor on uh, on backstabber. You mean the support to go to Bulgaria East Coast? Yeah, let's see. Yeah. I, th I don't know if I show. Yeah, I don't show uh, coast, but Black must have been supporting Khan to go to Bulgaria oh, East Coast, gosh. which would have been a good, which would have been a good idea. Obviously, uh, yeah. well, we see the Austrians don't have any reason to attack Italian positions yet, and they didn't really have much of a stab. And they got they got plenty of room to maneuver to take Sev and Moscow and Warsaw off of the government in exile, which can't be fixed. So that's that's war. He's got other stuff to do. All right, let's look at the West for a minute because we do have the Germans going into Belgium. We've got the French being having been blocked in Spain decide they've got to re, re to, to reorganize their fleet defense by going to Portugal, which means they've lost Spain. Um, otherwise, we've got German army going to St. P, which wasn't going to be stopped. And we have Munich to Silesia. 
Tanya, anything else? Yeah, well, good advance from AI. Um, they're going to probably be on board top, one of them, one or the other. Um, yeah, I think what we're seeing is just like the West uh, not getting a really organized start. There was no clear alliance for a while. France flopped back and forth and then Germany did. And, um, oh, you know, Germany's in a pretty good position. Why not take those... Uh, French dots if they're if they can't be helping you against England so um uh you know and uh, walks into St Petersburg as well so uh good to be Germany here um and the uh, good central alliance seems like <laughs> that's all I got all right let's move forward into uh the fall then 1905 and Tanya tell us what you see yeah, so let's start with this giant line across this. No, um, let's just ignore it. Yeah, what is that? Black <laughs> supports black to Moscow. Okay. Yeah, it's this just order. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in the east, uh, we've got Ankara supporting black into Khan um, and take Bulgaria moving to Greece, um, Trieste moving to Tyrolia, Budapest moving to Trieste. I really wonder what Christopher Ward is up to here. Um, uh and it continues to work sort of with uh, turkey here getting into silesia um meanwhile uh burgundy is helping gascony into marseille uh and keeps belgium um north is north is trying to get to eddie but what is happening <laughs> these lines um it's a brace um, yeah okay right so nothing really moves there and there's a bounce in the mid-atlantic ocean yeah and it, it's coordination a good coordination by um france and germany basically i think that's what we're seeing here yeah i guess well, germany is like i've got the upper hand uh why why let italy take Fran french dots when uh essentially i can work with them and try and get the board top myself so david um Talk to us about uh, this. This what appears to be the breakdown in AI. You like yeah, it? Yeah, I, I just got finished saying wardy has got other stuff to do. He doesn't need to do that, and here he does and turns around and does this anyway. Um, mm. Which you know, Venice to Trieste means that, and and Tunis to Ionian means that Bradley had an idea that this may be coming. So um, you know, that's it's interesting that he was able to sort of sniff that out a little bit. You know, maybe this is some kind of arrangement, but I doubt it. It doesn't look yeah, like it would make any sense as an arrangement. So I, I just don't see it because um, all it does is really just weaken the Italian's position. So I, I think this is Wardy going for it, you know, trying to use the Turks as kind of a janissary for him or a, sm or a s small ally for him. It's an interesting play. We'll see if it works. Yeah, especially with Germany, you know, seeming to be sitting so pretty on the other side here. Um, you know, he... Uh, uh, Wardy may have decided that uh, he couldn't go after Germany um, and leave Italy behind him, that that wasn't a winning strategy. Well, it wasn't even time to go after Germany and go after the Turks. That was my point. But uh, the, he Turkish decided he couldn't. Maybe he thought he needed the Turks to help him defend against the Germans, you know, to make sure the Germans don't get any more benefit out of the, the, the war in Russia. Right. Well, uh, the answer is, uh, for his troubles, he gets two German armies on his back and presumably an, an unhappy uh, defending champion, Bradley Grace, on his other side. Uh, elsewhere in the north, we get uh, some, we say goodbye to some fleets, um, which, you know, uh, uh, we'll see what happens up there. Uh, let's keep moving forward here. Spring 1906. David, tell us, uh, unpack this complicated map. Well, we've got Bradley taking Marseille back, uh, which makes sense uh, given the way those units were situated. We've also got the Germans going to Gascony. So it, I know the Germans and the French have been doing things together, but the Germans are eventually going to get themselves in a position where they're going to be able to make their own move against the French. We do have Yorkshire going to Edinburgh. We've got the German army coming down to Livonia, which, you know, makes sense. What else are they going to do up there? Um the, um, you know, the AI war is probably over now. If it ever really existed, they've realized that Germany is a, is a bigger threat. So here we go to Bohemia, to Tyrolia, um, Galicia, Armenia. You know, the, the, the Turks do go to Ankara with support of the Italians. So it's hard to know what that means exactly. But Ionian to Trieste, 
some kind of it, misorder or what is that? It must be arranged because Sev supports Ukraine to Moscow. So they must have been doing a swap of uh, centers. Or blowing the Austrian fleet Austrian up. Austrian fleet up, yeah. 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 So I, I <clears throat> expect you will see Italy taking Ankara here. Mm. Um, I have to say, this looks like a masterful turn by Bradley Grace. Mm -hmm. Diplomatically um, and strategic tactically, if we can, uh, or tactico strategically, if we can talk about it. Uh, yeah. I wonder what's, what's Germany's game plan here with France. It seems strange to now be moving into Gascony and possibly be taking their dots. Maybe they think they can hold the line themselves and that AI is not an issue, or they saw Austria stab Italy and therefore, okay, now I have more breathing room. But, you know, I'd be, I'd be a little bit concerned now. I mean, it's a it's a terrible move for the French. Even if the Germans were theoretically going to Gascony to help them, they've just allowed the Marseille army to have nowhere to retreat to. So it's terrible. Yeah, yeah it doesn't feel like um, <clears throat> it doesn't feel like an FG at this point, does it? Um, no, right. but if you point out, who else has Germany got? Yeah. So possibly a miscalculation on Germany's part. But that's we will what, find out that, soon that's enough. Tanya's yeah. point, I believe. All right, yeah. um, Tanya, tell us what you see. So, uh, yeah, FG continues to fight, um, which uh, is really just good for Bradley, I think, um, uh, who moves into Spain, into Marseille, uncontested. Um, France is busy trying to cover against Germany. Uh, English uh, fleet goes from north into the English Channel. Um, or is that? Yeah, north yeah, English that's Channel. English, right? Yeah, okay. Um, and then on the other side of the board, uh, Moscow. Oh, actually, Germany gets into Moscow because Moscow moves to Sevastopol. Um, and Turkey, I believe, is eliminated at this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the AI continues to proceed. Boy, this is quite a quite a turn here. I mean, we're going to, you know, we can start counting or we can just flip the page to see where things stand. But uh you want, you want me to do that, David, and then that'll, that'll help your analysis? I would rather not have to count it myself, if that's your question. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <clears throat> I mean, on the surface of it, it looks like Splox in good shape, but you know, diplomatically isolated, you know, yeah. unless there is some way, now that it's plus two Austria, plus two Italy, to get them to fight each other. And you, normally, you don't want to stab when the other, when your stab E is going to get plus two. So it's going to be hard to argue that either side should do that versus doing something else. Austria can you know, take Moscow and do, do various things. The Turks have potential in the West. Yeah. It, you know, it's or possible. Not the Italians have potential in the West. It's possible Germany just miscalculated, thought Austria and Italy would keep fighting and that would give him uh, the freedom to, or give them the freedom to, to go after those French dots. And that certainly hasn't been the case. Uh, you know, I have to imagine Germany would much rather have a French ally here fighting Italy, uh, you know, for or okay, but wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. <laughs> tell me, tell me. But is there something that looks strange on this board that gives you pause about if, Austria and Italy possibly? If I'm Germany, I'm thinking, together? yes, that's what I was trying to get him to do. Build a fleet Trieste. That's what I was trying to do. Now it's blow ox chance uh, just went up some. Those went up significantly. Wow. All right. So board reset. We've got uh, uh Germany with 10 in the lead. We've got Austria and Italy tied at nine. Uh, and let me just remind us what the tiebreakers are in this game. I don't think I have those. Yeah, I don't have them posted on the uh, uh, on there, but I can show us the Paris method. This is Apollo. So uh, Bradley loses all tiebreakers uh, to, I'm sorry, loses tiebreakers against the other two. So Chris Ward, Splowak, Bradley Grace, Bradley Grace in order. Uh, now let me get us back and we can see what happens next. All right. You guys ready to go into spring 1907? All right. Uh, the answer is David, tell us what you see here. The only thing surprising is that I haven't said varmint a lot <laughs> in yeah. my accent, because that is a word that I have used a lot in my life. It is a Southern word. All right, here we go. So we've got Belgium to Picardy because the French are going to Brest, right? Um, Bradley helps Paris kill the German army in Gascony, so we've got lots of army death going on here. Um, 
England to the Mao with support of the French. The English are tr actually, I mean, there's three English fleets. I think they just built, didn't they? So they, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 did, they yeah. Now, maybe they can be somehow important or relevant to what's going on here, given the AI war. Uh, Ionian to Greece, Greece to Bulgaria, that all important fleet that Italians now have in the Black Sea. Austria, however, is moving armies also towards the Germans. So, I mean, I'm not saying there's not some kind of conflict here, but you've got a, a standoff in Trieste with a fleet going to Adriatic and all that looks, you know, pretty ominous for AI, for AI cooperation. The Austrians also still have to worry about all those screaming Germans coming at them. <laughs> and Germany does appear to sort of be walking back a little bit. You've got probably an arranged bounce in Prussia and then Silesia moves to Munich. Maybe like, all right, I'll give you a little bit of breathing room if you're going to attack Italy. Possibly. Really strange. Um, I don't know. How many times has Greece switched hands? <laughs> Quite a I bit. can never keep it straight. Maybe they're just switching back and forth for fun. Like one year you get it, the next year me. It really. You know, <laughs> if McCullis was playing on this board, he would never have let Greece go ever. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. All uh, right. Got it. It, it feels like advantage uh, Bradley Grace right now, doesn't it? It does. All right. Uh, oh, oh. What? What did? Okay, uh, talk to us, uh, Tanya. Sorry, I was my eye was immediately drawn down here to Bulgaria staying red. Um, yeah, in Greece fake again. And Greece, and Greece walking out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many times will we fall for this same scam? <laughs> um, yeah, Greece walks out. Um, Sev moves to Rum to get the fleet. Okay, I think there's. F Central Alliance, and they're going to wipe the rest off the board and then somehow figure out who's going to draw from there. Um, Black moves into Sev, uh, and Silesia walks back to Gal. Um, I think Munich gets into Tyrolia, which moves to Piedmont, which um, I think Spain helps the Mid Atlantic Ocean into Portugal. And is actually moving their fleets. Good for England, and yeah, that's what we've got. Yeah. So wow, God, David, this just feels different from virtual face to face, doesn't it? It certainly does, which is awesome because yeah, uh, obviously, who wants to see the same thing over and over again? But but what what we are seeing, though, I mean, Central Alliance maybe, but Munich to Tyrolia with support. That's yeah. you know, it's just hard to read exactly what's going on in that relationship, and it may just be that there's a lot of different negotiation going back and forth from turn to turn. But yeah. why would Romania ever, why would Sev move to Rome with support, double support, otherwise? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Good question. I don't know. Yeah, really. I don't. This is a, it's a confusing turn from Austria's perspective, also from Italy's. I mean, I think Bradley's making a calculation that um, it's in his interest to keep Austria fighting Germany mm -hmm. uh, rather than just taking dots and going for it, you know? Maybe Wardy was for his, to grow. For his yeah. trouble, he got the Austrians supporting him, the Germans to Tyrolia for his trouble. Yeah. So we'll yeah. see how that shakes out. All right. Uh, is this advantage Germany? Let's keep going and seeing. We do know it's advantage uh, England, who is building for the second year in a row. <laughs> and he gets a German fleet. They. Well, that was that's not surprising because the Germans just moved to Denmark and Norway. Yeah. The Germans were clearly coming. Fleet. Yeah, well, unhappy, I think, with that fleet in the North Sea. Probably wasn't expected, but, uh, you know, ended up not being a problem for them. All right, let's keep going. This game is entertaining. And uh, spring 1908. All right, tries to go to the North Sea with support, but now that's the whole point of building keels. They can go to Helgoland and then make that happen. Um, Germans being kicked out of Picardy there by the French. And the English are relocating north because they see that it's now going to be an Anglo-German war, a fleet war. Um which, of course, is really good news to the East. And so let's see what's going on in the East. We now have cooperation to kick the Germans out of Tyroli, which they're leaving mm -hmm. anyway. But the Austrians, having just left Silesia, are now back in Silesia. So it looks like AI may have patched things up. You know, Bulgaria to Greece, because everybody likes to go to Greece. We'll see if it stays in Greece. Um, Black Sea to Armenia is to ditch or, or beach the fleet so that it's less of a uh, threat to the Austrians. That's the point of it. I think you'd rather see it in Ankara if you're Austrian, but uh, Tanya, what? 
Is this, are we, are we like looking at typical extended deadline play? From your yes, <laughs> absolutely. If I go back to my extended deadline games and saw what I was doing and like winning boards doing, I would, it would blow my mind now. Yeah. They're all, they're all crazy because you can, you can do crazy stuff like this because you talk for so long. So it, it does really, really change the dynamic. Like I, a lot of moves where you'd be like, that's a stab in, extended face to face you're like oh they came up with that how brilliant <laughs> so that's sort of i think what we're witnessing here. also we're also we're seeing players different than players we're used to covering every single month on dbn and that's also par probably part of the diversity of moves we're seeing and good good for us yeah uh with that in mind let's keep going here um fall of 1908 tanya tell us what you see yeah so um AI, uh, I, I think they're doing this on purpose, like Tyrolia to Venice, Piedmont supports hold to Venice. It's all, I don't know, maybe to keep each other honest or something, these kind of moves are happening. Um, and yeah, Silesia moves back to Gal. I think it moved to Silesia and then back to, I, I think it's also just been hopping back and forth for a couple of years. Uh, so Wardy really is doing a whole lot of nothing. Um, and on the other side, uh, Italy is um, working, takes the Mid-Atlantic Ocean, um, is sort of uh, making gains in this way, attacks Burgundy, um, doesn't really matter. Burgundy, I believe, tries to support Brest to Gascony, but that doesn't go. So I don't think much has moved. Gets into North. Yeah, how going gets into North. Uh, David, talk to us about... Um... Bradley getting into uh, mid Atlantic here. How big is this? Wait, so really? just, is that a disband? Yeah, he he voluntarily dis the English voluntarily disbanded so they could go and use that against the Germans later. I think is what's happening here. Yeah, even though Brest was open for a retreat, by the way. This is weird. Yeah, I mean, I don't. It's hard to tell exactly what's happening, except that you know the French may help him against the Germans, so he doesn't want to take a French dot. So that's yeah. one of those kind of things. Fair yeah, enough. I. Maybe all of this AI is a big, long kabuki theater, and maybe it is that they really have been in and out of friendship in the last several turns. It's a, it's a possibility. All right. Uh, the net result here is that um, uh, because w Moscow was taken by Austria from Germany, uh, Chris Ward now takes the lead at 10.99 and gets to build while Germany is having to pull one. Mm -hmm. um, and we find that Berlin is pulled and it's replaced on the board by an army in Vienna. All right, let's keep going. Spring 1909. Uh, David. All right, let's see here. Fleet Ionian to Aegean is not a pro AI move in any way, shape, or form. I don't know exactly what's happening. There's lots of hold supports, this, that, and the other, but that ain't no good. Um, I don't think. Uh, all right, let's look at what's going on in the West, though. We've got fleets now in Gascony and Mid Atlantic, so they can make a play on Brest. You know, the English may like the French being around as an anti-German thing. The Italians don't care about that. Uh, although they did, the French did put the Italians into Burgundy. What else is happening? Another bounce in the Norwegian, just like there was last turn. The Germans actually moved Belgium to Picardy and Burgundy to Belgium. Um, I don't know about that. I might, whatever, might what, what rather have stayed uh, in Burgundy there for the Germans. All right, let's push forward here. I think uh, I think the alliance structure seems fairly straightforward at this point. Uh, the question is just, are any centers going to change hands? And in 1909, uh, we do see some action here. Tanya, tell us about it. Um, there's a retreat from Trieste to Budapest, a retreat from Belgium to Holland, with the English getting into Belgium. Um, what else do we have? North gets into English, York then gets into North. And uh, other than that, Gascony takes Brest, the Italians take Brest. And what does that Burgundy unit do? Ah, yes, yeah, supports English Channel into Belgium. So it's a coordination between the French and the Italians. Well, let me get you into something while I take your dots. A beautiful play by Bradley, who, by the way, has Portugal in his pocket whenever he wants it. Um, and Wardy is probably going to be a bit out of line. 
Yeah, this is this is a this is a big turn, isn't it, uh, David? Bradley's uh, Bradley's game to lose at this point, I think. Yeah, this is this was not a given. There was the tactical guesses here involving uh, Tyrolia being the supporter rather than uh, a mover somewhere, um, and Bradley has won the tactical guess. And, and he's won a lot of those guesses, and he's completely won the diplomatic game. England's fleets yeah. all going east like that, and not caring that the Italians are leaping into the Mediterranean uh, out of the Mediterranean means that Bradley's got this game. So Bradley takes a two-center lead here over Wardy. Um, can't hold on to Trieste, right? Trieste is uh, uh, is uh, will be taken back, but the position in the west now seems unassailable. Mm -hmm. um, so Wardy pulls Warsaw um, and we get some new units from the other players uh, and uh, does the game continue spring 1910 it does um, David tell us about it the um, <clears throat> Austrians do not yet take Trieste at least uh, using their units to do other things like supporting Bulgaria from an attack that didn't happen but the fleet goes to Albania <clears throat> let's see in, the, in otherwise just rearranging in the West, you actually do have an English fleet going to North, North Atlantic. That that might mean something there. There's been some discussion or at least some concern that maybe the Italians might go there if he didn't go. Is that a is that a German fleet, English Channel? To IRC, yeah. IRC, so that, that matters, yeah. yeah so uh, so we, maybe, that, maybe that's the point is to, so we can defend the labor. I see. Yeah, you were getting ready to say that, Tony, I bet. Um, and support into Burgundy from the Germans. So they're you know, fighting back and forth, but still, still advantage Bradley. All right, let's just keep. Oh, there we go. Um, I think everyone else on the board saw the same thing that uh, that you just saw, David. Oh, wow! So, defending champion Bradley Grace wins a very tightly contested board here. You know, over these last four years, from 1906 on, um, the you know there was one center separating them until this last year, uh, and it kind of seemed like it was anyone's game. Uh, whoever you know, whoever could get the jump effectively on the others was gonna was gonna win it. And Bradley Grace is the one who does it. Uh, so congrats to Bradley. Uh, I'm going to turn to you guys. Is this the right result? Um, David, let's start with you. Oh, yeah. I think Brad, I think we all agree that Bradley had the best position in this game for several game years before this happened. So I think this absolutely is the right result. I think Wardy had some possibilities to maybe upend this, but he, A, he got outgassed a few times, and B, I think there were a couple of strategic mistakes about when he turned from which, I mean, I don't know how many different times he went from Silesia to Bohemia to Galicia, but none of those moves were actually advancing the ball towards the goal line. Tony? Yeah, the other missed opportunity, I think, was probably Germany. I think if they worked with France instead of attacking France, that both of them could have possibly had more of a say in what's going on. But all really Germany ended up doing was uh, letting Bradley right into the mid Atlantic and moving. Uh, north. So I, I think there was a bit of a misplay from Germany there and probably Austria as well. So uh, good work though to Bradley. All right. Congrats to uh, defending champ Bradley Grace, who qualifies for the Olympus final board while the other six players then get dumped into the pool to find out uh, whether they make the final uh, second chance boards and where they stand, where they get seated. So those scores actually matter quite a bit. You can see why um, say Chris Ward would have taken that um, you know, knowing that it might make him a number one seed or number two seed for the final the second chance boards. All right. We are going to uh, give Tanya a break here. Tanya, enjoy the break. We'll see you in a little bit. Thank and we're going to bring uh, Ed Sullivan back and we're going to challenge ourselves to go a little faster here because we enjoyed that uh, first board a little too much like we did with the first VDL board. And 75 minutes. Okay. Please. That was longer than the actual game. We spent 75 minutes on that. We all right, let's go faster. <laughs> I don't know. We're going to go faster. And then we added, just added Ed Sullivan to the skirt. To the uh, I know, I know. Fine. Let's see. Fine, fine. <laughs> the value All right, it. here is Artemis. Um, if I can get it up. There we go. And uh, these are the players and their original seeds. Let's throw the, um, let's throw the Paris method up there if I can figure Wait. out. Ed Sullivan's going to do his own game. This is going to be awesome. Yeah, Ed. So we won't have you on uh, analysis then. You can just give us some I behind can't the scenes. Wait to see what's going on here. <laughs> we'll just, we'll just give us some behind the scenes uh, uh, info. All right. So um, in this game, we had uh, they all picked an order, and then 
Uh, France, England, Germany, Italy, Russia went, um, which, you know, feels, well, Germany going, going a little higher here than it normally does in virtual face-to-face -face these days, but Austria and Turkey left for the scraps at the end. Uh, all right, let's dive in here then and um, check out some moves. Mr. Hood, you can tell us about spring 1901. I could, uh, except you're get out, You're a little, really going to let Ed do the analysis of his own game. That's fine. No, he's just going to have to sit there silently and take it. All right. So uh, Ed inexplicably lets the Italians into Trieste. Ed inexplicably bounces the Russians in Galicia. Ed inexplicably goes to Serbia instead of Romania. So I feel as, I feel like these moves are really terrible for the Austrians. So let's look at some other people. Uh, Germans did regular moves. French did the same move we saw last turn, yeah. right? Or the last game with the English Channel and the Picardy. So the, the two units north instead of uh, instead of going other directions. Uh, let's see. What are the Russians? The Russians did very standard moves into Ukraine. The Turks did the old style move into um, with the two armies going north. Italians, of course, are borrowing from Ed Sullivan, the Trieste. <laughs> All right. Let's move forward here and look at the fall. Or um, or the Italians are convoying to Greece with support of the Italian. <laughs> because Ed is a really good negotiator and was able to negotiate the <laughs> loss of Romania and Greece and Trieste with them having nothing to do with any of that. Let's move I to the Galicia. Yeah, I, I see that you took Galicia. Good for you, man. Ed, you are, you are outstanding. I wanted to say good move with that Galicia thing. Ed, Ed's uh, going to be able to provide analysis here very soon, I believe. Support, you know, there's going to be support into Belgium with the French. That's obviously good for them. The I would say that the support the surprising move here really is Denmark to Skagerrak. You don't see that very often, mm. and it's when you've got a strong sort of uh, northern alliance between the, or the uh, alliance between the Russians and the Germans is what you is why you see that. So that should be we'll see if how, how that plays out. So Ed, can you tell us um, anything about uh, uh, how good of a player Riaz Verani is? You can see it on the board. He's very good. He was obviously the favorite uh, going into this game, and uh, this hurt. Yeah, all kidding aside, it, 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 it's, nothing, it's nothing worse than seeing this when you're Austrian. Yeah, 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 there really is. I mean, yeah, Turkey supporting uh, Italy. And this happened to me in my uh, first tournament at the Chicago uh, WDC in 2016, and I was out as Austrian by the end of 1902. I didn't do that to it. You do you did I, Brandon? I don't think so. No, no, it was um uh, his name is escaping me. I'll I'll get it in a second. Uh but he he topped the board as Italy and he uh Tom Co uh, Coburn. Tom uh, oh, my fellow yeah. North Carolinian. Yeah, and he was interviewed by Chris Martin afterward and he made a point of saying that I played a great game. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you did you did, Brandon, and Ed is playing a good game here too. Yep. Well, look, All right. I did play a good game. Look at that fleet build in Marseille, right? So the thing here is you got to rally the West a little bit against what's I the, the issue here is is it an IT as McAllis speculates, or is it uh, a winter green? And right. I was definitely of the opinion that it was a winter green at the time and that Turkey was was a little fooled by Riaz there, but we'll see how it goes. He did build the army though. That Mets look, look Turkey yeah. thinks he's got an IT. That's very IT. Um, and it's worth pointing out here that uh, negotiation is allowed during all phases, builds and retreats in Olympus. So um, that negotiation that Ed was talking about, I assume, took place during build phases uh, to get that fleet in Marseille. All right. All right I, will so do we, my, I will do my part to speed up. I'm sorry. I'll do my yeah, part. Yeah, no problem. So uh, we get fleets, uh, two fleets from France. Um, we get a fleet from uh, in Edinburgh from England. Uh, we get fleet Kiel Army Munich, which is definitely the builds of the day for uh, for Germany's that we've witnessed. Uh, and an army in St. Petersburg. So the possible GR um, uh, uh, is one to look at here. You might have expected uh, fleet North Coast if that was the case. Yeah. Um, so we'll see how that evolves. Uh, but clearly Russia not worried about, not too worried about uh, an IT yet. And uh, David, keep us going here. All right. I am seeing Serbia going to Bulgaria uh, because Ed has thrown in with, with Rios is what I'm seeing there. Russians going into Budapest, um, Galicia, Austrians coming over there to Bohemia, maybe to try to make some other kind of play there. I don't know. Ed can tell us later. 
Western powers, what are you doing, France? You're leaving English Channel so that to try to bring the Brest fleet out because you build in Marseille and you're really going to go down there and mess with Riaz. I guess that's what's happening there. And the English weren't sure what was happening, so they went ahead and bounced in English. Holland to Belgium is an interesting guess that apparently worked out fine, unless it was agreed. To, I can't. It's hard to imagine that's agreed upon. You do have the Germans now switching tack, and no, they, no, you don't. That, that thing in Sweden is arranged. I'm sorry. So the Germans take Sweden, the Russians take Norway, Germans take their other fleet to Denmark. Yeah, now they've got two. You know, there's three fleets if you're looking at GR together, uh, aimed at the North Sea. So that's really not terrible. I'll, 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 I'll handle some. Uh, some. I still don't like the army build for Mandra. I wish he'd built the fleet. If he's really yeah, going to yeah. go in with the GR, go in with the GR. That need they need a fleet. For the yeah. I agree. So I'll take a step here at adding a bit of analysis. The um, uh, Ed, your play looks to me like somebody trying to make a deal to survive uh, and not be the first person eliminated in this game due to this rule about uh, the second chance games. Is that is that correct it, speculation? It really messes with your motivation. Yeah. Uh, you know, your motivation is to survive, and you know, Riaz promised me survival, and you know, Riaz is generally other than what we just saw in Fall 1901, a man of his word. Everything you see in the West is sort of a response to the AI. Uh, but like in these extended deadline games, uh, communication sometimes is sporadic. And England was a very difficult player to be in communication with at that time. So, um, all right, let's keep pushing ahead here. Um, and fall of 1902, uh, a little bit of a surprising turnaround here. Um, David, tell us about it. Albania tr tr Trieste working is a, is a little bit of a surprise, at least to me. Uh, maybe that's not shouldn't be surprising. Um, otherwise, we've got the convoy to Piedmont, which is a nice, nifty thing to do if you're coming after, you know, coming after the Italians. Um, but Germany goes back to Holland and Russia. In other words, they're they're demilitarizing de 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 their border between France and Germany, which is interesting. Um, otherwise, let's see in the north what's happening here. So you've got not much, right? It's all red arrows. Yeah, Russia holds on to Norway and Germany holds on to Sweden. Yep. Um, yeah, this, this feels like pretty high level play here. It wouldn't surprise me if if uh, Riaz conceded Trieste, um, knowing that you were gonna, you know, <coughs> that better you have it than than Germany. Is that right? Ed? No, he didn't expect these moves because I cut okay. Serbia. He, yeah. he didn't think this was. Oh, yeah. He was pretty disappointed. Say love. Did you did you point out that you were disappointed in him? <laughs> owning, <laughs> did you point that out to him? Uh, if not, I will point that out to him next time I see him. <laughs> well, in any case, Riaz does get a build, puts on an army here, and presumably in order to protect Venice. Um, well, Andrew Zick, uh, you know, seems to be in a not terrible place at the moment. Um, we'll see how long that lasts depending on the, the Germany-Russia cooperation. Answer is not that long. David, not, tell us about it. Not, not that long. It's already, it's already gone. Uh, Norway already taken. Finland already uh, got an enemy unit in it. Um, so, it, again, not very long. Um, all right, well, let's look at the Mediterranean. The French are doing pretty much what you want to do if you're coming after Italy. You get all these positional moves in. You've got, you know... The, Having a fleet in, Tun in uh, Tuscany is not spectacular, but it's better than not having a unit in Tuscany. Uh, so it's 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 nice nice moves. Uh, Riaz does does take uh, Ed out of Bulgaria. Um, kind of hard to see what the Turks' role here is exactly with the French coming into the Mediterranean. What do the Turks need to be doing? Probably anti-Russian if they can, but they're going to need help to do anything against the Russians, and we'll see if Riaz wants to do that. All right, let's keep moving forward here. Fall of 1903. David, tell us about it. Um, Ed still trying to scramble here to survive. Takes Venice uh, from Riaz uh, with support, where the Russians are taking out the rest of those centers. The Italians took Bulgaria. Um, here come the French in the Tyrrhenian Sea. This is a really quite a thing that the that the West has done here. Already gotten you know fleets in the Tyrrhenian Sea. They've they've now killed that Russia, the Northern Russian fleet. Um, I think the real question is, is this a sort of a triple that's going to stick together or not? Uh, certainly with the Germans already being across the sort of across the line in Bohemia and Tyrolia, 
there's progress that's been made, but we all know how unstable Western triples can be. Yeah, in England, particularly with a fleet sitting in the North Sea doing nothing. Well, in England, you know, is is at three, while Germany is now up at seven. Um, so it's not, you know, it's a Western minor triple detail. with a very small minor, minor detail. Minor <laughs> detail. Uh, all right. So after three years, then we have Andrew Zick in the lead at eight, and Ab Abstieg's Krieger, Abstieg's Krieger in uh, second place with seven. Um, and Andrew's putting down two units here. Uh, so Ed, Ed's holding on here at one center. We're rooting for you, man. <coughs> uh, just the army. And so uh, Andrew puts down a uh, fleet south coast, St. Petersburg. So definitely, um, definitely looking to butt heads with, uh, with Germany. Uh, all right, let's just keep pushing forward here. Spring of 1904. David, come on, going. Phil, what you're going to do? What are you, what are you going to do, uh, Phil, John? You're going to support the Germans into St. Pete. Austrians have been killed. Come on, Ed. Man, oh, Ed. We, wanted watch, we wanted to watch you some more. Um, the 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 attack in North North Africa is obviously makes a lot of sense. Kill, piffing that fleet. Um, what else do we have? The um, well, we've got Russians and Germans fighting. The real question I've got is: Is Phil going to make a move at some point to get back in the game? I mean, one would hope. All right, Phil in England. So that would require, say, taking Norway. Um, <coughs> or maybe convoy in, to Holland or whatever. Convoy, con it takes Norway and St. Peter. <coughs> That's fine. That's fine. And Ed does mean? not. So Ed still had a chance to stay in the game here. <laughs> that was by having Venice walked out of. <laughs> that didn't happen. Well, you know, this, the, clearly something's going on here because the Germans have all moved away from Russia, even when the Russians are still. The Germans have done. They, they've expected something, and it's hard to know exactly what because they didn't. They just walked out of Norway. This feels like kind I of a grand key, strategic yeah, gesture on on Germany's part, but it's hard to see to what end. Ed, you had a thought? Yeah, I think you need to see that the Russians support Barents to St. Petersburg. Hmm. This is Andrew's attempt to get England on side to fight Germany and to turn. And uh, Andrew played a I can't explain how well Andrew's diplomatic game was here. Uh, not really having an enemy in Germany or England, but reading the board correctly, I think, to, to get the turn that way. So Germany leaving Norway was just, maybe he just assumed the English were going to take Norway. Maybe he was ceding them Norway. Hmm. Without expecting to lose St. Petersburg at the exactly, same time. Exactly, without expecting yeah. to lose the second center, yeah. So in terms of grand strategic plays, this may be a really nice one by Andrew Zick, who goes down a center, but possibly gains uh, an ally in the north. Uh, meanwhile, takes Black Sea as well. This is not a small development. Um, and uh, uh, But pulls Trieste, very interesting, keeping uh, the units uh, all in the north and trusting that Riaz has his hands full. Riaz, for his part, puts down an army in Naples instead of a fleet. That is fascinating. Um, I don't get it. It means Ionian cannot be held. I don't get it. All right, David, uh, you want you want to take you want me to take a turn here for you? Or sure, you go ahead. Him? All right, so uh, Ionian is lost to the French, who is also in Tyrrhenian Sea uh, and in Tuscany. Just really, really nice position. Um, France also pulls a fleet back to Mid Atlantic, possibly uh, just in case England was uh, was getting some ideas. Um, but England, for their part, puts units in position to uh, take Sweden here. Um, meanwhile, Andrew in Russia pulls units back towards Turkey, and uh, uh, Riaz is uh, at attacking Turkey with him. So this is really this feels like really nice play by Andrew to to pick up on um, on Ed's theme here. Doesn't have any enemies. Um, on the other hand, uh, we still got Army Serbia hanging around next to four. <laughs> Russian dots. So, well, it's true that Riaz has a lot to going on here because he's he's having to defend against these Frenchmen and can't defend entirely. Loses Naples here. <clears throat> um, Tunis to Western Med though mean it shows that Nick is thinking about a truly re, a truly rearranging at least to some degree because yeah. he's also going. To, I thought maybe Mal was just a defensive move that he goes right into the Irish Sea for goodness sake. Um, you know, Andrew's getting now into Armenia. 
because the Turks were worried about the Italians taking Smyrna. So they, now the Russians are there. I mean, it's, it's very winter grainy. I'm, I'm feeling a nice winter minty, uh, minty fresh feeling in my mouth uh, watching this. You know, I'm thinking about Riaz's build here, and I'm now starting to think that it was uh, a deliberate uh, alliance offer, strategic offer to France, um, just basically conceding Naples or hoping to, you know, maybe stave him off with some lucky guesses or something and give France something else to do, um, which France has done. France has done, but they're still down there. Yeah. yeah. I, it, it, I maybe maybe Riaz didn't think he had much much other choice. Here. Yeah, much that's, other choice. Could be right. well, I think I think you have to you have to understand what Riaz is doing is saying, "I'm not a threat now on the board to your board top." England is. Look at what's happening. You know, get your build. Do what you need to do. Go after England, and no one can fight Russia but me. You can't do it. It's, 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 <laughs> you know, I don't fight. know how this is going to turn out, Ed, and you do maybe. But I don't like Nick's move here. I think Nick should have just kept his foot on the gas in the Mediterranean. I mean, okay. we'll see. But I, I just because I think England was pretty committed to doing what they're doing, which is plowing into Russia and or Germany. Uh, yeah, and had a lot to gain, I think, um, by continuing against Russia. I think all you needed to do if you were France was keep enough firepower around your home centers to um, discourage England from thinking they could get anything off of you easily. Um, I mean, it may it may still work out for Nick. I mean, it's a poss certainly a possibility. Well, I mean, England's building two. France is building one here. And uh, the other question I have here is for Andrew Zick. Um, you know, Andrew is fighting Germany here. Well, you know, there's lots of green dots down there that he could take um, and win the game with uh, if he were so inclined. Uh, let's see how these oh so france tries to build two fleets um only had one build to uh, to put down so probably thankfully from his perspective uh the backstabber engine chose fleet breast to keep uh phil johns puts down army liverpool fleet london and uh, uh germany is now down to four pulling um uh, Ruhr and Berlin. All right, let's keep on going forward. I just here. have to comment that Riaz, a six center power, has one fleet. That is yeah, that's Italy. quite a situation <laughs> for the Italians to be in. Yeah. And has growth potential as well. <laughs> All right, let's uh, talk about spring 1906. David, uh, go I mean, back to you. One fleet is cutting Smyrna so that the Turks, I mean, so the Russians can take Ankara, and then the Italians, I assume, are going to take Smyrna. So the, yep. the one fleet is being helpful. The French just couldn't couldn't uh, resist going to the Ionian here, yeah. even though they could have uh, they could have forced Rome uh, if they hadn't done that. They could have forced Rome with support, but they didn't do it. Uh, let's go to the west. So the, the the French really are moving what what mid, uh, Western Med to the Mid Atlantic. They're they're you know basically have that really hot war on with the English. The English um, have if they haven't already thrown in with Andrew pretty significantly here. Um, rearranging their units interesting yeah this feels like um a pretty strong balance of power play and you know phil has decided that he can grow uh, alongside andrew by taking german dots and andrew is sticking with um with uh italy you know by pulling units further towards the german centers a uh, question for me is whether uh greece to serbia feels like a friendly build a friendly move or not from uh from uh, andrew's perspective all right <laughs> wow uh I'll, I'll take this for you david we'll, we'll just take turns here so uh riaz takes smyrna um with uh with andrew's support although turkey had walked out anyway but um, hey i don't know if you know this uh, but but a, fr a fleet in ankara can't support it yes but armenia can no, I know, I know that. I'm making a comment to Brandon. All right, keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> My fleet order was, by the way, in Smyrna. It doesn't uh, matter. It's the same concept. But anyway, keep indeed, going. Indeed it is. So Riaz takes Budapest here and convoys into Bulgaria. This is an international convoy across uh, the French fleet in Ionian. Um, what this means is that Riaz has, is actually plus one here despite losing Rome and is in position to just gut Andrew Zick. So Andrew, I think, played nice um, and is paying the price for it. Uh, meanwhile, Germany is just getting completely dismembered here, losing Munich and Kiel and Holland. Um, so France getting in on it. 
Uh, France has now gone up two here. Um, and uh, do they only do they lose one as well? Well, they lost Naples. Oh, they lost Naples because um, thank you because Riaz went there. So Riaz actually is plus two here, only has one home center open for a build. Um, and uh, France is plus one. But now we have four players uh, in contention for the board top here. We've got Nick at nine, uh, for, uh, uh, Russia and Italy. Italy now. <laughs> this is Riaz Varani doing Riaz things. Um, yeah, Riaz has a real shot here. In fact, might even be the favorite given that he's got all these uh, Russian dots. Uh, the yeah, favorite? So. No, I don't think so. Who would you put as the favorite, France? Not Riaz. I mean, it doesn't have any home country left. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. He's, he's going to lose. He's going to lose Naples. I mean, come on. That's not. If, any, I, if anyone can top a board without any of the home <clears throat> centers, I think it's Riaz Varani. I guess anything's possible, but I don't see it. Uh, the Fr I think the French are in pretty good position here. We'll All see. Right. We'll see. keep on going here. Talk us, tell us, talk us through spring 1907. What do I know? What do I know? Because the French are leaving to go to the Western mid because really England's their enemy, not Rios Varane that you're taking their home centers. Wow. Okay. Uh, Russians come back to Galicia to try to do something with, with Rios, also taking Berlin. Mm. Uh, Germans are taking Munich back with French help. Uh, Lots of war in in around the British Isles with the French actually taking North Atlantic, which couldn't be stopped under the circumstances. Yeah, and I look at the Ion and uh, the French obviously got hoodwinked here by yep. leaving and by thinking there's going to be a convoy. It's just brilliant turn by Riaz, who now has a walk into Trieste, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah. So Riaz, Riaz's problem now is that he's not going to be able to open enough home centers. <laughs> for, yeah, what a to take problem. Riaz, that's such a problem. All of his builds. So he doesn't take Trieste, interestingly, <laughs> plays for position and moves, walks moves out, out, of, out of Rome. Moves out, out of Rome. Out of Rome. Wow. Wow. Diplomatic play. Oh, is it a good one, though? Because so elsewhere, Russia takes Berlin to go up uh, one. Um, and... England uh, take England keeps Holland, so the net result. Uh, so France gets incredible position on the English uh, Isle by convoying into Wales here, um, and so now we <laughs> we have four player four players uh, at nine or eight centers here. Uh, this is an amazing game. The twists and turns here. I was not expecting some of these twists and turns. I really wasn't. Uh, wow. So the the games are capped at nineteen twelve. So there are. Um, possibly five game years left so that i'm assuming that is what riaz is calculating um question is is he giving up too much position to russia that's that's the question for me um let's keep on going here though spring of 1908 david talk us through it all right so venice to trias to pull you to venice yeah some italians doing their best to move around just complete Getting the French to leave the Mediterranean is just astounding to me. I'm yeah. just like, I'm just gobsmacked by it. But you're right that the French have a pretty decent position in the north there. They do lose Belgium uh, to a supported attack. But, you know, the English aren't going to be able to do this for so long with the Russians also taking things like Kiel uh, and it's setting themselves up to take St. Pete back. Um, Let's see. I guess the French only had bear. I mean, they only had barons to retreat to, didn't they? That was the only place they could retreat. So that's where they retreated. You know, it's it's yet to be seen who's going to win the sort of chess game that's going on in the Balkans. But I am just astounded that there is a chess game that Riaz has the ability to even engage in this chess game after the what the French position was. Yeah, this is a, and it's his position now is astonishingly good. Andrew has seated quite a bit of position um, and hasn't, you know, I kind of expected Andrew to sort of pull all of his units back and let England and France just sort of fight to a stalemate. But uh, Ankara is now here. Uh, you know, Trieste is there. Um, and Riaz is going to get great position. Rome's there whenever he wants it. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, David, you want to keep going here? Sure. You, the French do take Liverpool, uh, but lose English Channel. They take Belgium back, though. That's important because the Russians are helping uh, to, to screw around with the English. Obviously, the Russians take 
St. Peter, they didn't even need Livonia to do it. So Livonia is good to Baltic. So Andrew's got some things going well for him. And, and another thing that's going well for him is that Riaz makes another diplomatic play and leaves Trieste yeah. and doesn't take Ankara, <laughs> does take Rome because, you know, wh why leave that French uh, after all this? So, man, what, a bunch, of, what a bunch of twists. What a bunch of twists. This has been a very entertaining game to watch. Yeah. France is a. Uh... Boy, this is just just very delicate balance of power play. Um, it's it feels surprising, but uh, you know these these players clearly know what they're doing. So Riaz had uh, a build in the in the bank. He picked up Rome here. You know maybe he doesn't want to grow too quickly as well. Um, and Andrew's putting down two units here. Mm. What a good game! I want to I want to give a shout out to Nick. Yeah. Um, Go for it. Nick playing France it had only been playing uh, for a few months, and he had made the finals of season one, and now he's in the semis of season two, and he's quite a good player. He's very personable. So maybe learning a lesson here about <laughs> leaving Riaz Varani too viable. Frankly, yeah. leaving yeah. any any Italian in that situation too viable. I just yeah. I just don't agree with the strategic decision. But you know we all or learn the game at some point and make decisions. And those of us that have been playing the game for many years make strategic poor, strategically poor decisions. So there's nothing, yeah. nothing wrong yeah. with that, but it is important for us to point out that that was an opportunity missed, you know, and we'll see. Uh, but, you know, his position is not great against the English, you know, the English channel was an important loss. Yeah. And I keep, it keeps, I keep feeling like Riaz is sort of passing up his chances to, um, to assert control over the those Russian centers in the Balkans, but then you look at his position and those centers are his whenever he wants them. Yeah, I think he's not. I think he's just a matter of time. Yeah, and is that time now in spring 1909 with Max of four years left? Uh, possibly. <laughs> it, is, it is clearly now. And he's going to be able to take. He's going to be able to take all four of those, I think, without much issue. Yeah. Um, so that's that's obviously really good. Really good for him. Um, All right. And in the north, some stuff happens. It looks like uh, possibly some advantage France with the fleet coming back into play and Wales. Let's keep pushing forward here. But if, there's so many English units around there. There's not a whole lot for. Uh, no, it's, it's hard to imagine that Nick is going to be able to, to catch Riaz here, but we'll see what the counts are. Uh, Riaz does not walk out of any of those Russian units. Not this time. Not this uh, time. Russian dots and takes Ankara to go plus four. Four um, only clears one uh, home center for uh, only two home centers for a build. It's not going to matter because I have to say one other thing mm -hmm. about Riaz. Yeah, he is. He and I have played gunboat against each other a lot. He outguesses me most of the time. He's so mm -hmm. good at it. He just outguessed France France twice in a row. He bounced him in Terranian in the spring term. Bounced him in Ionian mm -hmm. in the fall term. Wouldn't surprise me if those were arranged. I have to be honest, but. But if they were guesses, uh, I, it wouldn't surprise me if he. If I think I don't think. Look, look at where. Look at the other one. Look, Western Med. I don't think those were guesses. I think France was coming mm. back. Maybe so. Hard to believe this game would continue after this, though. Um, I agree. And uh, it does. does okay. Anyway, because everything we thought about this game. <laughs> the only thing that I was right about was that Sullivan wasn't going to last long. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, I have had to get rid of the best player. Yeah, that's what it, that's. Yeah. Keep telling yourself though. That's exactly. Yeah, there, right. Is there any possibility here though? I don't even no. hear. No, no. I mean, France is trying to come in there to do some sort of too little, too late action, but England's not going to let them. Uh, I don't know. Let's see here. Oh no, I guess he's throwing, no, he's throwing his centers to France, isn't he? Uh, or either that, or he. I guess he just moved up, moved his units away, or something. Uh, so Riaz does not retake. Um, <laughs> does not retake. Uh, rum and loses some position at the same time. Um, and that takes us a little bit closer. So now it's 12, 11. Um, can Andrew Zick find another center? I mean, you look at this line of armies that uh, Riaz has set up here. Um, and I think it's going to take some, some guess winning on Andrew's part, which feels unlikely. <laughs> this game keeps going. This might go to the, to the final here. Let's Final see. Um, all right. So in the south, we get into Sevastopol, but crucially, um, the unit's not blown up. I think 
Andrew needed that unit to get blown up. And otherwise, Andrew definitely needs Nick um, Volpe's on the backside to be going against Riaz. And he's not. And he's not. In fact, he's sending units up north against uh, against Andrew. In so fact, once Nick got down there to training, he then backed back out because the English yeah. were taking his stuff. So, so um, this game ends. Uh, I I'm going to assume that no, none of us think this game uh, ended the wrong way. <laughs> no, nah, he's Riaz never ceases to amaze me. Kind of. It, it, I, I was saying by my earlier good. comment, though, he was not the favorite at that point that you said he was. He could not, should not have been the favorite. Nick let him get away with that, mm -hmm. and it's, it's 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 it just shows you how good Riaz is as a negotiator, in addition to his other skills. Nick had England problems. This was this was a really well played game, and I was really sad that I didn't get to continue to play in this game because I saw how well it was being played. Well, we haven't said enough about Andrew Zick's play, and he is a great player as well. And, yeah. and look at him being able to maneuver this. You know, we were said a few times, why are you not bringing all your units back? Because he was getting all of Germany and Denmark. You know, that's relevant. So, um, yeah, so Andrew has a nice score to take into the semifinal, the second chance boards, which uh, which do matter. But uh, let's congratulate uh, the new Artemis, uh, Riaz Varani, for uh, making it to the uh, to the finals. And let's keep pushing ahead here, guys. Um, we had a nice pace there. It ended up being a long game. Um, so that was uh, ultimately uh, what slowed us down here. So let's just keep up. Let's keep on going here. Oh, I see. We're not looking at the player list. Um, uh. All right. This board has uh, everyone's favorite villain, Greg Matthews, uh, Ewok or Village uh, Idiot. He goes by uh, different non non right, hold on. He, He's not everybody's favorite villain. One person's favorite villain is getting ready to come up right now. And that is? Evan Belaris. Ed, what do you think about Evan's play? Wait, we'll talk about it later. We'll talk about it later. Oh, damn. <laughs> Uh, wow. This is you got it. Uh, what, what have I done for my sins? It's Easter, okay? You know, like. <laughs> All right. So uh, Scott Ervent, uh, Evan Valeris, Kunalski, Greg Matthews, Josh Ostrowski, Maxim Popov, who's uh, also a face-to-face -face regular or has been in the past, and uh, Lare um, are the players in this board. Um, we did get some action, uh, some uh, position shuffling in the Paris method. Um, which ended up with uh, Germany, Austria, and Turkey going fifth, sixth, and seventh, uh, and a different iteration of the the first four. Uh, all right, let's dive right in to, uh, if I can press the right button, let's dive right into just this a, game. Just a little background. Sure. Uh, Greg loves to play Russia, extended deadline. He won Nexus, I think season six is Russia. He enjoys the diplomatic uh, advantages of Russia. And uh, we'll see how it goes. And an extremely strong player, right? Like typically does well in whatever competition he he joins. Yeah, he was the, he was the top he seed in the nation. He was the top seed coming into the uh, in this particular Paris method, right? He had the first choice. Yeah. Correct. <clears throat> All right. Well, so, he picked fourth. He did. Yeah, he dropped down to fourth. Yeah. All right. So let's do um, let's do just one player. Uh, one of you guys. Uh, talks per season and uh if the other one has something burning in their in their pocket to add uh, they can do it otherwise just just hold your tongue until the next um ed we'll start with you since you uh were so uh cooperatively quiet last game i am brandon thank you uh it's hard not to notice the bounce in the channel in spring 1901 between england and france France loving the bounces because bounces in Burgundy as well. You don't see both set of moves uh, very often. Uh, meanwhile, let's see how it goes for Maxime uh, letting Italy into Trieste in the spring of 1901. Um, and Turkey does the old school David Hood endorsed Smyrna to Khan. <laughs> Uh, David, you are allowed to comment on the... Uh, I the really game. endorse the French opening yeah. very well. I think that's awesome. Uh, it, and, and actually, this could be just a bunch of arrangements, honestly, as opposed to... These bounces. Truly, yeah, arranged bounces, yeah. We'll see. 
Uh, well, it is a genuine hood hog, a genuine hood hog, I should say. And that takes us into fall of 1901. It's pronounced genuine. Genuine. Genuine hood hog. Genuine. <clears throat> David Hood, will you take All right, I'm looking at Belgium uh, because that was what France could take. And they also took Spain. Uh, let's see. Germany is letting the Russians into Sweden. That's always relevant. Um, in the east, <laughs> we, do, we do have another attempted convoy to Greece. Uh, this time the Turks didn't support it, uh, <laughs> but they did keep the Austrians out of Greece and kept Trieste. So, Maxime, it's happened to you just like it happened to our friend Ed. Uh, D David, I kind of wonder if there's an article here about the hood hog um, and pot, like if you're France and you want to kind of slow down your England and Germany a little bit, maybe you arrange those bounces and you get Belgium and Spain. Yeah, it certainly is going to work out fine for, for the opening position here for Scott. I mean, having the English, English fleet in the English channel is not that big a deal. Yeah. You want to, I want to, uh, the only the only thing I want to point out, and I'm sorry for the delay, uh, you can blame Elon Musk, is back in the spring, I've seen not just here in this tournament, but a lot in virtual, the bounce in the channel is becoming more and more sort of accepted. I hate that as England, but uh, it's better than having the French in the channel. You know, I have to say, though, I've long thought that one of the one of the imbalances in the culture is that uh, bounces in the English Channel aren't treated the same way that bounces in Black Sea are um, that. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why EFs, Leviathans um, sort of so often get off to a fast start. But that's that's a conversation for another day. In this case, we see that uh, those bounces were that bounce was likely not arranged. And uh, <laughs> in English Channel in England uh, puts down fleet Liverpool. Um, and Germany, you know, now we get the fleet Kiel and Army uh, Belgium because Munich uh, didn't actually get cleared. Um, so interesting to see how that develops. In the south, we get some standard fleets. And Greg Matthews makes the um, strategy, the options keeping um, decision of putting an army down in St. Petersburg. All right, let's move on to spring of 1902. And um, Ed, back to you. So we see France take... Uh the English Channel this time, so that ends the bounce war. I want to point out Kunal, who's playing England, was a season one finalist, and Scott Erevant had a very good score, and as I know this, because he eliminated me uh, playing France, he just, he picked France again. He's a very good player also, not just because he eliminated me. Um, but you do see in uh, the East, <laughs> uh, Trieste going to Tyrolia, Vienna going to Bohemia, but uh, you know, you typically want Russia on board for that, and Russia and Turkey weren't on board for that because Bulgaria is now in Serbia, and uh, Russia is really bearing down on Maxim right now. Surprising that Greg Matthews is in, good, in a good position. I've never seen. <laughs> All right, uh, he's got all the other everyone's units moving away from him uh, while he moves his units towards them. Uh, fall 1902, David. Again, surprising that he takes Budapest to this situation and is in spectacular position. Um, he also has got England helping him right in the north because that you know there's there's no there's no uh, chance. Is that no? I'm sorry. The English are losing there. The Russians tried to support that army in Denmark, yep. but it didn't didn't survive. Uh, otherwise, the French are now in the Irish Sea because the English went to Wales. Let's see. What did London do? Oh, London supported North Sea in case there was an FG attack on it. Eh. What Wales? Uh, it was an interesting choice in the fall term because it does allow the French to get into the Irish Sea there. Yeah, for, uh, England does have a rebuild here after losing uh, Denmark and staying, uh, managing to keep uh, Norway um, from you know possible pilfering by uh, Greg Matthews in St. Petersburg. Um, anything to add, Mr. Sullivan? No, but I would like to just point out the press. Uh, advantages of getting like what Greg can do just better than anyone, maybe other than uh, Jordan Connors, although they'd both be mad if I said one wasn't better than the other. They're both great <laughs> is getting information, getting it, knowing how to use it. It's just, and that is something that press allows you to do that face to face and virtual just can't. And I think that's why Greg struggles a little bit in the virtual world, but mm. we'll see. 
All right, winter 1902, uh, we get another French fleet, another Turkish fleet, and uh, another and an army from Greg. So Greg clearly choosing the Southern theater to focus on. Uh, let's keep on going. Spring 1903, uh, Ed, back to you. Sure. Um, something happened to Wales. Can't really tell. Oh, uh, Irish Sea got to Wales, uh, whereas uh, Liverpool went to Irish. Meanwhile, it looks like nothing else happened in the West. Uh, nothing really happened in the North in terms of what was, you know, a lot of, a lot of red arrows. The only thing of consequence is Greece with Turkish support getting into the Ionian. Greg sniffing out that convoy to Livonia and blocking it. Yeah, that's it nice. nice that's very nice. Uh, all right, so we have an AT forming, possibly an ART um, uh, altogether. And uh, David, over to you. Yeah, it's really an RT with Austria that's trying to survive. Yeah. And so they're the tip of the Correct. spear. And that is what's what's happening here. Um, so that's what's going on in, 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 the, in the Mediterranean theater. The Austrians getting into Tyrrhenian Tyrrh Tyrrh Sea is, is incredibly fun for the tip of the spear. And that's a spear that's way into the Mediterranean. Um, yeah, the Russians have, again, made the right guesses here. They didn't worry about the Livonian convoy again. Instead, they, they, they made sure that Sweden didn't fall and they've gotten into Silesia. Uh, the English just had too many units there for France to make much headway. Therefore, the French fleet in Wales is now dead. All right, winter 1903. Um, we get the French rebuild in Brest, and that's it. No centers changed hands. Uh, all right, spring 1904, and David... I'm sorry, Ed, back to you. Sure. So uh, Turkey gets into the uh, Ionian. Uh, I guess it's a strategic retreat from uh, Austria here. Tyrrhenian got uh, dislodged and moved to Lyon. Let's see. Russia pulled back a little bit. Uh, did alliance hygiene, I guess. Uh, that's out there, but fleet lingers in Sevastopol. Uh, and letting Austria push forward into Tyrolia. And so you see this sort of Eastern or juggernaut plus Austria sort of, you know, working together here. And uh, France tries to pull back uh, a little bit, but the English aren't letting up. Yeah, this is Scott going to Canal saying, I'm going to pull out now. I'm sorry about all this. I got other stuff to do. We're friends, right? And Canal says, yeah, no, no, no. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so uh, a question for me is how long um, uh, Russia and Turkey decide they need Austria um, and uh, at least one more year. Yeah, I was going to say this might have been the turn to do it, but that's not what they decided to do. Um, uh, David, this to you. On the other hand, they didn't. The Austrians also didn't take Venice, which you would think they might have done in this situation. But instead, they have. I guess they were trying to help other people do things, might maybe help the Russians if they needed it, <laughs> uh, cut, cutting Munich. At any rate, the Russians take Berlin, uh, mm -hmm. which is good for them. The Turks have um, not taken Tunis. They took a shot at Tunis instead of guessing for Tyrrhenian. But, you know, Leon getting to Western Med probably will make a difference in there, not for 1905. But otherwise, the English actually are just moving their fleets around to put them all in position to take the Mid-Atlantic. So that's what's going on, as far as I can tell. Wait a wow. minute, who gets into Holland? Uh, England does with French support. Oh, with French support. So maybe that is a rearrangement, and maybe they are going to be friends then. I just noticed yeah. that. Okay. I, I would just say Maxine's play is survival, right? So, you know, Venice does not matter as much as keeping Greg and Turkey happy. Yeah, yeah I know. Just, I thought it might have made him happy to cripple the Italians, but what do I know? He just doesn't want to be the first one eliminated uh, in the game, basically. Uh, the question is who gets eliminated first? You know, Italy would be the candidate, right? So I think that would also speak to uh, to David's point. Make mm -hmm. sure Italy gets eliminated first. All right. Uh, what we find is that Germany pulls an army in Denmark. Greg, uh, you know, managed to somehow pick up Berlin, uh, puts on an army in Warsaw, and England gets a rebuild, or no, a new build, in uh, which is Army London, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, Maybe headed to Belgium. Belgium, Belgium. yeah. There we go. Um, all right, uh, Ed, talk us through it. 
pardon me. Uh, well, it's hard to know what's going on between England and France here, other than France just saying, hey, I'm going to go fight Italy. Don't take my stuff. And then England just takes the stuff. Uh, maybe there's a better analysis for that. Meanwhile, uh, Greg just gets in position here. Uh, Turkey takes uh, Trieste with uh, Budapest support. Maxime doesn't care because Trieste is going to Venice with Tyrolia support. Turkey gets on the boot, which is, you know, utterly fantastic for uh, the RT. The question will, I guess, become who, who has the advantage between R and T as England and France seem to fight a lot. And without getting rid of that fleet in Romania, it's hard not to say Greg has the advantage in the RT. Greg also has the advantage in the sense that he can take Norway whenever he wants. You know, you, you, if you're France, you would love for the, that to have been a fair fight against England, but it wasn't a fair fight because England didn't have to defend Norway, Norwegian, North Sea. There's no Russian threat there. He can spend all of his units fighting the French back. This is all advantage Greg Matthews, though. Uh, this is a pretty masterful play by Greg, isn't it? Uh, I think so. The, nobody's coming after him. He's great allies in, uh, in both theaters. Um and has dots sort of at his, you know, not only does he have dots that is ready whenever he wants, but he's topping the board already by two. Right. He's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's, that's right. All right. You know, eight, eight center rushes are very precarious in general, unless nobody is attacking you. They're pretty good. <laughs> yeah. He's not spread out at all. He's sort of spread just right. Uh, all right. Uh, fall of 1905, David, to you. And now he takes Norway because England was making, I guess, making too much progress for him, uh, taking Belgium. Um, let's see. They also take, uh, Vienna, Romania to the Black Sea has got to mean something, uh, Ukraine to Romania. Uh, what else is happening? Otherwise lots. Well, the Austrians have taken Trieste back, um, which is probably also good news for Greg Matthews. I'm looking for any bad news for Greg Matthews, and I'm not seeing any on the board. I feel like, <laughs> honestly, I feel like Greg just won this game. It's uh, all news. It's all good news. Yeah. Ed, is there, is there any reason to think that Greg didn't just win this game with this turn? Baltic just went to Denmark. No. Yeah. Still good news. I mean, he's he's in black. He's building two. Uh, Turkey is, he can gut Turkey any chance he wants, uh, anytime he wants. And look, he's now. Look at the unit displacement. Yeah. Uh, and he's amazing. And he's got a five center lead. I mean, if this game continues, it, there's not there's not a huge reason for it. Uh, all right, so Greg puts on a northern fleet and a southern army, which you know will like he yeah, which was either convoy to Ankh or he'll just go to Khan and and to Armenia here. Um, which is the desert so Khan in the Armenia. spring here. Yeah, I mean, he's got Maxime totally on side here, right? You know, which is really helpful. Turkey gets pushed back. Uh, Maxime, uh, a great player in his own right, uh, is working with him uh, and surviving, which is great. Uh, Turkey does convoy back to, to Smyrna. Greg plays for position on Khan. Uh, it's just all coming up aces for Greg everywhere I look, uh, except he didn't take the North Sea. Uh, but that's fine. Uh, he didn't even defend uh, Berlin. Uh, which was, well, I guess not. I mean, he couldn't have taken both, so good news. And uh, and the game yeah, ends. Over. Not, yep. not surprising. Well, yeah. Just Greg Matthews is a great diplomacy. <laughs> this is a virtuoso performance, uh, if I've ever seen one. This is just fantastic play. Yeah. Is anything else to say? <laughs> no. All right, congratulations, Craig Matthews, um, for uh, for making the top board here. In I mean, just dominant. Look at the look at the center chart, right? Nothing touches his line. <laughs> I've never seen a center chart like that. You know, Russia is the only country that can do this, that can lead from the first year and never share the lead, and it uh, just done it. I mean, yeah, well done, well done, Greg Matthews, and. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's all there is to say. All right, let's um, let's bring uh, Tanya Gill back on the stage here. Tanya, welcome back. Thank you. You did a good job picking up the pace there. We're going to keep it going. Um, David, you, you ready for a break here? I can. 
All right, take a break, then we'll bring you back for the last two VDL games. Uh, all right, and then uh, that means it's the three of us for the last uh, Olympus semifinal. And here is the, let's see if I can get the, here's the map, and then I will bring up the uh, power selection. And this is named after Hades, I believe, indeed. Um, here's the Paris method selection, which, uh, had a little bit of, uh, movement. Jordan Connors, obviously the name, I think your, your eye is drawn to here. He's another, um, extended deadline, uh, master, uh, and, uh, uh, some other names I recognize on this board, Jason Bennett, who is a, a common face-to-face -face player. Um, Andrew Koke, I think has played some face-to-face -face now, even in person, um, and yep, uh, he was at he went to Vancouver and Andrew Koch was also the uh, uh, finished second in the season one. Uh, sorry, season eight Olymp uh, Nexus. He's a he's a very good player. Fantastic. Any any other comments about anyone else on the board? All right, then let's dive into some moves here. Uh, here is, uh, let's see, we'll switch you guys up. So Tanya, we'll have you do spring. We'll stick with that format of, uh, just one person talks per, uh, per season, unless you got something, something burden. Great. We have another, uh, France moving into the English channel, popular move set with, the uh, extended deadliners, I suppose. Um, England opening, uh, pretty standard, same with Germany. Uh, there's a bounce in Galicia, a bounce in Black, and Smyrna to Armenia. A bit different there. Um, Venice holds, and that's that's about all I got. Anything to add, Ed? No, but I didn't get to give Jordan Connors his due. Whereas Greg is an information gatherer, like we saw in the last game. Jordan Connors and I've played with Jordan and Greg on multiple boards. It's a party with Jordan Connors. He makes you feel completely loved and you're going to join his party. He's a friendly guy. You can see him on deadline and it, he is great fun to play with and he knows how to play uh, really well. Until things don't go his way, then then you're looking at a different Jordan Connors. <laughs> but that's rare <laughs> that things don't go his way. All right. Well, he's sitting in Italy. We've already seen two Italy's uh, make the top board. Um, so clearly a popular choice. Um, Ed, he does the aggressive AI play here. Yeah, he plays nice. He goes to Trieste and Aegean. Uh, meanwhile, just what every Italy wants to see, Turkey uh, going to Black Sea while he's in Aegean. Um, and then I guess Germany was a little worried about Holland. Uh, although apparently didn't need to be because North Sea was supporting Ruhr, I assume, to Belgium here. And uh, two builds for England, uh, France. All right, that takes us into winter 1901. I think Fleet Kiel has been in uh, every game but one that we've seen tonight. Uh, but we do get a northern fleet uh, from Jason Bennett in Russia. So uh, this is on the north coast St. Petersburg. So commitment of intent there probably doesn't make andrew coke in uh, in england very happy um elsewhere we get some fairly standard builds france had had some options here went for fleet breast army marseille uh and turkey went for uh, fleet constantinople so not a, not a great tactical situation down there and had to make a choice all right spring 1902 tanya we'll go to you um despite the potential ai turkey continues to press on russia takes romania um Either guess is right uh, on on uh, Italian moves, or perhaps they decided to sort of uh, let him push on Jason while um, AI works on the Turkish centers, like we've seen before uh, in these games. Um, meanwhile, uh, in the West, we've got well, we've got a bounce in Silesia, which seems. Uh, Probably unnecessary on both their ends, given Sweden is supporting Denmark to Skagerrak. So you would think that maybe they'd want to work together a bit. Um, and then on the other hand, London attempting to convoy ah, and succeeding to convoy into Holland with support from France. It's always interesting when uh, England's work with uh, French players 
when they've got a fleet in English in 1901. So it uh, seems like Germany is sort of on the outs, possibly with Russia um, supporting Germany against NEF. Ed, what do you make of uh, this setback on uh, from Jordan O'Connor's losing Trieste? You can't have liked that um, at all. Uh, so clearly a, a setback for him. Uh, I'm, I don't know if this is the best move by Chris, but uh, we'll see how it turns out. Uh, so I'm sure Jordan is scrambling a little bit. And then, yeah, I was going to say the same thing uh, about the EF. Uh, I don't like to be E in this situation with, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting Holland, but on the other hand, look at, Look at that ju juicy England. Maybe Holland is where uh, English armies go to die uh, in this game. English armies just go to die. They don't do anything. <laughs> Maybe they should wow. say Petersburg is okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, gets away with it, though. Uh, Ed, talk, tell us, talk us through it. Uh, well, I'm just drawn to the East because I'm a Jordan Connors fanboy because I always want to see what he's doing first. Uh, with Albania going to Greece, uh, I guess that was part of the plan the whole time. Aegean gets into Khan uh, because Khan got into Bulgaria. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, that's really great for Jordan. Uh, he can't be saddened by any of that. In the West, uh, France does get out of uh, English Channel, takes Portugal, takes Burgundy, uh, seems somewhat committed to the to the EF, but Russia helps Germany into Norway, uh, which will, at least for the short term, uh, cut off the dangers of the loss of Holland. So pretty good play there by Russia, I think. All right, so uh, the AI, this is quite a good turn by for the AI here, Tanya. Um, I think they're uh, just back on track, no problems. I had actually, I didn't even, think that they were going to fight. Like I just expected yeah. it to be arranged. So <laughs> maybe, maybe that was arranged. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, the net result is that uh, they both pick up one. Austria is putting down two with the rebuild after the, the PIFT fleet. Um, and uh, Turkey has to pull one, you know, you get that army, useless army in Galicia probably going to go. And the answer is no, that fleet in Bulgaria probably just assumed that it, uh, it was going to get blown up anyway. So might as well get rid of it now. Uh, and he's probably going to attack Russia. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite horrible to be Russia in these games, <laughs> I think, if uh, yeah, unless, first unless eliminated is, yeah. yeah. Unless you're Greg Matthews. But yeah, it does seem like, uh, unless you're, <laughs> unless you're yeah, although uh, Andrew Zick did pretty well as well. All right, so Jason uh, drops the army in Moscow, may, uh, may regret that, I think, fairly quickly. All right, let's keep going here, spring 1903. Uh, Tanya to you. Right. So in the east, uh, we've uh, continued the Turkish slaughter and Turkey, of course, then taking Russian dots. Um, uh, and then on the other side of the board, uh, France has decided to d decided that, you know, I've seen this a lot, too, where if the EF isn't going according to plan. France just often just turns on England, especially in a scenario like this so so there, uh, there, are, there actually is some information i should add here um okay. that uh france was played by a different player until this turn um so it was replaced in andre gribikov was it was andre gribikov um and was replaced in winter of 1902 uh for reasons unknown there were some subs in the previous game as well that uh that we didn't uh i think weren't quite as uh significant but yeah this is a big one right so oh, that's horrible that really sucks if you're england to lose your ally uh yeah, yeah that would upset me quite a bit um yeah that's too bad um well this france i suppose didn't like uh andrew too much so um great we've got an alliance switch then in the fg but you have to wonder where that leaves jason whether that's good for jason or not but for now, Norway's supporting Sweden's tag. Ed, I would say notice there? that Greece, Greece convoys to Smyrna. So Jordan's going to pick up all of Anatolia there. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge, huge advantage. By the, by the end of 1903. <laughs> That's just good. 
Oh, uh, but walks out of but opens up Smyrna, walks out of it. So clearly finding use for. Uh, he doesn't need it. He'll have. Wait, does he need it? Oh, he's getting Tunis. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so so finally, in the fall of nineteen oh three, picks up Tunis. Uh, Ed. Uh, yeah, this is we're we're stepping he, on your he toes here. Smyrna, he can get Smyrna whenever he wants. Yeah. The 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 Turkish play in Romania uh, is really good, I think, for Jordan. Right, like gives ties up Austrian units. Meanwhile, we start to see with the moves to Tyrol and Piedmont that Jordan's totally involved in this AI. That it is an AI, and it's good for him that he's picking up dots and that his partner is, you know, somewhat stymied there. That's that's how you like to run an alliance. Uh, where you get all the growth and you have a friendship. Meanwhile, going into the West, uh, France in the English Channel now, Russia in the North Sea, which is pretty important, I would think. And uh, because Germany can take Sweden, I guess, uh, whenever he wants. And uh, that's about it. I'm always a little cautious when I'm growing and my ally isn't. Um, and my ally doesn't have a lot of room to grow because then that's when the ally starts to look at my dots and say, well, you have a lot and I don't want to be in a position where you're super ahead of me. So, and of course, Austria has a lot of armies in the center, not doing much. So um, I think there's definitely incentive for Jordan to want to push Austrian armies away somehow. We'll see how that works. It's interesting here too. I think if you're Austria and you see the walking out of Smyrna here, uh, you know, then you got maybe got kind of kind of wonder what Italy has in mind for those Turkish units, um, you know, which are sort of potentially directed against you. Mm -hmm. um, and now Italy has, uh, you know, the Black Sea to themselves. This is quite a nice position to uh, to be Italy in. Uh, in any case, Italy puts down two uh, fleets here. Um, not an army, Venice, so it doesn't it doesn't appear to be looking for conflict with um, with Italy or with Austria. The question will be how long uh, they can keep that that from becoming uh, a conflict zone uh, through diplomatic means. All right, spring 1904. Um, Tanya, to you. So AI continues uh, their path with um, Jordan moving his fleets over. And uh, France saying, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't have <laughs> moved and pushed on England because uh, now Mid-Atlantic goes to the West, now North Atlantic goes to the MAO. Uh, but at the same time, Belgium is convoyed over to Wales. <laughs> so really, really messy. We've seen a fair amount of messy EF situations. This is uh, one of many. Um, fun part is Jason getting into London uh, don't know if he'll keep it, but he's there for now. Um, I actually didn't even notice he was in the North Sea, uh, but mm. uh, great. I think it's still an uh, Germany-Russia alliance here, so uh, most like probably most likely um, uh, Russia will get support to keep London. Let's see. Well, with Munich moving to Silesia, probably to help. Uh, Russia keep Warsaw, I imagine. Let's see what happens. I don't know if I would have liked this as uh, France, because how is one to know that North Sea is getting to London? And if North Sea got dislodged, it could have retreated to Belgium. It could have retreated uh, to Holland. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There could have been a lot of scary things that could have happened there. Yeah, it's a very aggressive play. And combined with Mid-Atlantic leaving, it, you know, it's uh, trying to sort of have it both ways, and that may lead to having it no ways. Fall of 1904, uh, Ed, tell us about it. Well, because of that fleet move to Mid-Atlantic, uh, France has to pull back. Uh, England takes Portugal while losing uh, Liverpool, which was expected. So, man, if you wanted to kind of like write a perfect set for, if you're Italy, like to have this English-French conflict, uh, that would be fantastic. In the meantime, it looks like Turkey is still working. Well, I, I've never really understood Turkey's position with Austria, but uh, they're supporting Austria into Warsaw. Jordan is supporting Turkey in Sevastopol and taking Smyrna. So I, Turkey's in this Janissary role. We'll see 
for how long. And uh, I think the sort of headline here, other good news for Jordan Connors is Germany attacking uh, into Bohemia and getting those sort of units there. Why does everything always work out for Jordan? It just seems like everyone's <laughs> going that way and he's following behind and not fighting anyone. It's insane. <laughs> and he knows you don't let your uh, Janissary get a build. So yeah. <laughs> uh, you don't do that. Yeah, it just this just feels like everything's coming up Jordan Connors. Um, yeah, Chris Trout, you know, the, he has he has a path here. Um, he just needs to he needs to get the um, German conflict to end so that he can do something else. Um, you know, if, if I'm playing Austria, I don't say Italy, you can have all of Turkey. <laughs> like, mm. You know, I just, I don't let it happen. So, you know, you guys, you got to advocate for stuff. <laughs> Always be like, wait a second. <laughs> you can't sweet talk me into taking all the dots. <laughs> all right. We do you get You should it. listen to Tanya because she, <laughs> she gave a video on how to play Austria, which I've uh. watched like 10 times. That's right. <laughs> Did it all help right. you much, Ed? <laughs> We'll see. Did, did it? All right. To be determined. TBD. All right. So we do get a couple new armies in the south at the expense of some units in the north. Um, and uh, we do get an army from Jordan, uh, but it's in Rome, not Venice, which is very friendly. Uh, all right. Uh, Tanya. Uh, the army in Rome, we'll start there, does just go up to Venice. So friendly, not friendly, who knows? Um, and on the Austrian front, there is movement to take Bohemia. Um, Jason is, ah, there's a German fleet in St. Petersburg, which <laughs> Jason <laughs> and do but, anything. <laughs> North is, uh, Norway's uh, being supported by North into Norwegian. So they're still working together. There's um, uh, on the French end, uh, I mean, there's at least there's no conflict between E, E, G, uh, no, F, G. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with E, G. I don't really know what's going on with England at all. They're down to two centers. Um, North Atlantic is supporting Portugal into Mao. Mao then does what? Tries to take Portugal. Tries um, to take Portugal. Fails. Yeah, and why is that? Why doesn't... Um... It got cut. Spain didn't get. Oh, Spain got cut by Western Med. By Western Thank Med. you. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's why. Okay. Um. Yeah. Meanwhile, Jordan is happily telling EF to fight each other while uh, he waltz into Mar Marseille. So that's great. Uh, <laughs> um, right. and still support holding Turkey. Uh. Yes. Okay. So, uh, question for me is: Are the Turkish units of any use still? And uh, the answer is yes. Ed, what, what happens here of consequence? Of consequence? Uh, I don't know. You put me on the spot. Jordan takes Spain. That's pretty consequential. Jordan takes the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people would say that's consequential. Uh, <laughs> wow. Know, uh, that's pretty good. All the Austrian armies moved away. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Austria apparently is not interested in taking Turkish dots or even get asking Jordan, Jordan, hey, maybe I could take Sev here. You know, Romania could go to Sev supported by, or maybe I could cut, I could cut it with Moscow. I could, I could get some stuff. And Austria's yeah. like, no, I'd rather be in Livonia. Uh, that's kind of what's happening right now. <laughs> yeah, they could have, out. Austria could have had both Moscow and Sevastopol here um, and simply replace the Turkish dots with their own. Okay, so the net result is that uh, Jordan Connors goes up to 10, thanks to taking Marseille in Spain, opens up a three-center lead, um, and is in the Mid-Atlantic, <laughs> while England and France are still fighting. Uh, yeah, I, uh, is this game already over? Uh, I'd be really concerned if I was Austria <laughs> in this position. I would not be happy. Yeah. Um, I... I, I I'm going to say this. Jordan plays to have fun, but Jordan is the modern solo king. I don't know if there's a solo. I don't know the result of this game, but I certainly know that this is a solo position. He's straddling every every yeah. every side, and his enemies are beset against each other. So, you know, 
he might want to go for it. Spring of 1906. Tanya. Uh, Tanya. Um, yeah, Jordan takes po- Jordan, 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 Jordan takes Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> I hate talking about the man. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, he takes Portugal, is continuing to move. Uh, is also moving like Smyrna to Khan. <laughs> like, if I'm Austria, I'm really, really freaking nervous right now. <laughs> you know, why are you doing that? Yeah. Um, Naples to Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <It's> so fun. <laughs> um, uh, and then on the other end, no one's attacking him. France is trying to go move move their armies away from, uh, from Jordan. And, um, uh, yeah, there's a fight for the North see for whatever reason uh you know uh, you have to wonder where people's priorities are <laughs> they're not right. they're just not right here <laughs> all right uh ed let's see if you can talk about the next moves without saying either jordan or italy <laughs> well, so the green dots move <laughs> into trieste <laughs> in bulgaria uh, well. and but look he's a he's a kind overlord uh portugal left uh, so England oh, can yeah. stay alive, and uh, I don't think England has any place to build because he lost Edinburgh. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, Portugal will never be green. Uh, that'll never happen. Austria, and I can see Jordan saying it right now. Well, you were going to get Munich. Uh, you know, you you know. So, uh, how, what about how is oh. allowing this? What is going on? Yeah. How, how can you see? Uh, you know, your the move to con and then be like oh la di da let's go for munich and not cover trias it's crazy i'm <laughs> sorry it's it's She's it's impressive diplomacy person. yeah it's impressive i don't, I don't understand the party yeah i don't understand leaving portugal i don't there's not much upside to that and he had units he had other units that could have gone to mid-atlantic um so that that seems uh, peculiar but uh, it's hard to criticize a player who in uh, six years has opened up a 12-6 lead. <laughs> double, literally double the, <laughs> the next person. All right, more armies for the Balkans. Yeah, there is. it's not hard to count to 18 here. Um, I hope he solos. <laughs> he it, deserves it. <laughs> it's just not hard to count to 18 here. Uh, all right, so Austria does pull back actually to try to maintain some some semblance of, uh, of resistance here. Um, I'll just, I'm just going to help us out here. Jordan gets into the English <laughs> channel, follows up in the mid Atlantic. I mean, this is a guaranteed solo, I think, um, with enough time. Uh, uh so, so sorry. Turkey, uh, I'm sorry, Austria does get into, uh, Piedmont, uh, which actually is significant. Um, but Jordan still picks up three dot, four dots. <laughs> Paris, Paris, Brest, Portugal, Serbia. Yeah, that's good. it, right? Four. He only picks up four. Can only build two. Is still an Irish Sea English Channel in Mid Atlantic. Um, so it was up to sixteen. <laughs> well, look at that chart. <laughs> I think I think he's got a guaranteed solo here. His big. His only <laughs> problem is that Marseille is open, but he can fix that fairly easily. Can you go back? A, a turn what, what's everyone else doing on this board are they doing anything yeah germany and austria i think are trying to fight him um France russia's paris russia's bringing units around um jordan's in irish and english yeah it's it's so done it's, it's i don't done. yeah i don't know if paris i don't paris to picardy is a peculiar move here um I like Jason taking Norway. Not much else to do. <laughs> Belgium supporting Mid Atlantic into uh, the English Channel. So Paris, Paris uh, out of Picardy may may have been a walkout, but I don't think it's a I don't think it's a good one. I think if you're Jordan, I don't think you want Paris there. I think you'd rather you'd rather have stayed in Burgundy. Um, okay, well let's just get uh, the game ends. Okay, so <laughs> oh, oh why? <laughs> All right, so Jordan magnanimously passed up uh, what looks to me like a guaranteed solo. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe doesn't want to scare the uh, the other top board. Um, yeah. Read okay. Nick's note. Read read Nick's note. Very important. Nick's note. No players eliminated this game. Oh. 
I see. Mm -hmm. So if he had soloed, then all of these players would probably be enemies for life. Is that uh, that's the strategic? Well, none of them would have advanced, but instead they all advanced by Jordan pulling back. Yeah. Well, they all would have gotten zeros, right? If he right. Yeah. So um, so by yeah. So no players were eliminated, but also Jordan passing up the solo. Yeah, there's a lot of goodwill there, and he doesn't. He's still going to be the number one seed in in. Um, and uh for the top board okay so here's a question for you guys is this the right result so I, I i always go for a solo if i see it i'll never give it up for any random reason but Ed? and jordan probably has so many solos in his back pocket that it doesn't matter to him <laughs> did the right player oh, no. did the right player there's, a lot, there's a lot of whining there's a lot of whining please 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 and jordan probably's like ah okay no problem um did the right person top this board of course i <laughs> know else would have done it i mean if austria was tactically tuned in i think they <laughs> could have probably had a shot but they were just so easy like so easy to just let jordan have what he wants so they didn't have a shot like it just it yeah I see David Hood shaking his head in the green room. I'm going to bring him in to chastise us for whatever I'll it is we were away, doing. I step away one game, and you let Jordan Connors get to <laughs> 16. I blame, I blame all of you. I blame everyone involved. I blame the entire human race for that outcome. I think, David, no, I would like – Dad, go for it. No, because of the delay. I'm sorry. I would uh, like DBN to cover the finals, right, because uh, – Greg and Jordan on a top board, they played many times. There's a history there because these players are, you know, like fire and ice in the way they play. It's so different. And uh, it, it, there's nothing better in extended deadline to watch those two lock horns. Sign me up for the yeah. no, I mean, get us Get us some like snippets of the press. Like I want to read some of that stuff. Yeah, I wonder I wonder if we can get some equivalent of sideline reporting. Uh so Nicholas, uh, uh I see you're still you're still with us. Uh see if you can figure something out for that that will uh that will enhance the coverage. But yeah, I'm I'm up for it. This is this is fun play. I'm curious to see what two two masters like that uh look like going against each other. Uh David, I do think you should at least thank us though for sparing you from having to comment on that game. I blame all of you for the result. I know that it was some time ago, but I still blame you because I don't have any, nobody else is here for me to blame. So no thanks to you. All right. You, you hurt the ones you love the most. I understand. Um, I'm going to congratulate us for uh, keeping a nice pace uh, through the rest of those games. Let's keep it up for these last two VDL games. Um, David's going to join us for one more game. Um, so I'm going to give one of you guys a break. Uh, who would like the break? I don't remember who took the. If you cover 168, that's my game, so I probably shouldn't comment. I didn't have fun right. on the last time, but it was my game. Yeah, that didn't work out too well. All right, Ed, we're going to drop you for – it's you, you played this morning, right? Not Yes, obviously, this morning, not the evening. All right, so uh, go have a, a smoke and a little bit of whiskey. We'll see you in a bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of whiskey. Thank you. Not uh, see you in a little bit. All right, um, so let's dive back in. Oh, so first of all, congratulations to – uh, Jordan Connors, Greg Matthews, Riaz Varani, and who was the first one? Uh, um, yeah, I'm drawing. No, the first one was was Riaz, wasn't it? No. Oh, okay. I don't know. I can't remember now. That was uh, really quickly. Uh, Bradley Grace. Oh, Bradley champion. Grace. Right, Bradley Heckler, Grace. Yeah, Bradley. Yeah, the yeah. returning champ. Yes. Um, all right. So it's quite quite a top board shaping up already. Tanya. Yeah, they're all really known to face-to-face -to -face players too, which is fun, True. actually. Yeah. True. True. What does that mean? Are we better? <laughs> <laughs> I think they've. Uh, I think they've. Uh, so some of those players, Greg and Bradley and Riaz. Um, I know Riaz has always been interested in face-to-face, -face, but I think Greg and uh, Greg has tried face-to-face -face because he's looking for a new challenge. Jordan Connors um, is terrified of face-to-face -face and just completely bark, scared bark, 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 bark. he was uh on the top board at wdc 2018 jordan he was i remember oh, was he oh, <clears> yeah. Didn't know he's still a big there. chicken though yeah <laughs> terrified i haven't seen him yeah he, he lost that one so he's never come back since then <laughs> yeah. 
if only he had a backbone um, willing to prove himself on the toughest stage. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go back into uh, the VDL. Let me see if I can get the tech working properly here. Um, feel free to wax lyrical about something. All kidding aside, Jordan Connors is one of the true masters of the game. And it was fun. It was fun to watch that. You know, it wasn't just that his uh, supply center chart did that. It's that all the other ones stayed pretty close to each other. You know, that's really a key to dominating a game is not just getting to 16, but having everyone else be in the four to five range. That's how you solo. The more people that like, are yeah. on a board, the more chaos there is and the more chances you are. of. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely right. Yeah. All right, we are ready for uh, some graphics. Do, 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 do. Wow. League night. Here is VDL 168 in Austria. We have Mr. Ed Sullivan. I feel like we've seen Ed play Austria recently and it didn't go well. In England, we have uh, Windy City Weasel's own Wes Ketchum playing uh, from Geneva. I'm surprised I haven't updated that. He's been in Geneva for uh, several years now. Uh, oh. In France, oh yeah, and so Tanya is going to be heading to Geneva very soon. So uh, we should definitely put you and, and Wes in touch. Absolutely. France, we have a new to us player Edward S, and in Germany we have a new to us player Karsten Brat Fotenhauer. I hope I'm saying that name right. I, it's probably a uh, pseudonym. Uh, I think Karsten is is uh, his real name, but. Uh, he is coming to us from Niger. Um, he is a, U, an, a U.S. citizen, I believe, um, Ed uh, was telling us, uh, but playing from Niger. In Italy, we have Micah Blom, uh, who we saw in one of the early games. In Russia, we've got Tim Crosby out of uh, Interlock in Florida. Uh, Tim is a regular on top boards these days. And in Turkey, we've got Iron Man Cody Green playing his second game of, uh, of the day out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. All right, let's dive in here and uh, let's stick with our format here. David will put you on the springs and Tanya on the falls. And uh, here are spring 1901 orders for video 168. Uh, David, tell us what you see. All right, we do not see Venice to Trieste is the first thing that I noticed, but we do have the bounces in Galicia and Black Sea that we often have seen in, in past video games. The only other comment I would make is the French uh, do not have to go to Burgundy. They've just got to completely DMZ. All right, fall 1901. Tanya, do um, A three-way for Belgium, maybe uh, all arranged. Um, oof, actually looking scarily. No, uh, Denmark doesn't bounce Sweden, so maybe there's not a Western triple. Let's see how that uh, sort of plays out. Uh, meanwhile, Micah and Cody just played together in the first round of That's this right. weekend. So now they're back together in the East. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. Um, Ionian, well, yeah, Ionian to Gian, Venice to Trieste. Um, meanwhile, Ed uh, presumably is giving um, Micah Trieste, bounces Tim in Gal, and uh, supports Tim into Romania at the same time. So... Perhaps not the best situation for Cody here. Yeah, Cody and Micah had that AR um, that uh, went reasonably long, uh, had a little bumps. Um, Cody ended up getting the better of it, I think, by the end. Yeah. Um, uh, David, anything to add here? Not really, just a sort of an air situation, it looks like. Yeah, now we get the aggressive uh, AI move into the Aegean. Um, all right, let's uh, check out some builds here. Uh, any surprises? We get Fleet Marseille um, is a possible surprise here, uh, but uh, also possible Western Tripoli um, mm -hmm. as well. All right. Could be. Spring 1902. Um, Tanya, what do you say? Or Ed, uh, David, what do you say? Yeah, Sil Silesia and it certainly looks Western Tripoli. Um, Holland to Belgium doesn't change that equation. Germany should get Belgium in a Western triple situation. So the, so that really is the way that's looking. As far as the East is concerned, um, the um, Italian move to Naples is interesting. I guess that's so they can convoy to Tunis. I think that mm. must be the theory there. But otherwise, it's, it really is sort of very airy 
AIR against the Turks. The Turks do take Black Sea. It kind of has to be airy. I mean, if you see a Western triple come along, you're like, okay, there's just no point. Um, let's just kill Turkey and move uh, to the line. Yes, yeah, maybe one of those chicken egg arguments. Which, which came first, the air or the Western triple? That triple bounce in Belgium, I've only seen that when they plant a Western triple. You never see that in a game when a Western triple isn't in the cards. So, Not unless it's a gunboat game and you can't negotiate. And then you right, start. right. That's a different, that's a variant. <laughs> that's not diplomacy. <laughs> yeah, I will say here, by the way, it's interesting. I, I just noticed um, sort of a difference between uh, the Olympus games and this. Uh, you see the effect of not being able to negotiate during the build phases. I think... Mm -hmm. um, I think if the Western triple really did form, you know, you probably, uh, you might've seen say like a build in Berlin or something, um, uh, or, you know, maybe Ruhr shouldn't have been there in the first place. Maybe it should have been in Munich. Uh, in any case, fall of 1902, uh, Tanya, over to you. Yeah. So the Western triple continues. What is Leon doing? Um... Leon is convoying, uh, Spain to Leon. Okay, maybe just a totally random order. Spain uh, is convoying no, Leon to Piedmont. It was a misorder. It was a misorder. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, do... yeah I think what he wanted to do was to convoy Spain into Piedmont and yeah. got it horribly wrong in both both ways. <laughs> okay. Well, either way, the Western Triple continues, and um, so does the AIR, I believe. There's no real changes in... Uh, in dynamics here. Munich gets into Tyrolia. Um, France gets into the Tyrrhenian Sea. Um, that's about it. Sweden's lost. St. Petersburg soon to follow, likely. David, anything done? No, not really. Although, if I were Micah, I might go would have gone ahead and done the convoy there instead of losing the mm -hmm. Tyrrhenian. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Um, I know that they thought they were going to get attacked maybe with two fleets, but in that I hate, situation. I, I hate convoying over. This is one case where I might have done it or just might have bit the bullet and uh, an Ionian goes to Tunis with support from Turnian. So. I hope that you don't get cut. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. That result is a new fleet in uh, Rome, and we got another army in Vienna and a couple armies elsewhere while a bunch of other units come off the board. Uh, all right, spring 1903, uh, to you, uh, David. Okay, Ionian Sea for the, for, the, for the Sullivan fleet makes sense if you're still airing, which I think that they are. Serbia to Trieste isn't a stab. It's just covering it against the Germans. Uh, let me see if there's anything else going on here. They've left Turkey alone. That's the other option you have as air is to not waste units and just hope that the Turks don't stab you in the back while you're trying to defend against the Western Triple. And that may be what's happening here. Looks like that's what's happening here. You like it, Tanya? I I prefer to kill Turkey um, than to let them just simmer there, especially if I'm Austria. I don't want Turkey that I've already pissed off like sitting there while the rest of us are fighting. But maybe you don't, maybe you need the numbers, right? Like it's, it's, it's hard to dedicate both, um, both ways. So yeah, good for Cody. Maybe uh, Cody can totally make something out of this if, if, if they wanted to. So the North Africa move is interesting because it obviously gives some, gives some options here for the defense. That's the thing. I, I think they don't really like, did they need that Austrian fleet immediately? There's only two French fleets down there. So I would probably try and get Khan or something like that. And there's also the the Russian fleet that could be worked used against Turkey. I don't know. Yeah. Well, they made a deal to get the Turkish out of the Black Sea. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I mean, yeah. it's obviously you can play it either way. And I agree with you. If you can afford the units, it's better to kill the Turks. But maybe they didn't think they could afford them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, so question now for me is, um, does Ed leave Trieste? <laughs> and the answer is... You are such a, you are such a groovy person. Of course he leaves Trieste. Of course yeah. he leaves Trieste. That would be a totally short-sighted thing to do. <laughs> uh, David, tell us uh, what else happens. The uh, Turks, I mean, the uh, Italians also take Western Mid while the Austrians bounce the French in Tyranian. So really pretty good defense here from the East. Mm -hmm. um, 
Also taking Silesia. They, of course, lose St. Pete, but there wasn't anything they could do about that. Um, the only other thing I would point out here is Khan to Aegean yeah. and anchor at a Khan. You don't really need those Turks coming. I mean, there are situations where you need a Turkish fleet to go help against Western Triple, but probably not in this situation. So that's an interesting set of moves there from Cody. And this is like, Cody can take Bulgaria, right? I mean, well, is this the fall? This is, the this fall. is a fall. So he well, that's slightly better than. Yeah, we'll see what he does in the 1904. Yeah. All right. And yeah, if you're Ed, I don't know how you feel about... Uh about having let Turkey out of the box here, but uh, let's find out. So in the winter, um, we have a few adjustments to make. Uh, Germany only had one home center open for that uh, rebuild. Um, they pick up one as well. They just have two rebuilds. Uh, they had two PIFs. Two PIFs. And, but they also lost Belgium. Oh, and picked up Sweden. So they're even with two, two rebuilds. Um, all right, so uh, and we get another fleet in the south from uh, from France, from uh, Belgium. Meanwhile, Tim Crosby loses that fleet in Sebastopol. So now, now Turkey is in lovely shape, um, at least in the near term. And, and for those screaming at the screen, yes, France probably should have built that fleet in Brest, not in Marseille. For those screaming at the screen, because so, oh, yeah. so that you could cover Mao without yeah. giving up. Space. Yep, that makes sense. All right, spring of nineteen oh four. Talk us through it. Uh, David. Because then you might do something. This might happen right here, yeah. which is the Italians actually getting in with support. Uh, that could have been that could have been blocked. So that's 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 bad if you're the French. It's good if you're the Italians. Uh, Austrians are in Tyranian. The Turks now are also in the Black Sea in addition to Aegean. So they yeah. <laughs> they not only have been have have been allowed to survive, they've been allowed to get good position. Now. Warsaw to Ukraine probably means something like Tim is paying attention to the fact that this is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Silesia to Galicia bouncing with Vienna to Galicia couldn't, I mean, that doesn't really make sense. So something, something's going on here. What a waste of their units. Like, why would they do that? They can't take each other's dots. So they're just, like, what, 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 what are you scared of? I assumed of? that Tim was, Tim was going to maybe work with the Turks to take Austrian centers or something was going to happen here. Maybe he thinks he's defending himself. I just don't know. It's not even possible. Even if Silesia got into Gal, there would be a 50-50 guess, right? Like, there's nothing here that could really hurt. Um, it's strange. I don't know. Well, if, if Vienna had gotten into Gal, then... Oh, you know, I did realize just now Austria's Ed Sullivan. He could tell us what he was thinking. But uh, no, we're not don't he you, he, He's yeah, napping right. right now. Don't, don't bother him. It's all right. All right. Now we get some action here. Uh, wow. Yeah. Lots of action. Tell us about it, Tanya. Yeah. The, I guess the East has decided that they're, they're just going to uh, crumble this. Um, Vienna takes uh, Trieste back and convoys uh, con into rum. Uh, while Cody then also takes Greece. So Cody goes up two. Um, and uh, Ed, Ed really stabs Micah here, takes Naples, takes Trieste, will, um, and Russia walks back. And uh, meanwhile, uh, I don't really see the Western Dripple broken up, so I don't, I don't know why you you let them uh cross over <laughs> like that. It's uh. Yeah, David, what uh, what do you think about this move uh, on Ed and Cody's part? You like it? Sometimes, I mean, we don't know the diplomatic situation, but sometimes you've been talking to the Western powers about splitting up. You've been talking about it, but they want to see something first to make sure they're not just going to get aired to death. So you go ahead and take the leap of faith and make the first stab and hope that they stab in the West. You know, the, the fact that Wes has had to convoy into Clyde because he was worried about that Italian fleet has put Wes sort of in an interesting not a great position. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 they've at least got them tongue tied a little bit. Um, and now that Belgium is in Ruhr, maybe there'll be some temptation for the West to fall apart. I'm not sure I would have done it to be honest, but I can understand the argument. I just, I, I felt like the East was the weaker side of the two. And even if there was an Italian fleet in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean, like I did feel that they were weaker. And I just don't think the weaker side should be the one breaking up. 
you should tell the stronger side, one of you stab the other, or, you know, we have to stick together. I mean, it should be pointed out that there is a French fleet now in the Terranian. <laughs> there is, <laughs> but. <laughs> so. The, um, so this game has been actually, we've breezed through it because this game has been relatively straightforward until now, you know, uh, two triples against each other and mm -hmm. uh, Turkey <laughs> not getting crushed. That's sort of been the storyline until now. Uh, but things get very uh, murky here uh, all of a sudden um, going forward. So uh, who, who would you want to be uh, at this moment in time? France? I feel like it's murky for for the East, and if the Western triple sticks together, um, probably friends. David? Possibly. Uh, I, I, that probably would have been my first choice also. So if, if forced to give a second choice, I would probably say Wes uh, might be able to turn this around. You know, if there's going to be a lot of activity far away from England, and he's, uh, you know, he may be able to take advantage of that from behind. Possibly moving on Germany, then that yeah. would be your. Yeah. I also wouldn't rule out Turkey. Turkey in a Western triple is always really strong. Yeah. We see it now. True. True. And Turkey has been strengthened. <laughs> All right, puts down two armies, which maybe you're not so crazy about if you're Ed Sullivan. Um, no, those are clearly, clearly anti Austrian. Well, one of them's going to Armenia. Convoy. They're getting convoy to Sev, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. Uh, we also have an army in Budapest, right? So Ed also, I think, is, you know, um, maybe he wasn't expecting Greece. Uh, maybe that's, that's, that's what it exactly is. exactly right, yeah. 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 Um, you like this move by Cody? He needs a, he needs some kind of ally. You, 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 five centers is cool, but you can't fight the world with just five centers. He needs some kind of ally here, and I don't know who that is. Unless it's Tim, but Tim's, you know, got his own issues. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's find out. Spring of 1905. Uh, David, to you. Apparently his ally is still Ed Sullivan. Wow. And all of this was uh, irrelevant um, because he's moving out, Ed's moving in. He's obviously supporting Ed to Ukraine. So he at least he thinks that his relationship with Ed is fine. And Ed may think that. Ed goes to Venice. Ed takes uh, Tyranian. Actually kills the French fleet. That is amazing. Yeah, if that was able to be accomplished there, uh, and it's really good for everybody who's not France that that fleet is dead. So, w is the West going to rearrange here? You've got the Germans certainly don't think so. They've they've sent their armies into Prussia and Silesia, but the front the the English fleet goes to the North Sea. Now, may, that might have just been because what are you doing in the North Sea if you're France? You're going, hey England, what are you doing in the North Sea? Uh, the English. Uh yeah but we'll see i okay do you accept this position if you're austria like this is crazy you've got uh turkish armies in romania and bulgaria yeah. and like i would never be happy with this as my alliance structure he may think that was the best he could do under the circumstances that just seems hard to f i think as I soon as that army and Khan goes down i think you you just can't it just can't work, uh, you know. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm missing it, Tanya. Yeah, too. yeah I, I'm. I'm saying maybe Ed didn't have any choice in terms of alliance partner. Maybe that was mm -hmm. the only person that would work with him at all. Oh, maybe Tim was being belligerent, or just what the the being non-committal and the yeah. and Micah was being belligerent. I mean, it's entirely possible. Right, yeah. but friends like these, who needs it? <laughs> well, sometimes you just got to hope for the best here, here, Ed. Yeah, and, and sometimes also, you know, Ed could be trying to walk a tightrope here of, you know, keep keeping Cody from taking too much while also picking up the rest of uh, the boot, and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe he can go plus and then can work his way back, something like that. It can all work. It's just not a position I would personally enjoy. Yeah, that you would like it. Yeah, you know, a ATs often involve a lot of risk, and this is not that this was not an AT that he picked. This is an AT he has settled for <laughs> as a way to try to get Cody not to attack him completely. All right, fall of 1905. Um, uh, Tanya, talk us through it. So, um, they do their little swap, and uh, Turkey gets into Sev really good, great. I mean, this is what you have to do as Turkey, you. Uh -huh. 
turtle up, wait for the Western powers to come through. Everyone goes away and then you blow up, like, right? Or you try to. And uh, so good work uh, on Cody's end. Um, otherwise, you've got uh, Austria and Italy working together now um, and Russia being the odd one out. Uh, Warsaw's gone, Sev's gone. And in the West, um, <laughs> English to North, North back to English, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, some, some math on the units in the South would have saved them a lot of effort, I think. Uh, so um, seems like it's still the Western triple, but just not as efficient. And it's and AIT, Ed, David. And that was Ed's conclusion. Is it was still a Western triple, so he yeah. has thrown back in with the Italians. Yeah, yeah walked walked out of Venice, taken uh, uh, passed up Rome here. Mm -hmm. It's quite quite a it's quite a bold strategic move here by Ed. I get that you have to do it if yeah. you know. And how about the patience by Cody Green? Very impressive so far. Um, sort of slowly getting into a, just a gorgeous position, sitting in Ionian, building now, got, has you know a line of armies, Sevastopol to Bulgaria. Um, All right. Question, I guess, also for Wes Ketchum uh, is, uh, you know, how long do you wait to make a move? And if you're uh, Karsten, um, you know, how how do you find your way to the board top? You're currently leading. Uh, doesn't quite feel like you're you're winning yet, though. No. All right, Karsten puts down two armies here. Uh, one, I believe, was a rebuild because uh, he picked up Warsaw. And uh, oh, right, he had a uh, he had Could one in the build bank. Them all last time. Yeah. Yep. All right, and we have a rebuild from Edward, um, which gets a fleet in Brest, and Cody Green waves. Wow. An alliance player, a true alliance player. <laughs> Spring nineteen oh six. David. All right. Uh, the AT units continue to move towards the front in terms of their armies. That fleet goes back to Eastern Med because, you know, Cody's an alliance player. Um, North Africa move. Let's see. The um, English come in with support into the Mid-Atlantic with support of the French. See, the only, only thing to really point out here is, is that the German armies don't go east, they go west, just to be defensive and make sure that there's no funny business going on with uh, North Sea and Belgium. Uh, Tanya, I'm going to pose this question to you. If you're Cody Green, do you need Ed Sullivan anymore? I think I would have a really hard time moving out of the Ionian in mm. back, like, retreating back. I think I would really have looked at this position and been like, there's a lot I can gain out of it, and I don't know whether it's worth... But I can also see, like, okay, the West are fighting each other, so maybe... I would be really, uh, nah, I'd probably go for it. I don't know. I, I think I'd go for it. I don't think he needs Austria. Like, uh, nah, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe wait another year. Maybe you could get in a position that doesn't really hurt you, but. All right, well, let's push it. I don't think, here. I don't think there's a wrong choice. I mean, he did have a three dot stab here, right? That he's yeah. that he's now taking himself out of position for, and three dots would have taken him to nine, you know, while the West is still seven six six or uh, seven six five. All right, fall of nineteen oh six. The Tanya, talk us through it. Yeah, so Turkey has really taken himself out of a position where he can do a really good stab. So it's quite unfortunate, but good for Ed. Um, so. Uh, takes Moscow, um, and then yeah, I guess the AIT has uh, sort of gotten it together and uh, seems a bit locked up in the med there. Um, oh, Piedmont gets into Marseille. Great. Yeah, that's a miss. That's a misorder. Gasly yeah. surely meant to support uh, Marseille here. Yeah, it should be locked up. Um, yeah. Envoy to Belgium. Yeah. That's potentially big news. Tough turn for uh, Edward S. in France. Um, yeah, I wonder why they did that. It seems like French units are pretty important. I think for the same reason. They're, they're just trying to make something happen and hope that somebody stabs in the east. All right, so Cody Green has the one in the bank, can lay down two units here. Still do some damage, you know, although with Ed putting down another unit, this this will get harder. Mm -hmm. Um 
and we get a fleet and an army from Mr. Cody Green. Uh, West Ketchum puts down a fleet. And now we have, you know, we've got a three-way tie for the board top here. Um, and we've got West Ketchum one back. So we do have, oh, and the game ends. <laughs> All right. Well, so, that, that might explain some of what we were trying to figure out about motivations during the last turn is if, okay. if they were just going to do a three-way tie, then that's makes sense. If that's what they're going to settle for. Yeah. Maybe. So maybe this was arranged um, already in fall of 1906. Maybe. Uh, although I think, you know, it did England, England must have lost one somewhere. Uh, Cause they, Oh, they go from five to six. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah. I mean, how do you feel if you're West Ketchum? You're, you're left out of the party. Uh, all right. Well, this is not a great score. These are, these are good second. These are okay. Second place scores, uh, 56 points. So in open tribute. Um, yeah. These are, these are scores that are probably that you want to be in your average of the rest. So uh, you want to have three scores higher than this. Uh, is this, uh, what do you guys think? Is this the right result for this game? Well, you know, we're always wanting to see people be more aggressive than they are. But we also got to remember that it's early in the season and there are people that are very risk averse to doing aggressive things early in the season. So in that sense, you can understand this result. It's not a result Tanya would have done in any scenario. I, I'm, throwing, I'm throwing that out there for you to, re, you catch the ball. I throw it to you, you catch it, throw it back. I, I don't know. I I definitely struggle with this kind of result. Um, but maybe in the BDL game, it wouldn't like, that would be fine for me. You know, it's, it's just a different, it's like a house game, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. It would not be fine with you, Todd. It would not be fine with you. <laughs> I'm not sure it'd be fine with you, David Hood. Yeah, David, don't don't say what you think and put it in my <laughs> mouth. Are they or do you know? Uh, if if you think it, then it's you. right. So <laughs> no, it's all about you. But I do I do think that Ed should be happy with this result. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Given sure. given given where he was with Turkey, um, sort of uh, coming up. All right. Well, let's hear from the man himself. Uh, I'll give him quick uh, quick moment to tell us uh, how wrong we were. It, it was the look i shouldn't have gotten into marseille that was not arranged uh, i would have taken a draw at six i don't know i mean that game was coding management and i sometimes was successful and sometimes failed and uh it was a constant struggle i want to give a couple shout outs first of all this was karsten's uh germany he shared in the board top he could have lost warsaw so i understood why he took the draw it was his first game that guy's going to be a great player. Okay, his first game ever? Right now. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, first game VDL. I don't think he's ever, I don't think he's played any kind of game before. He did a really good job playing yeah. it. Edward S., who played France, he taught himself the game of diplomacy a week ago. And okay. he didn't play with anybody. He taught yeah. it to himself. So that, that explains some of the misorders um, that he had. Uh, Micah Bloom. My God, um, you know, I stabbed her and I had to stab. I mean, there was no, like Cody had a Gian con black. Look at my position. You know, I had to take dots, but she like handled it like, uh, like Peter McNamara, just calm, not yelling, you know, nothing just, you know, and we worked together, uh, like, uh, I, I was so impressed with her play. Cody, I don't really know why Cody. I did have to stab Sarah. Uh, Cody, I don't know why. I Cody, love that it covered your uh, face. <laughs> that was great. Took, <laughs> took the draw. C Cody, C Cody had so much. Uh, I was unnecessary uh, for Cody, uh, but I, I think his concern was he hasn't had some of the best results. He, I think he really wants to show that he's working hard to be an Alliance player in the league format because he kind of got a little bit of a, a bad rep early in the season last year. And so I, I of course, played on that a bit, um, you know, during the game. But it was a – it was a, yeah, I mean, I know it was a boring game, Craig Mayer, uh, but <laughs> there were a lot of uh, takeaways. The number one being I got to seven somehow. So that was genius. <laughs> if you do say so yourself. Uh <laughs> 
Yeah, shout out to uh, Cody Green. Uh, we talked about his board rep earlier uh, from last year and how he might be working to change it. And I think we're seeing some strong evidence that that, that is the case. Um, and uh, uh, it's working. You know, that was a very patient plan on his part. Ed, Ed, you might not have been necessary on that board, but you are necessary here at DBM. We Aww. thank you for being here. And no. Tanya, it was great to have you back. Spectacular to have you back on the street. It's been fun. <laughs> I forgot uh, half the units and how they move, but it's been great. <laughs> that you 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 did no such thing, but we, we, it was great to great great to share the screen with you again. All right, this is the time where we say good night to Mr. David Hood. Uh, David, thank you for joining us. Um, it's a pleasure as always. See y'all. All right, have a good night. We'll see you again soon. Um. All right, uh, we have one more game to cover um, and let's go ahead and do that. Let me pull it up uh, on the Dipcast machine. Uh, here is the player list and this is VDL game 169. Um, let's get that little cursor out of there. Micah, 24 hours, the new marathon woman. All right, Austria, Matthew Tatanchi. Uh, Matthew made the top board last year, uh, gave a good game, almost won it. England, Doug Malott. France, Isaac Jukes. Uh, Germany, Ben Kelman playing a second game of the day. Italy, Marcus Lohn. Uh, Russia, Isaac Silbert. So we got two Isaacs on the board, one in uh, England, the other in Australia. Fantastic. And in Turkey, yes, Micah Blom playing uh, her third game. So cool. joining, uh, yes, joining the club. Uh, all right, fun. So Cody didn't make it on this board, so Micah took the spot, I assume. Two of the DBNI top board participants. You come to play VDL and you think, oh, it'll be fun, a bunch of new players. And you got two of the top board DBNI Super 7 on this board. Those being uh, Doug Malott and Matthew Tatanchi. Yeah. All right, let us uh, dive into uh, some orders here. Oh, what happened? Where'd it go? So Doug and Matthew were on the DBNI top board. They were. Apparently hey. you didn't watch. Thank God. <laughs> I missed a lot. Right. You know, <laughs> I right. don't know them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Sorry. Having a little bit of uh, tech difficulty here. So I'm, I'm expecting there good go. things then. I'm going to keep an eye on. What do we got? Austria and England. All right. All right, um, let's see. Tanya, you were spring last time, I think. So uh, we'll give Ed the spring here. You give the fall. Uh, Ed, here are the spring 1901 orders. Tell us what you see. The only orders of consequence that I see is Marseille to Gascony. Um, <laughs> I think we saw that one other time before. Everything else is pretty standard as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's an unusual. I'm not sure I've seen that uh, move set before. Uh, but interesting. All right, let's move ahead into fall of 1901. Tanya. Smyrna to Armenia. That's fun. Um, Bulgaria actually gets support into Romania. Um, so, uh, we see AT maybe right off the bat. Um, and then, uh, Convoy to Tunis and in the West, uh, a bounce in Belgium. And All right. Mark this, this this Bulgaria to Romania thing is fun to do and never seems to work out for Turkey because yeah. Bulgaria is so it's important not. to Turkey. It's just not good to be to have your units separated like this. Um, so, but you know, if Austria can be trusted, Matthew Tatanchi, uh, it could work out. All right, we get lots of fleets all over the place. Uh, Brest, Marseille, London, and Kiel, along with some armies um, in uh, Berlin, Moscow, and then the rest uh, in the south are standard. Let's keep on going forward here. Spring of 1902. Uh, over to you, Mr. Selwyn. Uh, well, it's totally fair that uh, Austria get Bulgaria, well, which has <laughs> happened here. M Micah has to take uh, Black Sea, uh, so she does. Uh, Matt gets into uh, Galicia. Italy convoys back, uh, which is to be expected. So in the east, I don't know where Italy stands in this because Italy doesn't even tap Trieste, actually would have gotten it. So uh, that's something to keep your eye on. Marcus, I think, played a decent game, and uh, we saw earlier. 
Meanwhile, uh, hmm, curious way of doing this. Uh, North Sea, uh, Denmark taps the North Sea as opposed to supporting Kielda Helgeland, but okay. Um, Just in case um, North supports London to English, which it did. Oh, yeah. That's why you're world champion. No. Uh, <laughs> in my heart, you're a world champion. Okay. Thanks. Uh, just go with it. You shouldn't have said anything. You shouldn't have said anything. You should have just remained silent on my time, <laughs> by the way. Uh, Bam. France gets Belgium here. France gets Belgium here. Uh, okay. Um, that's fine, I guess. Um but usually if I'm Germany in this situation, like, I don't like, if I'm moving to Helgoland, I don't want France to have Belgium. I want, you know, I'm okay with France having Belgium if I'm getting Sweden. That's my analysis that I bled mm. into Tanya's time for. No, it's only time, actually. But I, I just want to, yeah, I'm, you know, Italy's lost. I don't know where they're going to go. I don't know what I would do if I were Italy here. So it's a little bit yeah. It's a situation where if you're Italy, you have to you have to ask the question, you know, where do I fit in? I think that was how Ed phrased it. You know, where how, where do I fit in into the East? And if it's if no one's making plans with me, then I gotta I need to make some plans myself. Yeah, um, something so else happened. This is a defensive um, rearrangement of units, but uh, the question is, is there an offense to go with it? Uh, fall of 1902, Tanya, to you. Well, uh, Italy worked something out because they took Greece and uh, moved everything else west. So clearly there was some agreement with the AT, which is still an AT, um, as Turkey takes Sastapol. Great. Good job, guys. Um, on the other end of the board, uh, there is uh, a move into the English Channel. Uh, and possibly FG, but also moving to react to the east. Yeah, this yeah. feels like uh, this feels like a clear FG uh, mm -hmm. to me. Uh, Ed, how do you see it? Yeah, it's a it's a slow moving FG, uh, but I, I'm looking at the Italian. I think Greece was obviously uh, arranged here, uh, mm -hmm. and. Now Italy is going to get Marseille. So we've gone from, we don't know what Italy's going to do there. Italy's got a plan. Yep. Um, so it's an AIT. I don't like the, the way Micah has her units. I don't think they could have, they could have actually, as it turned out, taken Sevastopol with Armenia, but they didn't know that at the time, which is why Romania was the, the, the mover. And they had a self bounce in Rome. Um, yeah, it's a really good AT coordination going on so far for the moment. Uh, this nets Turkey an army in Ankara and, a, and Italy a fleet in Naples, uh, and Germany gets an army in Munich as uh, all of the rest of the uh, neutrals were cleared up, I think is what happened. Oh, and Sebastopol uh, uh, changed hands. All right, into spring of 1903. Uh, Ed, to you. Now Germany thinks, oh, Sweden's a good place to be uh, and moves, uh, should have listened to me, Germany. Uh, it goes to Denmark and Baltic. So if it wasn't FG, it's not much of one now. Uh, I think this is uh, probably the West reacting to the, the East here. Uh, meanwhile, oh, I guess I was wrong because France was getting... Uh, I guess France built to Mercer. I don't know how I fucked that up. All right, sorry. It's late. Uh, I'm rolling. It's all fine. You're doing well, Ed. It's good. I'm tired. Yeah. I'm tired. Yeah, it's been long. This looks like Western Triple, Tanya, doesn't yeah, it? It's, it's yeah. Western Triple versus Eastern whatever. Yeah, reacting to the AIT in the east. Yeah. Uh, I think question will be for Isaac. Where does uh, you know where does he fit into that equation? Probably um, nowhere. <laughs> it's it's the race for Isaac's dots is what's going on. <laughs> All right, uh, <laughs> and and the race seems to be succeeding uh, from the West perspective. Tell us what you see, Tanya. Yeah, so uh, Sweden is gone. Saint Petersburg is gone. And uh, 
while Sev gets into Ukraine. So but everything is soon to go. That's pretty much it. Yeah, you know, suddenly, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ed pointed out after 1902 that Micah's units were in, uh, could have been in better places. Um, and now they are. <laughs> I think that's pretty nice distribution of units and alliance structure for, um, for, for Turkey. Uh, all right, so the net result here is uh, plus one for England and plus one for uh, Germany, plus uh, minus two for, um, for Russia, but uh, with a disband already, then it meant they only had to pull one more unit. Uh, all right, so now we've got uh, two triples against each other and a lot of units on the stalemate line, at least for the moment. Um, Ed, talk us through it. Uh, okay, so... Uh, yeah, this looks very. I'm kind of looking at the Western Triple here, which is uh, sort of hilarious. Uh, we have Doug convoying into Norway. Uh, there's a, I assume, a temporary loss here at St. Petersburg. Maybe not now that uh, Turkey's in Moscow. I can't do the math at this stage of my math. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, we're doing the runaway Monty Python for Italy this time. Uh, there goes <laughs> yeah, the attack that's... on. France, run away! He's running away from everywhere. Uh, What's you know, going on? <laughs> uh, running away from Tyrolia, yeah. right? Just like he's like, hey, I'm just gonna play Italy for a while, okay? We're just gonna <laughs> chill and, and eat some food. Uh, you guys fight it out. I'm gonna give you space. Blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, France well, ain't my, my fighting. Marcus got some bad vibes from Matthew Tatanchi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had, and I still struggle with Italy. I think it's my worst country. And mm -hmm. I have this problem where I just don't know where my units should be going. And I like started to sort of figure that out, but it's really hard for some players and me included to just figure out what the hell you're supposed to do is Italy half the time. And I think mm -hmm. Marcus has that, uh, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, there are times when the diplomacy is hard to decipher on the moves. I, this is not. <laughs> yeah, this is rough. Marcus did not trust uh, whatever. Either Austria. Michael or Matthew or both. Yeah, yeah. or both. Yeah, that's rough. All right, uh, let's keep on going here. Sp uh, fall of nineteen oh four. Yeah, a question I think here is whether uh, whether Isaac. Uh, you know, that, the whole point was for Doug. Sorry to get a uh, dot and uh, get a army into St. Petersburg. I'm getting tired too here. Um, and uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> was able to Tanya tell us what else happens here? Yeah, I mean, it would have taken coordination between. Um, well, actually, no, it wasn't possible because Warsaw could always cut Moscow. Yeah, so it was okay. it was done. Um, and other than that, uh, Marcus said, oh, shoot, let me go back to Tyrolia yeah. <laughs> and to uh, the position I had before, but with uh, not as much. Uh, it does walk back to Greece, so there is a bit of um, uncertainty there in that alliance, which sucks because it'll probably cost them. Uh, other than that... Well, well, big news here, yeah? The AT yeah, breaks up. I, I wonder whether that was... Because of the Moscow pickup, hmm. um, but yeah, I'm I'm not sure because realistically they could have gone like uh, I think Livonia is supporting Galicia into Warsaw, so that would have succeeded. Um, so it's interesting that Matthew decided to take Romania instead. Yeah, yeah this is evidence of strong uh, communication between uh, Italy and Austria here. I mean, Trieste is left completely open. Um, so Ed, what do you what do you make of this? The uh, AT uh, Austria stabbing Turkey here. You like it? Yeah, I think. I mean, it, it's 1904. Austria is not growing. You know, what's he gonna do? I, I understand it. I don't know if it's the best. I'm sort of drawn to what I think is going to be inevitable move by Doug uh, in the east. I mean, France is just way out of position now mm -hmm. but there's some worrisome developments uh right which is ben didn't go to bothnia so ben doesn't fully trust doug doug put finland in st petersburg and not norway which if i'm ben i'm like why is that army hanging back in you know why are we doing it that way like you know so i'm not trusting doug if i'm 
France or Germany right now, but France seems to be cool with it. And Isaac is a very trusting player. He's like really fun to play with and wants to do creative stuff a lot of times. But like, uh, you're just like, you're giving a lot right now to Doug. It could be a convoy to Brest for as far as I know. Who knows? <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, check out the adjustments first. Isaac Silbert uh, exits the game. Thank you for playing. Uh, that was that was a tough Russia. Um, and we get new armies in Trieste and uh, Kiel, interestingly, not not Berlin. Uh, all right, spring of 1905. Uh, Ed, talk us through it. Yeah, I think Isaac saw what, what we saw here um, and pulls back literally in the nick of time uh, to, you know, <clears throat> to help himself uh, and uh, disbands the fleet in uh, West. Which I think is important. It's curious, yeah. So, well, you know, uh, going to save Brest and you know be able to rebuild it, and I guess that's the mm. idea. So Italy sort of lucked out, right? I mean, yeah. And Doug here now, like, look at this, right? The fleet's in Saint Petersburg, so he's not moving north anymore. That's it. But the army goes to Finland, uh, so I guess Doug's keeping his options open. Denmark. <laughs> Uh, loses Sweden now that he can't take on France. Uh, but Doug's hungry and he's looking for something to eat. And right now I think he's going to eat Sweden. Uh, I'm looking at the AT thing here. I'm doing analysis and moves, so, you know. I'll yeah, yeah. To no, that's, a, that's the format we're doing now. But why, why uh, if you're Doug, do you not work with Germany to take Moscow right now. It's strange. Like you've done all this effort to put your army in Norway and St. Petersburg. Move down. Come on. That's where your dot's coming, you know? Really, really weird. All right. Uh let's see if Doug does take Sweden. Kind of I'm with you guys. It kind of seems hard to believe he won't. Uh, and the answer is he does. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya, tell us what else happened. He happens. does. I don't know. I it, and English supports Picardy to Belgium, so now Ben's the odd one out. Like it's just strange. I don't know. I think I don't know what their negotiations were, but if I were Ben, I would be telling England like, "Hey, I'm getting you into Moscow. We're gonna get you over the line. Like, work with me here. I'll get you French dots. Like, we're gonna run a really good EG." And I, I don't know why I didn't see an EG. Like I should. I feel like in on this board, I should have seen an EG, and I didn't. So. Uh, strange, um, but yeah, other... EGs, EGs can be really nice for England, right? Um, yeah. So it it's, it's a it's a good alliance as England, and 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 especially when you have a German in Warsaw who can get you into Moscow, right? Like that's that's not a bad position to be in. So um, curious about that. Uh, and otherwise, now well, Ben screwed, right? He loses Warsaw. He's uh, he's done. He's lost his ally. He's lost. Uh, Warsaw. They had a lot of flexibility when they had like that army in St. Petersburg, but now uh, now that's gone. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, but Marcus is uh, wow. <laughs> walks to France, walks back, walks to France, walks back, uh, and now uh, is walking back. So I guess they finally now want to play on their respective sides of the board uh, five years later. <laughs> so Mike, uh, fascinating turn here for Micah. Ed, you got something to add? No, 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 no. Go, go ahead. I was going to say, Micah, you know, picks up Warsaw here thanks to um, Matthew Tatanchi cutting Galicia. Meanwhile, uh, Matthew is supporting uh, Italy into Constantinople um, and forcing a bounce here. But Micah's building here. So, you know, Turkey's going to be hard to crack open anytime soon really strange moveset but i think what does romania do uh, romania, gal? romania holds unordered oh what does gal do uh gal supports, supports ukraine to romania oh right. gal didn't even right gal didn't even support uh warsaw to hold yep really really strange it would have been cut but uh, yeah. I want to go back to the Ben thing because I, I, I actually think that Doug was going to convoy into Brest. I think that's what that was the idea. But then Isaac pulled back, and Doug was like, "Well, I got to grow, and I'm going to take Sweden." 
But the issue was when Doug was going to do that move, he moved out of St. Petersburg, right? That was the same time he moved out of St. Petersburg. So it was just. I think he kept his know. options open. Yeah. All right. So uh, after winter 1905, this uh, you see Ben's uh, center chart drops from eight to five. Uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, Ben's still got a lot of play left in this game, but, you know, now has to pull back, uh, th- pull three units off the board. And the bigger problem is that he doesn't have an ally, uh, especially in the West, where... Um, well, at least Bohemia, Silesia, and Galicia are pretty useless, so <laughs> just get rid of them. Yeah, it seems like a straight... Especially with armies in Norway and Sweden, um, you're not under immediate threat there. Um, you can Ben can hold out for a while, but the bigger problem is he needs to sort of change the narrative in the West, mm-hmm. um, which means finding, uh, finding uh, a partner of some kind. All right, uh, seeing those armies come on the board in Brest and uh, Paris can't help. I think you really wanted to see a fleet in Brest if you are uh, if you are Ben. So Ben opts to keep Bohemia and lose Baltic. Um, Do you think that's a, that's a bad move? Because Baltic can't be cut, right? That was a really integral unit for him. I would agree. I think the you know the way that England um, really gets into uh, into Germany is by putting fleets, you know, getting a fleet into Baltic. I think if he kept fleet Baltic, it would have been uh, very hard for England to do that. Um, I, I have that, a point here, sure. Which is, I don't like that. Well, I don't know what his strategy is, but I, just to most diplomacy players in general, when I am faced with a two on one. I pick a winner, mm. right? Because if I can empower one over the other quickly, the other becomes super paranoid as losing out on the alliance, and that's the best way to turn them. And I don't know that these moves suggest that, right? And the other thing is I really hate this army building breast. There's no mm. way I would have ever done that. Like, uh, you know, first of all, you don't even need it. I think you just wave in that case, right, if you want to keep your options open. Um yeah, I think so. It looks good I, for England, though. What yeah, it's it? great, great so for open. England. I think for I think to Ed's point, if you are picking a winner here, you either um, you either keep both fleets or you don't keep uh, either of them. Like if you want if you want England to be the winner, then you just disband both fleets and make it perfectly clear um, that uh, uh, mm-hmm. that England's the winner. Uh, all right. So spring of nineteen oh six, Ed, over to you. Um, yeah, Micah takes uh Bulgaria east coast. I'm not sure I would have done it that way, but fine. Uh, meanwhile, it's sort of there's this AT war here. Uh, but Italy is picking Austria or did until Bulgaria got the retreat into Greece, so we'll see how that plays out. Meanwhile, uh, uh, well. If there was a winner pick, I guess it was England. Uh, Sweden goes into Denmark, uh, walks in. Uh, Doug gets the fleet to Norway and has to move the army to Finland. Uh, and a diplomatic play here, I guess, with that army build, uh, England backs off of English Channel. Kind of when I'm in the English Channel, I don't like to move there unless I'm at war. But if I am there, I like to stay there. Uh, I'm a little surprised Doug didn't stay there because it's a lot of stress on the relationship. But on the other hand, you have a lot of domination that way too. Still, it's a nice turn here by Doug, right? It's starting to get units in position to do real damage, picks up Denmark. Tanya, you got have anything to add? No, just... Uh... Yeah, it looks good for Doug. I think he can get really big. Um, he should also put an army into St. Petersburg again. <laughs> like, that's uh, really going to open doors for him. Yeah, and, and I mean, look, uh, that army in Bohemia was useless. It moved to Silesia. Like, what are you going to do with that, you know? Not the right disband, I think. Yeah. All right, let's keep going here. Uh, fall of 1906. Tanya. Um, well... Yeah, bad news for Ben Kelman, who loses Denmark, Holland, and not Kiel. Kiel stays. Um, otherwise, 
EF has sorted itself out. Um, uh, Doug is leaving St. Petersburg open and giving Micah some space to breathe. It's probably good for Micah. Uh, not sure I would have done it as Doug, but uh, um, maybe good to have Turkey slow Austria down. Um, uh, Austria does get into Warsaw, so Micah is losing that. Um, and supports herself into Romania. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they just sort of do a swap there, although, yeah. So it's just kind of a swap, a center swap. Yeah. But there's a, there's a, there's a consequence of this, which is that they both retreat to Um, Ukraine. Fun. (laughs) Which means, which means they're, they both come off the board, which is uh, quite significant, uh, especially for Micah. I think who, Moscow. yeah, for whom Moscow is is at significant risk. This is why Doug should have that army in Saint Petersburg. They would have so much say on what's going on, mm. um, but instead is on Norway for whatever reason. Like there's no reason to be in Norway. That's my take anyway. <laughs> Feel free to disagree. <laughs> Ed, any thoughts? I think he should be in Saint Petersburg. I think he's got you know. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I've been looking at the orders. I think some of them could have been done a little better, but it's. He, he should be in. There's no reason not to be in St. Petersburg. Yeah, not. Only reason would be to convoy uh, somewhere else, but he's building uh, now. So. Nowhere to convoy, yeah. They will kill, but. Uh, but I got a fleet army. by France. Fleet in Marseille. So I think that's probably the safe thing to do. Um, at least in terms of keeping the EF uh, together. All right, so uh, now we have EF, so the Leviathan kind of ascendant. They're both tied for the board top at seven. The East is a mess. Spring of 1907. Um, Ed. I'm a little surprised uh, that we don't see any Italian attempt at uh, Bulgaria or any, oh, I guess because he's worried about France now that I look at it, but it seemed like Italy wasn't going to make any progress on Turkey. Isaac's back on the anti-Italy plan. Uh, you know, this is, I think this is attempt number three. <laughs> uh, you know, let's see if this one uh, fares any better. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, was... uh, what did, yeah, Norway goes to St. Petersburg, uh, half a season too late. But I do like this uh, convoy of Edinburgh to Kiel. Uh, the unfortunate part is it keeps a army in Denmark, but fine. Uh, that's okay for now. And Germany? Oh, I hope Austria is going there to help Ben, but I don't think so. We'll see <laughs> These Italian fleets are so funny. And they're yeah. just cruising back, back, back and, and forth. Back We've and seen forth. that in a few games this, uh, this night, I feel. Yeah, I think we need to give Micah some real props here for yeah. uh, putting up a, a solid defense here um, and just making clear that they weren't gonna uh, they weren't gonna get past. Very good um, play. All right, fall nineteen oh seven. Look at this line of uh, French units; they're all contiguous, straight line. Don't see that too often. Uh, all right, uh, Tanya, to you. Um, for whatever. Yeah, I guess uh, everyone's friendly, more or less, other than France and Italy. Uh, yeah. I don't think any centers change hands. No, nope. France advances, and Turkey, yeah. Turkey's, you know, getting in position. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> I just want to talk- point out that this is all caused by not taking Bulgaria in 1901 by Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, it's yeah. been a disaster of position the whole game. But she's gonna get it this time, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but there is a uh, this must be a rebuild then. Oh no, picking up Keel. So there was a center that changed hands. So uh, uh, I didn't notice the colors yeah. look so similar. England should be pink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Keel uh, changes hands. That means we get another army from from Doug Malott. Uh, all right, so uh, if you're Micah Blom, do you start taking dots? Do you need Austria for anything at this point? Well, if you yeah. are working with England, which it seemed likely, you could get help into Warsaw. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure I'd do it on a league game. I'd probably take a draw. 
I don't know if Micah ever gets more than Doug. Micah has to be running an AI program. This is like 24 hours of diplomacy. <laughs> I, I can't, I don't know if she has the, yeah. she's young, but I don't know if she has the stamina to do what it takes here. Well, let's find out. Spring 1908. Yes. Well, it puts the fleet in though, not not the army. I think you I think you'd rather have the army in here, yeah. Yeah, bad news for Italy, right? But, uh, I think this is a I think this is a play for uh, a draw at some point. Isaac runs away from Tyrolia, I'd have to point that out. Takes Tunis, uh loses Tunis, sorry. Uh and even though mm. oh poor Matt. Uh, not poor Matt, uh, uh, poor Isaac. Uh, Matt retreats Bulgaria to Greece, so bad turn for Italy. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, no. Uh, you know, trying to do the right thing, trying to cut to help to help Austria, and instead, <laughs> do, uh, instead, not. Matt, seeing yeah. what happens to Italy, still retreats there. Wow. And uh, apparently Austria thought Micah might make the move because look at all. Now Austria's got the runaway uh, strategy going on. Uh, everyone was been in Munich, but I don't think that's going to last to the through the fall. I don't know. Yeah. Ben in Munich might last to the fall because the only units are Bohemia and Ruhr. So unless Austria and... Uh, Unless they can come to some oh, agreement, right. I guess. I guess maybe England. Yeah, maybe England. Well, it's England, England, France. England, and Fran England and France don't yeah. have a reason to keep uh, Ben around. But uh, Micah, just a quick tactics. Uh, I think here, I think what you wanted here is a Gian taps Greece, and then uh, Khan goes to Bulgaria with support from Romania and Black, and uh, that would pop this fleet. I think you also need Smyrna going up to Armenia here. You need to get armies up there to to protect Moscow. Mm -hmm. um, and you know you're losing oh sorry on italians front you know you're probably losing tunis you probably want to take tyrenian sea well but the problem is no, where naples are yeah, yeah. <laughs> i would probably move ionian to naples i don't know actually it's tough it's really yeah tough. that's a yeah. just just tough position yeah never mind <laughs> all right fall of 1908 uh tanya um well starting again in the east um the a uh oh well <laughs> the a whatever <laughs> yeah I, I don't know what's going on all i know is micah gets a build no she doesn't because she loses moscow that's yeah. too bad um i should have worked with england uh to try and give england moscow but that's fine um holds the rest though and that's that's good um meanwhile uh, France will go up Tunis, and what is England doing? England is <laughs> <laughs> England's doing everything they want to do, um, yeah. which is uh, is great, actually. Uh, let's see, England take some of these dots would be nice. Doug's living his uh, best life right now, <laughs> and Ben survives. Yeah, for Ben. Yeah, uh, so. Uh, Doug Malat goes up two with Moscow and Berlin here um, and has decided doesn't need the EF anymore, getting in position to, um, you know, to take Mid-Atlantic here, which is guaranteed, uh, can take Holland. It's not guaranteed, but uh, will be in the fall. Um, yeah, this is a this is this is a move by Doug, I think, uh, to assert control over the board. And uh, I think he's going to end. Uh, that's where the game ends. All right. Uh, yeah. Wow, what do you guys think? Is this the right That's, result? Yeah, it's exactly what should have happened. I, I'm I'm kind of shocked they didn't draw two years ago when he was topping, because I, I I didn't think anyone could catch him. So hmm. it was just a matter of time. Good, good, good play on England. For sure. Ed, right result here. I, I think it, well, yes, but only because I think France didn't probably play optimally. I think if France had played optimally, that 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 Isaac could have been in this game a little bit more than he was. Just ceded too much power to Doug uh, in the name of alliance play, and, and Doug didn't really reciprocate. But Doug played like really well. 
and you can see why he's on the DBNI top board. He he did a great job. But it's funny because France didn't actually lose anything from England. You know, Belgium, Holland is French. Um, all of England's dots came from Scandinavia and Germany. So. So Tanya, you had questioned uh, Doug's strategy of moving on Germany when he did. Um, do uh, do you do you want to revise that opinion, or do you think mm. Doug just managed to do it in a way that um, you don't th think uh, uh, like others could have done, or sort of it wasn't the highest percentage play, but he made it work, that sort of thing? No, I just I would have prioritized getting into Moscow before I did that. Mm. I think he could have done both. I don't think there was one or the other. Um, I just think that if he gets into Moscow, he gets a lot of flexibility that Germany can provide. That's how I would play anyway. It's no right or wrong, right? He could have yeah. used Germany more, maybe maybe picked up some French centers and then moved on Germany, something like that. That's what I would have done. I would have pushed my fleets into France, taken Moscow, and then if there was an opening at that point. Because Ben's always sort of going to be ahead of you, right? You're always going to be behind Germany. So... I think as England, if Germany offers an alliance and you can see it working, it's it's a really good play to take it. Um, you're always going to build right next to them and they're always pushing towards the east. So I don't know. That's that's my my take. The, the other so, I mean, uh, uh, Doug obviously topped the board and did really well. So it's not like there's only one way to play, right? That's why yeah. we all have different styles. <laughs> Fair enough. Ed? <laughs> Well, I think the, the other thing that uh, Tanya was proven right on was I think the stab of Austria and Turkey uh, proved to be uh, ill-timed hmm. and it ended up ruining both of their games, um, allowing this space for Doug to grow. And that's that's I think that's a, something I struggle with. Um, I know the top-level players, like two of you don't, but like I struggle with, uh, and it's really one of the reasons I enjoy listening to McAllister's commentary, because he helps me think through when a stab happens, how does that affect the board and how does that affect me long term? Now, he's not always right, but he's thinking that way. And I think that's when you're about to stab, you kind of have to think about what that what 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 the effects of that will be. And it's a good thing you complimented McCullough while he's asleep, so uh, <laughs> he didn't have to hear it. He'll never he was hear on, it. He was on the chat earlier. He'll probably watch this tomorrow. Um, yeah, it's a there's a there's a way of thinking about how um, the effects of certain actions will ripple across the board um, and uh, sort of complete a circuit. You know, you start thinking about how one thing affects one thing, and then affects another, and then you sort of trace it all the way around the board. Um, it was I was talking to someone uh, about this on whipping and what I thought made me a better player than I was when I played online and everything is that when I started playing face to face, but really I did well, but I didn't do that well. And then I started learning how to read a board. So when I was able to see what was happening on the other side, I made my moves accordingly to that. And that changed my game a lot. And I think that's like a super helpful thing to learn how to read. You don't always get it right, but like, yeah, it really, really helps. But when you get it right, it works. That's great. <laughs> um, all right. So learning experience here for uh, Matthew Tatanchi. Well done for Micah Blom to uh, to, to survive this game um, mm -hmm. in good stead. And well done to Doug Malott for topping the board. You know, Doug sort of came into the DBNI um, with uh, as an extended deadline player. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, some people sort of privately kind of wondered whether he sort of the high seed was um that uh, whether he was worthy of it or not and, you know whether the extended deadline event should be getting that sort of uh, treatment and you know doug won his uh, semifinal board um you know and had a good showing on the top board and now is uh, invading the vdl and uh after one round of play one the first weekend uh doug malott is um let's see not topping but he has the best score i should say the best individual score uh, at 100. um michael blom's in first place having uh, put up three scores so that's fun to see uh, michael will need some board tops though in order to uh, uh to stay up there um 
uh, yeah, this is our standings after one round, uh, one weekend of play. And uh, we see Ed Sullivan up there in sixth place with uh, that, what was it, four-way shared seven top or three-way shared seven center top? <laughs> <laughs> three-way. <laughs> All right, y'all. We have uh, this has been a, a leisurely uh, league night. Thanks to uh, thanks to Brian Pravel not being here. Um, I think we took some time with some of the early games because they were fun, and it was fun hanging out with you guys. Uh, fun, uh, just sort of uh, sitting around watching some diplomacy and uh, and being with you, with each other. I'll give you guys a chance here to uh, give your final thoughts on the evening, starting uh, with you, Ed Sullivan. The VDL is fun. I think lurking here, like Karsten was a lurker all throughout uh, VDL coverage last year and wanted to join. And Edward uh, came in and had uh, good games and had a fun time. And I think if you are catching this stream either tonight or down the road, it's a perfect time to join VDL. A, they need the players. Uh, but B, it's just fun to play in. So. I, that's what I was like. I had fun covering the games and sorry for the delay. And uh, Steve Ho, thanks for being there the whole night. You're the only one. <laughs> Congrats, Steve Ho, on winning whipping. Don't know if we've. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We haven't pointed that out tonight. Uh, Steve Hogue with his, with his first tournament win uh, just last weekend at Whipping. Congratulations, man. Uh, Tanya, uh, final thoughts on the evening? Good. Good to be back. Good to see people playing diplomacy and doing crazy things. And I really enjoyed those extended deadline games. Those were really fun to comment on. Yeah. Do that some more. And hopefully we'll get some viewers uh, who are playing those games and they'll maybe play VDL and uh, then maybe face to face and we'll continue to um, get to know some lovely people. So thanks to Brandon for uh, marathoning five hours with no uh, break. So yeah. you really uh, need I'm to ready. get to I'm ready for a snack and yeah. a nap. Time to go to bed. <laughs> Um, the next VDL game day is just two weeks away, April 13th. So, um, I think, uh, Zach has scheduled these, uh, around basketball viewing his basketball viewing schedule. Um, so, uh, I hope he enjoyed watching, uh, some, uh, are we elite eight, uh, was today, I believe in the men's uh, and the women's, um, that so uh, please yeah sign up for vdl um if you haven't played before you've just been watching the streams like uh karsten uh, now is the time uh come do it like uh, ed said uh, uh we could use some more people and uh this uh, season was just getting going uh there's some other tournaments coming up please join the vwdc server uh the links will be uh in the description of this broadcast below um I am going to say that that is time for us to say good night. Um, would one of you like to uh, give the sign off, uh, Siobhan's sign off phrase? Tanya. No. <laughs> what is it? What is it? Stab something? Oh and... my God. Ed, you want to do it? <laughs> She's so cool because she pretends she doesn't know all this stuff. But the truth is, is that she totally knows it all just pretends oh i didn't know that dot was something that would help me i didn't know i didn't oh, know on, Ed. i don't pretend when i stab yeah, someone I don't, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know how these units move but i do know that i would like to stay safe and stab well that's not my style but stay safe and stab well yeah <laughs> there we go you heard it here